47744. Sky Trillium by Julian May. Copyright 1996 by Starcon Productions, Incorporated. Read by Madeline Bazard. This book was originally created for audio cassette playback. Any announcements concerning cassettes do not apply to this recording. This version contains markers allowing direct access to major portions of the book. Library of Congress Annotation An evil magic has caused several natural disasters on the world of three moons. Only Sky Trillium, the united talismans of Cadia, Haramus, and Queen Anagil, can stop it. But Anagil has lost hers, and Cadia's has lost its power. Meanwhile, someone is trying to steal all three charms. The women must prevent such a catastrophe. Sequel to Blood Trillium, RC 36708, 1996. From the book jacket, three sister princesses, three magical talismans, one chance to save a world from utter annihilation. Sky Trillium. Long ago, the Great War of Enchantment almost destroyed the world of the Three Moons. Millennia later, the balance of nature is just beginning to recover from all that magic gone awry, until an unknown evil stirs, and severe earthquakes, widespread volcanic eruptions, and disastrous weather rock the land once more. Only the legendary Sky Trillium can heal the ancient wounds of the world. The Sky Trillium is made from the three talismans of the princesses, Cadia, Anagil, and Haramus. But Anagil is missing, and Cadia's talisman has lost its potency. What's more, someone else, someone with evil magic of his own, is after the three talismans for himself. If he succeeds in his plan, then the world will surely be destroyed. But even if the three sisters are able to regain all three of their talismans, will they be strong enough to control the awesome magic of the Sky Trillium? Encounter the wondrous world of the Black Trillium, originally created by three of fantasy's stellar talents, Julian May, Andre Norton, and Marion Zimmer Bradley. About the author, Julian May was born in Chicago in 1931, she has written numerous books, including the four books of the Saga of Pliocene Exile, Intervention, Book One, The Surveillance, and Book Two, The Meta Concert, and the Galactic Milieu Trilogy. Together with Andre Norton and Marion Zimmer Bradley, she created the world of Black Trillium, which she has continued on her own in Blood Trillium and Sky Trillium. Julian May lives in the state of Washington. Other books by Julian May. The Saga of Pliocene Exile, The Many Colored Land, The Golden Torque, The Nonborn King, The Adversary, A Pliocene Companion. The Galactic Milieu Trilogy, Jack the Bodiless, Diamond Mask, Magnificat. For Pat Brockmeyer. Reader's Note. The map found in the print edition is not included in this recording. End of note. Prologue The old madman had fallen unconscious at last, prone on the dining room table amidst the remains of the meal. The prisoner let his glittering glass blade descend until its point touched the dark wrinkled skin of the archimage's neck. One thrust, a single movement of his arm and it would be ended. Do it. But the prisoner held back, cursing himself for a sentimental coward, his mind a storm of conflicting emotion. The cup of poisoned wine lay upset near Denby's flaccid brown hand. Dregs puddled on the shining gondawood surface, slowly whitening the varnish beneath. The magnificent table, more than twelve thousand years old, was probably ruined, but its insane owner would survive. At the last, standing over the helpless form of the Archimage of the Firmament with a razor-sharp fruit knife in his hand, the prisoner found it impossible to kill his captor. Why do I hesitate? he asked himself. Is it because of the old man's crotchety good humor, or his awesome office, that he neglects so scandalously? 
Do I hold back because Denby Varkor spared my life, even though he sentenced me to share his grotesque exile? Or is magic at work here, protecting this ancient meddler, even though he lies vulnerable as a sleeping child before me? Never mind all that. Do it. Kill him. The poison has only rendered him senseless. Kill him now, before it is too late. But he could not. Not even the power of his star sufficed to drive the blade home. Denby lay there snoring gently, a smile on his furrowed lips, quite safe, while his would-be murderer fumed and fretted. The reason for the failure was unfathomable, but the impossibility remained. Shaking his head in self-disgust, the prisoner replaced the glass knife on the platter of juicy laydew that was to have been their dessert. With a last uneasy glance at the unconscious madman, he hurried out of the room. It took only a moment to snatch up the sack of warm clothing and stolen magical implements he had secreted in a cupboard in the salon anteroom. Then he was off, running down the dim, silent corridors toward the chamber of the dead woman, located nearly two leagues away in another quadrant of the dark man's moon. The prisoner knew he had no time to waste. The Sindona messengers and bearers were withdrawn into the garden moon as usual, but there was no telling when one or another of the terrible living statues might decide to cross over and seek out their lunatic master on some cryptic errand. Should a Sindona find Denby drugged, it would know in an instant what had happened and call out the sentinels. And if those beautiful demons caught up with the prisoner, he would die. The sentinels would discover the new empowerment of his star, and not even Denby's senile whimsy would suffice to spare his life. The fleeing man paused for an instant, clasping the heavy platinum medallion engraved with a many-pointed image that hung about his neck. He called upon its magic to survey his prison. The star reported that the aged enchanter was still unconscious, and no Sindona were abroad. The only things that moved in the dark man's moon were the tenders, those odd mechanical contrivances that crept about on jointed legs like great metallic lingots doing domestic chores. One of these machines confronted the prisoner now, coming suddenly into view around the corridor's sharp curve. It carried a basket of flameless lamp globes and moved patiently along, sniffing with one of its arm-like appendages, seeking burned-out ceiling lights that might require replacement. Out of my way, thing. The prisoner barged past the bulky device, nearly upsetting it and causing its collection of glowing globes to spill onto the floor. His foot landed on one of the lights, and he lost his balance and fell to his knees. I beg pardon, master, the lamp tender said humbly. Are you injured? Shall I summon one of the consolers to treat you? No, don't. I forbid it. Sweat broke out on the prisoner's brow. He struggled upright and managed to speak in more normal tones. I am not hurt. I command you to go about your normal duties. Do not summon assistance. Do you understand? Four inhuman eyes studied him. Denby's weird creations were the most solicitous of servants, quite capable of forcing him to accept the medical attention of a Sindona consoler against his will, if he actually needed it. Dark powers, he prayed silently. Don't let it call a Sindona. Don't let all my careful planning come to naught and my life be forfeit because of a witless machine. It is true that you are unhurt the light tender said at last. I will resume my work. I regret any inconvenience I have caused. It blinked its eyes in salute and began to pick up its scattered load. The prisoner walked off in a semblance of nonchalance, but when the lamp tender was out of sight, he began to run again, feeling fear swell within him. What if the cursed machine called the Sindona anyway? What if the sentinels were already in pursuit? He was racing flat out now, his formal dining robes flapping and his bootshod feet thudding on the resilient corridor floor. A lump of cramping dread knotted his belly, and every breath was now like a sword cut. Dwelling in this damned place for two years had robbed him of his bodily strength and crippled his resolution. 
but he would mend if he could elude the Sindona and finally take advantage of the dead woman's second gift. He was in the disused part of the Dark Man's Moon now, a silent warren of empty galleries and parlors, uninhabited bedroom suites, and abandoned workshops and libraries. It was here that the rear guard of the vanished ones had lived, twelve times ten hundreds ago, while they strove hopelessly to stem the advance of the conquering ice. Denby had willingly given him permission to explore the ghostly rooms, apparently unmindful of what might be found there. Early in his incarceration, the prisoner had come upon the chamber of the dead woman and received her first precious gift. With its help, he had collected his small trove of magical devices. But they were useless, of course, so long as he remained Denby's captive. The dark man was invulnerable to ordinary magic. A long time later, after he had discovered the truth about himself and about the world's imbalance, the prisoner had found the dead woman's second gift, the means to escape this strange prison and its demented jailer. Her third and last gift, without which the other two were useless, he had found just two days earlier. There was no magic in this gift at all, and for that reason Denby had succumbed. The old man had not died, as the prisoner had hoped. But if the profound swoon only lasted a short while longer. Starman, where are you going? Merciful dark powers, the sentinels had found him. Their voices rang in his brain like great brazen bells. What have you done to the Archimage of the Firmament? What stolen goods do you carry in that sack? Answer us, Starman. At any moment they might materialize in the corridor with him, they would point their fingers in judgment, and his life would end in a puff of smoke while his naked skull bounced hollow on the floor. Starman, this is your final warning. Stop and explain yourself. But he only continued to flee. Suddenly, they appeared out of thin air, four of them, less than ten elves behind him and striding purposefully in pursuit. The Sindona that were called Sentinels of the Mortal Dictum resembled living statues of ivory, taller than a man and more beautiful than any human being. They wore only crossed belts of blue and green scales and iridescent crown helms, and they carried golden death's heads that symbolized their lethal duty. The pace of the sentinels was ponderous and deliberate, and he kept well ahead of them, but he was nearly spent. His heart seemed about to burst, and his legs were faltering and would not bear him much farther. Where was their chamber? He should have reached it long ago. But the eerie corridor seemed endless, and the sentinels were drawing closer, moment by moment. His vision reddened, then began to dim. I am finished, he said to himself, and pitched forward toward blackness, losing his grip upon the sack. As he fell, he took hold of his medallion in a last gesture of futile appeal. The star seemed to lend him fresh strength. Lying there, he was able to lift his head and open his eyes. He saw the four pale Sindona, golden skulls cradled beneath their left arms, marching toward him. And he also saw that a miracle had been vouchsafed. He lay before a door, massively fashioned of solid metal, marked with a huge, tarnished likeness of the same many-rayed silvery star he wore around his neck. The portal had neither latch nor keyhole, it was only a few paces away. Like a dying thing, he crawled with agonized slowness, then lifted his medallion on its chain and touched it to the door. No! cried the sentinels. Their right arms rose in unison to point annihilation toward him. The door flew open. There within was the dead woman, seeming to turn her head and smile at him, silently offering sanctuary. Somehow he was drawn swiftly inside and the door clanged shut behind him. He was enveloped in night, a night spangled with unblinking stars. The room was so cold that the breath was torn from his heaving lungs in a frosty cloud and the sweat coursing down his face turned to crackling ice. An involuntary moan escaped his stiffening lips. He had forgotten that one visited the dead woman only on her own terms. Near paralyzed with pain and the intense cold, he pulled a cloak from his sack, flung it about himself, and drew up the hood, 
muffling his face to the eyes. Then he fumbled to pull on fur-lined gloves. Staggering to his feet, he stood with his back pressed to the locked door, fighting to reclaim control of his mind and body. Would the Sindona be able to break in and capture him? The dead woman smiled serenely and seemed to say, No, not without the explicit command of the dark man himself, and he is still bereft of his senses. She sat in a throne-like chair, not really looking at him at all. One entire wall of her chamber was a gigantic window, and her glazed eyes, wide open, seemed to stare with rapt fascination at the scene outside. A shining blue-and-white sphere hung in the midst of a million untwinkling stars. The garden moon and the death moon were out of sight, tracing their course in the heavens somewhere behind the abode of the dark man, so there was nothing to detract from the heart-wrenching beauty of the vision. Uncounted leagues distant, the world of the three moons hovered like a massive clouded aquamarine. The imperiled world, the world that was his home, that he alone could save, the world that had certainly been her home as well, twelve thousand years agone. She had died with her eyes fixed longingly upon that blue orb, with one hand clasping a star hanging on jeweled links at her breast and the other holding a curiously wrought little glass phial with a few frozen droplets remaining in it. Her body was perfectly preserved in the deep cold, dressed in rich garments of mournful black. Her hair was dark, streaked with silver. She had been middle-aged, but of surpassing beauty, a prisoner like himself. The archives of the dark man had told him some of her tragic story, her name was Nirenyi Daral, and she had been the founder of the mighty Star Guild. One who loved her beyond all reason and loyalty had saved her from the fate that had befallen most of the other members of her group, only to see her voluntarily relinquish life rather than evade the conquering ice in his despised company. The loss of Nirenyi had driven Denby Varkor, greatest hero of the Vanished Ones and Archimage of the Firmament, out of his mind. The prisoner bowed deeply before her body, trying to control his shivering. He could not live long in this rigorous place. If the dead woman's second gift proved inoperative after eons of disuse, he would surely freeze to death before Denby awoke and ordered the sentinels to seize him. I could not kill him after all, Star Lady, he confessed to her. Perhaps his magic protected him but I suspect it was my own soul that demurred, unable to take his life in such a craven manner as he lay smilingly unconscious, replete with good food and wine. Should another day come when he and I meet in honorable magical combat, man to man, I will not hesitate to destroy him. Will that suffice? The voice that might have been hers replied, It will. Have you found the basic instruments of enchantment, those that will enable you to resume your work? I have. He lifted the sack. My star eventually led me to all of them, even though it took some time. I am ready now to return to the world, regain the three pieces of the scepter of power, and perform the task you have commanded. The three will do their best to prevent you. Lady, no human being will stop me, not even the one I love. I swear it on the star. When he had first found Nirenyi Daral, some instinct bade him touch his own medallion to hers, and the ancient magic of her guild had done its work, granting him the full power of the star at last. It was the dead woman's first gift. The second gift was a viaduct, one of those wondrous passageways that the Dark Man and the Sindona used in order to travel instantly from place to place about the hollow moons. But this particular viaduct, invisible now, as its kind always were until an adept commanded their opening, led from the Dark Man's moon back to the world below. Its existence had been revealed to the prisoner on one of his later visits. Narenyi Daral had warned him that the Archimage of the Firmament would know instantly if anyone attempted to use the viaduct, and then Dendi would either lock it or bid it convey the prisoner to some ghastly new place of captivity. Only if the Dark Man were killed or disabled would the passage lead to freedom. 
A tiny glass container in Nerenyi's hand had been her third gift. Sheer happenstance had finally drawn the thing to his attention two days ago and caused him to ask what it contained. When he found out about the poison, he began at once to plan his escape. I am ready to go now, he told her. Star Lady, I beseech you to open the world viaduct for me. Do you swear on the star to recreate my guild and carry out its great purpose, restoring the balance of the world? He grasped his medallion with one gloved hand. His fingers were losing sensation, and the deadly cold was fast penetrating the cloak as well. I do swear, he said. Then take my own star, dear adopted son and heir, and give it to one in whom you place your utmost trust. With the help of the reborn guild, reclaim the scepter of power. It is still capable of banishing the conquering ice. Learn to control its perilous faculties, and let the sky trillium shine again. Reverently, he detached her dead fingers from the medallion, lifted the jeweled chain and penned it from her neck, and put it into his sack. I will do as you command, but now, lady, I beg you to let me go forth, else I will surely freeze to death on the brink of freedom. Go. Viaduct system, activate. A crystalline musical chime rang out, and an upstanding ring of light about two ells in diameter sprang into existence to the left of the dead woman's chair. Within it was an area of featureless black, from which a musty, warm wind flowed. Is the viaduct ready to transport me? Yes. All you need do is enter. Once it would have led only to the domain of the conquering ice, and so it was useless to me. I came here through it, but I could not use it to escape. But in these latter days, when the sempiternal ice cap is temporarily diminished, the viaduct will debouch in a safe place. He hesitated. May I ask where in the world I will emerge? The star voice was stern. You will go where you are sent, and there you must begin immediately to carry out your mission. Quickly, Denby is about to awake. He will be at the door in a moment. Then, lady... Goodbye. Holding tight to the sack, he stepped into the glowing ring and vanished. There was a second bell-like sound, and the circle winked out. The remnants of the prisoner's last breath, clouds of minute ice crystals, swirled in the frigid air around the enthroned dead body. The door of the chamber swung open. The four Sindona sentinels marched in, their golden skulls held at the ready. Shuffling after them came a very old man with dark skin and frizzled snow-white hair. He was enveloped in a mantle of golden warm fur. Oragastus, he called. His voice was strong and resonant and might have belonged to a much younger man. Are you still here? He has departed, one of the sentinels said. Well, that's a relief said Denby Varkour. Now we can get on with saving the world, if it can be saved. A pity he didn't finish me off, but I might have known I'd have to see the thing through to the end. He flapped one hand at the Sindona, ordering them back out into the corridor, then went and stood before the frozen corpse. Forgive me, my beloved Nerenyi. It was too good an opportunity to miss. I could not let it be too easy for him, you see. As always, her tranquil features smiled. One. Prince Tolliver lay there in the dark, fully clothed except for his boots, trying desperately not to fall asleep. He had not dared to leave the silver oil lamps or even a candle lit for fear someone would see the light shining beneath the door. The only illumination in the chamber came from fitful lightning flashes through the window and from the clock on the stand beside his bed, an artifact of the vanished ones with a face that glowed softly green. It had been a gift on his last name day from his Aunt Cadia, the Lady of the Eyes. She was the only one in the world, aside from good old Ralaban, who did not despise him. Sunday he would show them all, especially his hateful elder brother and sister, Crown Prince Nicolon and Princess Janille. 
the time would come when they would no longer tease him and call him a useless second prince. They would fear him instead and grant him the respect he deserved. If he got his treasure back. Lying there, Tolliver gritted his teeth and willed that the slow-crawling minutes go faster. Ralliban would not come until two hours after midnight, if he came at all. He must come, the prince whispered to himself, but he had not dared to tell Ralliban why he was needed, and the old creature might have dismissed the unusual summons as a boyish whim. He might forget to come, or even fall asleep waiting. Tolliver himself was having great trouble keeping his eyes from closing. Holy flower, don't let me nod off, he prayed. He was already badly frightened at the prospect of what lay ahead. If he slept, and the awful dream came again, he might be tempted to give it up. It probably had been foolish of him to hide the treasure out in the mazy mire, but the stratagem had seemed necessary. Rowenda Citadel's ancient stones were themselves permeated with magic, and sacred black trillium blossoms bloomed everywhere now on the knoll, thriving beneath the light of the three moons. Worst of all, his other aunt, the formidable Archimage Harimus, had taken to visiting his mother too often here in the summer capital, which was their childhood home. Tolliver could not risk the white lady discovering his secret, so he had found a place away in the swamp to hide the precious things. No one would take them from him. Not ever. They are mine by right of salvage, he reassured himself. Even if I am only twelve years old and still unable to make use of them fully, I will die rather than give them up. The unwelcome thought stole again into his mind that he might very well perish tonight, drowned in the surging black river. Then so be it, he muttered, for if I leave the treasure behind in Rwanda during the rains, it might be swept away in a great tempest or it could be buried in mud before we return next spring, or even found by some stray oddling and handed over to the white lady, then I would have nothing to live for. If only the wet time had not come so inconveniently early this year. But Aunt Harimus had said that the world was badly out of balance, and the strange weather reflected it, as did the restlessness of the volcanoes and the increasing number of earthquakes. The river Mutar, which skirted Citadel Knoll, had surged to flood stage almost without warning. King Antar and Queen Anagel had decided that the court of the two thrones dared not wait until the end of the month to adjourn to the winter capital of Derergwilla in Labernock. Instead, the royal entourage must depart within six days before the mire waters rose too high. Prince Tolliver, the youngest of the royal family, had reacted to the announcement with panic. So long as the storms continued, the Mutar's current would be too strong for him to paddle upstream alone in the skiff he kept hidden for his secret excursions. He had prayed both to the Holy Flower and to the dark powers who aided wizards, begging for just a few dry days and a respite in the flood. But the entreaties were in vain. The time of the royal retinue's departure drew closer and closer, until now there were only two days left. Tomorrow the caravan would begin to form. In daylight he would not be able to sneak out of the citadel without being seen. He had to get the treasure tonight, or leave it behind. Tolliver tried to banish his desperation as he listened to the rain beating at his bedchamber window. It was a sound that provoked sleep. Several times the prince found his eyes closing and managed to snap back into wakefulness. But the time passed so slowly, and the raindrops drumming was so monotonous, that eventually he could not help drifting off. Once again the familiar nightmare began. It had haunted him for the past two years, the rumbling terror of the great earthquake, smoke from burning buildings, himself a sniveling captive, his small boy fear colored with the guilt of betrayal. And then miraculous escape, a sudden surge of courage in his heart that had emboldened him to take the great treasure. In the dream, he vowed to use it and become a hero. He would save the city of Derguilla from the attacking army, save his royal parents and all the embattled people. Even though he was only eight years old, he would do it by commanding magic. In the dream, he used the magical device, and they all died. 
all of them, loyal defenders and vicious invaders, the king, the queen, his brother and sister, even the lady of the eyes and the archimage Haramis herself, dead because of the magic he had wrought. A great pile of bodies lay in the bloody snow of the palace courtyard outside Zotopanion Keep, and he himself was the only one left alive. But how could it have happened? Was it really his fault? He fled the horrible scene, running through the devastated city. Snow fell thickly from a dark sky, and the gale wind that drove it spoke with the voice of a man. Tolo, Tolo, listen to me. I know you have my talisman. I saw you take it four years ago. Beware, foolish prince. The thing's magic can kill you as easily as it killed the others. You will never learn to use it safely. Give it back. Tolo, do you hear me? Leave it out there in the mazy mire. I will come for it. Tolo, listen. Tolo, no, it's mine, mine. The prince woke with a start. He was safe in his own bedroom in Ruenda Citadel. Thunder was faintly audible through the thick stone walls, and the echo of his own terrified cry rang in his ears. He checked the clock on the bedside stand, discovering that it was still too early, and fell back onto his pillow, uttering childish curses. The nightmare was so stupid. He had killed no one with magic. His family was alive and well and suspected nothing. The sorcerer was dead, but that was his own fault. Everyone knew that. I will retrieve my treasure in spite of the rains, he said to himself, falling back onto his pillow. I will take it with me to Deraguilla and continue practicing its use, and one day I will be as powerful as he was. At last, the little clock chimed two. Prince Tolliver sighed, sat up on the edge of the bed, and began to tug on his stoutest pair of boots. His frail body was weary after a day spent gathering and packing the things he would take with him to Labernock. The servants had dealt with his clothes, but packing everything else had been his responsibility. Six large brass-bound wooden chests now stood ready in his darkened sitting room next door, and four of them were filled mostly with his precious books. There was also a smaller strong box of iron with a stout lock, which the prince hoped to fill and tuck in among the other things. If Raliban would only hurry! The clock now showed a quarter past the designated hour. Tolliver put on his rain cloak. He wore both a short sword and a hunting dagger. Opening the casement window and peering out, he saw that the rain had let up, although lightning still flickered in the west. The river was not visible from this side of the citadel, but he knew it would be high and swift. At last there came a soft scratching at the door. Tolliver dashed across the room and admitted a sturdy old Nissimu male, dressed in dark brown rainproof leathers, handsomely decorated with silver stitching. Ralaban, the retired keeper of the royal stables, was Tolliver's crony and confidant. His usual aspect was one of sleepy amiability, but tonight his broad wrinkled face was ashen with anxiety, and his prominent yellow eyes seemed almost ready to pop out of his skull. I am ready, hidden heart, but I beg you to tell me why we must go out in such weather. It is necessary the prince replied curtly. He had long since given up urging Raliban to bestow a more auspicious mire name upon him. It is a foul night to be abroad in the mazy mire, the old one protested. Surely this mysterious errand of yours can wait until morning. It cannot, the prince retorted, for we would surely be seen in daylight, and early tomorrow the Lord Steward gathers all of the baggage of the royal family and begins forming up the wagon train. No, we must go tonight. Quickly now. The boy and the aborigine hurried down a back stairway, ordinarily used only by chambermaids and other lackeys who tended to the royal apartments. On the floor below, a mezzanine overlooking the great hall, was the chapel, together with the small presence chambers of King Antar and Queen Anagel, and the adjacent offices of the royal ministers. Guardsmen of the Night Watch were on patrol here, but Tolliver and Raliban eluded them easily and slipped into a tiny alcove next to the Chancellor's rooms, where boxes of old royal correspondence filled three tall shelves. The secret way is here, Tolliver said softly. 
As Ralaban gaped in astonishment, the prince took out a single letter box and reached behind it. He then replaced the box, and the entire middle shelf swung soundlessly outward like a door, revealing a black opening beyond. Do you have your dark lantern, as I requested? Ralaban drew it from beneath his cloak, sliding open the aperture so that light from the glowing swamp worms within shone out in a wan beam. The two of them entered the secret passage. Tolliver closed it behind them, took charge of the lantern, and began to walk briskly along the narrow, dusty corridor, bidding the Nisimu to follow. I have heard tales of these hidden passages in the citadel from Imu, the queen's nurse, Ralaban said, but never have I been in one. Imu says that long years ago, when the three living petals of the Black Trillium were still young princesses, she and Jagan led the queen and her sister, Lady Cadia, out from the citadel through such a passage, when the evil King Voltric would have murdered them. Was it your royal mother who showed you this secret way? Tolliver's laugh was bitter. Nay, I learned of it from a more obliging teacher. Look sharp, we must go down these steep stairs here, and they are damp and slippery. Who, then, told you of the passageway? Was it Imu? Nay. Did you learn of it, then, through one of the ancient books you are so fond of perusing? No. Stop asking questions. Ralaban fell into a wounded silence as they descended more cautiously. The walls of the cramped staircase were now very wet. In the crevices grew masses of pale fungi that harbored faintly glowing creatures called slime dawdlers. These little beasts crept along the steps like luminescent slugs, making the footing treacherous and producing an evil smell when they were trodden upon. It is not much farther, Tolliver said. We are already at the level of the river. After a few more minutes, they came to another secret portal with wooden machinery that creaked when the prince operated it. They emerged into a disused shed full of decayed coils of rope, sprung barrels, and broken crates. A couple of startled varts squeaked and ran away as Tolliver and Ralaban went to the shed's exterior door. The prince shuttered the lantern and peered cautiously outside. Only a light drizzle fell now, and it was very dark. There were no guards, for this key had been abandoned years ago following the war between Rwanda and Labernock, and its entrance into the citadel sealed. They cautiously made their way over the rotting planks of the dock, with Ralaban now leading the way. The Nisimu's night vision was much keener than that of humankind, and they dared not show a light that might be detected by patrols on the battlements above. My boat is yonder, Tolliver said, hidden below the broken bollard. Ralaban inspected the craft dubiously. It is very small, Hidden Heart, and the Mutar flood is strengthening each hour. Will we have to go very far upstream? Only about three leagues, and the boat is sturdy enough. I will row with the central oars while you scull with the stern sweep, and together we will breast the current and cross the river. Once on the other side, there will be slack water, and the going will be much easier. Ralaban grinned. I was not aware that you were such an experienced waterman. I am experienced in more things than you know, the boy said shortly. Let us be going. They climbed aboard and cast off. Tolliver rode with all his strength, which truly was not much. But Ralaban, while elderly, had muscular arms after years of heavy work in the stables, and so the boat moved steadily across the broad river. They dodged floating debris, including whole trees uprooted from the black mire upstream. Once there was even a log with a huge, vicious raffin aboard that sailed along as nonchalantly as a Travista trade boat. The beast roared as it passed, less than three arm lengths away, but it made no move to leave its safe perch and attack them. Along the opposite shore from Citadel Knoll, which was mucky and uninhabited, the current was much less strong, just as the prince had predicted. He wearily put up his oars and left the propelling of the boat to Ralaban. They made good headway upstream and were able to converse above the noise of the rushing water. Tolliver said, There is a very shallow tributary creek that joins the river on the north shore, in the braided section just above Market Pool. That is where we are going. 
Raliba nodded. I know what you're talking about. A nameless waterway clogged with fodder fern and lanceweed. But it is not navigable. It is, if one fares carefully. I have traveled the creek often during the dry time, in secret, disguising myself as a common wharf boy. Raliban gave a disapproving grunt. That was most imprudent, Hidden Heart. Even so close to Citadel Knoll, the Maisie Mire is not a safe place for a lone human lad. If you had only asked, I would have been glad to take you swamp romping. I was in no danger. The prince spoke haughtily, and my business in the mire was both serious and personal. It had nothing to do with the sort of idle fun-seeking we are accustomed to pursue together. Humph! What great mystery does this creek conceal, then? It's my business, Tolliver snapped. This time the Nisimu's feelings were clearly hurt. Well, I humbly beg your worship's pardon for prying. The boy's voice softened. Do not be offended, Raliban. Even the dearest companions must have some things private from one another. I was forced to ask your help in traveling to my secret place tonight because of the strength of the river. There was no other soul I could trust. And gladly will I accompany you. But I confess that I am sad that you will not confide in me. You know I would never tell any secret of yours to a living soul. Tolliver hesitated. He had not intended to disclose the nature of the treasure to his friend. But he was strongly tempted now to have at least one other person who knew about the wondrous things he owned. And who better than Raliban? Tolliver said, Do you swear that you will not tell the king or the queen about my secret? nor even the Archimage Haramis herself, if she should command it? I swear upon the three moons and the flower, said Raliban stoutly. Whatever privity you entrust to me, I will guard faithfully until the lords of the air carry me safely beyond. The prince nodded somberly. Very well, then. You shall see my great treasure when I fetch it tonight from its hiding place in the mire. But if you reveal what it is to others, you may forfeit not only your own life, but also my own. Raliban's big round eyes gleamed in the dimness as he made the sign of the black trillium in the air with one hand. What is this marvelous thing that we seek, Hidden Heart? Something I must show you rather than speak of, said the prince. And he would say no more, for all the Nisimu's coaxing. After they had traveled on for another hour, the drizzle ceased and a brisk wind began to blow, sending dark clouds speeding across a small patch of starry sky. On the opposite bank, the torch lamps of Ruenda Market at the westernmost end of Citadel Knoll flickered dim, for the Mutar was now over a league wide. Then they entered the braided section of the river, where there were many wooded islands during the dry time. Most of these were submerged now, with the lofty gonda and kala trees that grew on them rising out of swirling black water. It would have been easy to lose the way, and several times the prince had to correct Raliban's navigation. Unfortunately, the mire craft of the old stable master was not nearly so expert as he pretended. Here is the creek, Tolliver said at last. Are you sure? Raliban looked doubtful. It seems to me that we must go on farther. No, it is here. I am quite certain. Turn in. Grumbling, the Nisimu bent to his oar. The jungle round about here is already flooded and full of drifting debris. There's no sign at all of a channel. I really think... Be silent. The prince took up a stance in the bow. The few stars gave barely enough light to see by. The water soon became very shallow, with dense thickets of flag reeds, lanceweed, and red fern between the towering trees. In the respite from the downpour, the wild creatures of the mazy mire gave voice. Insects chirped, clicked, buzzed, and made musical chiming sounds. Pelrics hooted, night carolers warbled, carowocks splashed and hissed, and a distant gullbird uttered its throaty hunting cry. When Raliban could no longer use the sculling oar because of the shallowing water and clogging driftwood, he cried out, This can't be right, Hidden Heart. The boy controlled his exasperation with some effort. 
I will guide us while you pull the boat along. Go between those two great wollanda trees. I know the way. Ralaban grudgingly obeyed, and even though the channel at times seemed hopelessly blocked with brush and hanging vines, a lead of open water barely as wide as the boat stayed always ahead of them. The going was very slow, but after another hour they reached a small area of high ground. Thorn ferns, weeping wattles, and towering calas grew about its rocky perimeter. Tolliver pointed out a landing spot, and Ralavan brought the boat into shore. This is it," he murmured in surprise. "I could have sworn we were lost." The prince leapt onto a bank covered with rain-beaten sawgrass and tied the bowline to a snag. Then he took up the lantern, opened its shutter, and beckoned for the Nisimu to accompany him along a nearly invisible path that twisted through outcropping rocks and dripping vegetation. They came to a clearing where there was a small hut made of hewn poles and bundled grass, roofed with heavy fodder fern. I built it, the prince said with pride. It's where I come to study magic. Ralaban's wide mouth dropped open in amazement, displaying stubby yellow fangs. Magic, a lad such as you, by the Triune, you are well named Hidden Heart. Tolliver unfastened the simple wicker door and gave an ironic bow. Please enter my wizard's workshop. Inside, it was completely dry. The prince lit a three-candle reflector lamp standing on a makeshift table. The hut had few other furnishings aside from a stool, a carboy of drinking water, and a set of hanging shelves that held a few jars and firkins of preserved food. Certainly, there were no instruments, books, or any of the other occult appurtenances one might expect in a sorcerer's lair. Tolliver dropped to his knees, brushed aside the cut ferns and rushes that covered the dirt floor, and began to pry up a large, thin slab of stone. In the cavity beneath it lay two bags of coarse woolen cloth, one small and the other larger. Tolliver placed both on the table. These are the precious things we have come for," he told Ralaban. "I did not think it wise to conceal them in the citadel." The old aborigine eyed the bags with growing misgiving. "And what happens to these things when you reside in Daraguilla during winter?" "I have a safe hiding place in the ruins just outside Zotopanyan Keep, where nobody goes. I found it four years ago." During the Battle of Daraguilla, when I had the good fortune to acquire this great treasure, the boy opened the larger bag and slid out a slender, shallow box about the length of a man's arm, and three handspans wide. It was made of a dark, glassy material, and upon its lid was embossed a silver, many-rayed star. Ralaban cried out, "Lords of the air, it cannot be!" Saying nothing, Tolliver opened the smaller bag. Something flashed brilliantly silver in the lamplight, a curiously wrought coronet having six small cusps and three larger. It was ornamented with carved scrollwork, shells, and flowers, and beneath each of the three larger points was a grotesque face. One was a hideous scritek, the second was a grimacing human, and the third was a fierce being with stylized. Starry locks of hair who seemed to howl in silent pain. Beneath the central visage was a tiny replica of Prince Tolliver's royal coat of arms. The three-headed monster, Ralaban croaked, nearly beside himself with awe. Queen Anagel's magical talisman that she surrendered as ransom to the vile sorcerer Oragastus. It belongs neither to my mother nor to him now," Tolliver declared. He placed the coronet upon his own head, and suddenly his slender body and plain small face seemed transfigured. The talisman is bonded to me by the star box, and anyone who touches it without my leave will be burnt to ashes. I have not yet fully mastered the three-headed monster's powers, but some day I shall, and when that time comes. I will become a greater wizard than Oragastus ever was. Oh, hidden heart! Ralaban wailed. But before he could continue, the boy said, "Remember your oath, old friend."
Then he removed the coronet from his head and replaced it and the star box in their bags. Now, come along. Perhaps we can get home before it begins to rain again. Two. Now, Cadia cried out. Take them. The huge web woven of Tanglefoot fell. The scores of ropes that had supported it cut at the same moment by the crew of Nisimu high in the Kala trees. It was deep night, but a searing bolt of lightning lit the moment of the net's landing on the floor of the swamp forest and dimmed the orange glowing eyes of the startled Skritek war party. The ambush had been successful. More than forty of the monstrous drowners, suddenly trapped in tough, gluey meshes, roared and shrieked amid the rolling thunder. They tore ineffectually at the web with their tusks and claws, lashing their tails and wallowing on the muddy ground as they became hopelessly entangled. Musk from their scaled hides arose in a noxious cloud. It did not deter their captors from driving long barbed stakes into the soggy soil securing the net's edges. Those Nisimu who were not engaged in the task capered about, popping their eyes out on stalks in mockery of their ancient foe, cheering and brandishing blowpipes and spears. Yield to me, Rorigath, Cadia demanded. Your scheme of invasion and brigandage is finished. Now you must pay the penalty for violating the truce of the Mazy Mire. Never the Skritek leader retorted in the speech without words. He was a gigantic creature, nearly twice her height, and still stood upright with the sticky meshes clinging to his body. The truce no longer binds us, and even if it did, we would never surrender to a puny human female. We will fight to the death rather than yield. So you do not recognize me, treacherous drowner, Cadia murmured. She turned to a sturdy little man of the folk, who stood just behind her. Jagan, it seems that the night sight of these adult-pate truce-breakers is as weak as their wits. Let torches be brought to enlighten them. It had begun to rain heavily again, but at Jagan's command, several members of the Nisimu force struck fire shells and ignited pitch-dipped bundles of reeds, which they took from their knapsacks and stuck onto long sticks. The captured Skritek warriors hissed and bellowed defiance as flame after flame sprang to life, illuminating the turbulent scene in the clearing. Then, as torchbearers converged upon Cadia and she slipped off her hood cape, ignoring the downpour, the monsters fell silent. She was a woman of medium stature, but seemed tall among her cohort of diminutive Nisimu. Her hair was russet, bound into a tight crown of braids. She wore a cuirass of golden scale mail over leathern forester garb, much like that of her companions, and on her breast was the sacred black trillium emblem. Each petal of the flower bore a gleaming eye, one golden like that of the folk, one deep brown like Cadia's own, and one pale silvery blue with odd glints in its dark pupil, and this last eye belonged to the vanished ones. Now we know you the chief of the drowners admitted with reluctance. You are the lady of the eyes. And I am also great advocate of all folk, including you foolish Skritek of the southern morass. How dare you invade and pillage these lands of the Nisimu folk in violation of my edict? Answer me, Rorigath. We do not accept your authority. Besides, one greater than you has revealed the truth to us about your spurious truce. He has told us that soon the vanished ones will return, and the sky trillium shine again in the heavens. Then you humans and all of your cringing, oddling slaves will be destroyed. The world of the three moons will be as it was in the beginning, the domain of Skritek alone. Yes! Yes! roared the other monsters. They began to thrash about and struggle in the net even more violently than before. Who has told you this shocking lie? Cadia demanded. When the Skritek leader did not reply, she drew from her scabbard a strange dark sword with a tripartite pommel, having a dull-edged blade that lacked a point. Reversing it, she held it high, and at the sight of it, all the captive swamp fiends began to moan in fear. You recognize the three-lobed burning eye that I hold? Cadia spoke with an awful calmness. 
Raindrops streamed unheeded down her face and sparkled like gems on her armor. I am the custodian of this true talisman of the vanished ones. It can decide in an instant whether or not you have the right to flout me. But understand this, you drowners of the southern morass. If you are judged and found guilty of sedition, the eye will engulf you in magic fire, and you will perish miserably. The monsters were muttering among themselves now. Rorogath said at last, We believed what the starman said, even though he offered no proof beyond the wonders he worked to demonstrate his command of magic. Perhaps we were mistaken. A starman? Jagan cried in dismay, but Cadia hushed him with a wave of her hand. Falsehoods pour easily from a glib and mischievous mouth, she said to Rorogath, and fools who are reluctant to give up their old violent ways may be all too eager to believe liars and charlatans. I know how your people have resisted the truce. You thought that because you dwelt in a remote corner of the mire, you were beyond the white lady's governance, and beyond my enforcement of her will. You were wrong. The huge Skritek gave a groan of furious despair. Katie of the eyes, leave off chiding us like stupid children. Let your talisman judge us and slay us. At least that will put an end to our shame. But Katie lowered the peculiar sword instead and slipped it again into its sheath. Perhaps that will not be necessary. Thus far, Rorogath, you and your band have only been guilty of scattered acts of terror and the destruction of Asamun's village. Nisimu folk have been injured, but none have died. No thanks to you. Restitution can be made. If you atone for your hostile actions and pledge to return to your own territory and keep the truce, then I will spare your lives. The great muzzled head of the Skritek leader remained defiantly level for many heartbeats. But at last it sagged in submission and the creature fell to his knees. I promise on behalf of myself and my fellows to obey your commands, Lady of the Eyes, and this I avow by the three moons. Cadia nodded. Cut them free, she said to the Nisimu band. Then let Asimon and his counselors negotiate the reparations. She addressed the Skritek leader once again, laying one hand upon the eyed emblem on her breast. Do not let your heart contemplate further treachery, Rorogath of the Drowners. Remember that my sister Haramus, the White Lady, Archimage of the Land, can see you wherever you go. She will tell me if you dare to break the truce of the Maisie Mire again. If you do, I will come for you, and this time requite you without mercy. We understand, said Rorogath. Is it allowed for us to take vengeance upon the wicked one who misled us? He came to us only once, and then went away westward into the mountains, out of Ruenda and toward Zenora. But we could track him down. No, said Cadia. It is my command that you do not pursue the troublemaker. The white lady and I will deal with him in good time. Only warn other Skritek to give no credence to his lies. Picking up her discarded cape and donning it once more against the unrelenting rain, she beckoned for Jagan to bring a torch and come with her. Side by side, the Lady of the Eyes and her chief deputy set off along the broad trail leading to the Vizpar River. After Haramus, the White Lady, had learned of the rampaging monsters in the remote south and bespoke her triplet sister Cadia, it had taken ten days to mobilize the small army of Nisimu and set up the ambush of the Skritek war party. Now that the expedition had ended successfully, Cadia was exceedingly tired. The Skritek leader's words had been puzzling and disquieting, but she was in no humor to discuss them now with the Archimage. Nor was she minded to hear a lecture from her sister when the White Lady learned of how she had used the talisman. Plodding through deep mud, sopping wet from head to heel and every muscle aching, the Lady of the Eyes took hold of a thin lanyard about her neck and drew forth an amulet that had been concealed in her clothing. It glowed faintly golden and was warm and comforting to the touch, a droplet of honey amber with a fossil black trillium blossom in its heart. Thank you, she prayed. Thank you, triune god of the flower, for letting the bluff work one more time, for giving me strength. 
and forgive me the implied deceit. If I knew another way, I would follow it. With the storm winds inaugurating the premature wet time roaring through the tree branches overhead, Cadia and Jagan spoke hardly a word until they reached the backwater of the swollen river where their boats had been left. The Nisimu folk customarily traveled in hollowed log punts and cumbersome flat boats that were laboriously pulled or sculled along. But Cadia's craft was fashioned in the Wavilo style, of thin scraped hide stretched over a lightweight wooden frame. It was drawn up between the buttress roots of a mighty kala tree, and as she and Jagan climbed into it and loosed it from its mooring, two big sleek heads rose from the rain-pocked waters nearby and stared in expectation. They were rimericks, formidable water animals who shared a special relationship, one could hardly call it domestication, with the Wizgu folk, those shy cousins of the Nisimu who dwelt in the golden mire north of the river Vizpar. Since Cadia was the advocate of all folk, including the Wizgu, she also enjoyed the Rimerick's favor. Numbers of the animals, eager to serve her, had left their accustomed territory to live near Cadia's manor of the eyes on the river Golobar, which lay nearly seventy leagues to the east. The eyes of the aquatic beasts shone like jet in the light of Jagan's guttering torch. The Rimericks had dapple-green fur, bristling whiskers, and enormous teeth that they bared in what was for them an amiable expression. Share Mighton with us, lady. We have waited over long for your return. Certainly, dear friends. From her belt pouch, Cadia took a small scarlet bottle gourd. Unstoppering it, she took a sip let Jagan have his share, and then poured a quantity of the sacred liquid into the palm of her left hand. The animals swam close and drank, lapping gently with their horrifying tongues, whip-like appendages with sharp points that they used to spear their prey. As the mitin worked its benign magic, the four unlikely friends felt a great contentment that sharpened their senses and banished fatigue. When the communion was over, Cadia uttered a sigh. Jagan slipped pulling harnesses onto the rimericks. Soundlessly, the great animal submerged, and the boat sped away down the wide, dark river, heading for the secret shortcut that would take them all home in less than six hours. When they were well on their way, with Cadia and Jagan huddled beneath the shelter of a waxwork tarpaulin and munching an austere supper of dried adop roots and journey bread, she said, It went well, I think. Your idea of making a drop net from Tanglefoot was brilliant, Jagan, sparing us a pitched battle with the swamp fiends. The old aborigine's wide, sallow face was mask-like, and his glowing yellow eyes darted askance at her. It was clear that he was deeply troubled. Cadia groaned inwardly, knowing full well why. She was able to postpone her sister Hera's reproaches, but not those of her old friend. For a long time, Jagan did not speak. Katie awaited, eating, although she had lost her taste for food, while the rain beat about their ears and the boat hissed and vibrated with the great speed of their passage. Finally, Jagan said, Farseer, for four years now, you have carried on your chosen work successfully, even though your talisman is no longer bonded to you and no longer capable of magic. No one save I and your two sisters knows that the three-lobed burning eye has lost its power. Thus far the secret has remained safe, she said evenly. But I fear what might happen if you continue to wield the talisman in your office of advocate, as you did tonight. If the truth is discovered, the folk will be deeply scandalized. Your honor will be stained and your authority compromised. Would it not be the greater part of wisdom to do as the white lady has so often requested and consign the burning eye to her care until it can be made potent once again? The talisman is mine, Cadia declared. I shall never relinquish it, not even to Haramis. If you simply cease wearing it, no one would dare to question you. She sighed. Perhaps you are right. I have thought and prayed hard over the matter, but the decision is not easy to make. You saw how the Skritek were terror-smitten by the eye tonight. 
Her hand slipped to the pommel of the dark sword, and she grasped the three conjoined balls at the end. Those orbs were cold now, that once had been warm. The three-lobed burning eye, created ages ago by the vanished ones for their own mysterious purposes, had been capable of dread magic, for it was one of three parts making up the great scepter of power. Once that talisman had been bonded to Cadia's very soul, and the three lobes had opened at her command to reveal living counterparts of the eyes emblazoned upon her armor. She had commanded its power, and anyone who dared touch the sword without her permission died on the spot. But four years ago, the sorcerer Oregastus, last heir to the star men, stole Cadia's talisman and acquired through extortion a second one belonging to Queen Anagel. He bonded both devices to himself and dared hope that the Archimage Haramus would give up the third talisman for love of him. Instead, Oregastus lost Anagel's talisman by misadventure, and later, in a climactic battle, he was destroyed by the magic of the three sisters. The ownerless sword was then restored to Cadia, but the talisman would no longer unite with her magical amulet of trillium amber as it had done before, binding itself to her will. The three-lobed burning eye was apparently as dead as Oregastus. Nevertheless, Cadia had continued to wear it. I have never deliberately lied to the folk about my talisman's function, she said now to Jagan. Its symbolic value remains, even if it is now magically useless. You saw the good it did tonight. Without its threat, the Skritek would surely have fought us to the death. With it, I was able to spare them and prevent a great loss of Nisimu life. That is true, Jagan admitted. The Drowners will return to the southern morass and tell others of their tribe how they were conquered and granted mercy by the Lady of the Eyes and her talisman. She gave a little shrug. Thus the truce of the mire will hold until the next crisis comes along, and there is always a chance that Haramis will eventually discover how to rebond the talisman to me, restoring its potency. The little man shook his head, still uneasy. Like others of his race, he was superficially human in appearance, having tiny slitted nostrils, a broad mouth with small sharp teeth at the fore, and narrow upstanding ears rising on either side of his hunter's cap. Many years ago, he had been royal huntsman to King Crane of Rwenda, Cadia's late father. When she was but a tiny girl, Jagan had taken her into the mazy mire that comprised so much of the little plateau kingdom, teaching her many of its secrets and giving her the mire name Farseer because of her keen vision. The nickname had proved prophetic when Cadia became the custodian of the three-lobed burning eye and the protector of the aboriginal folk who shared the world of the three moons with humankind. Over the years, Jagan had remained Cadia's closest friend and deputy. Sometimes, to her chagrin, he seemed to forget that she was no longer a child, upbraiding her for her hot temper and occasional waff-headed stubbornness. The most annoying thing about this habit of his was that he was often in the right. You must realize, Farseer, Jagan now said gravely, that this particular conflict with the Skritek was far from ordinary. Roragath's tale of a lying star man must have been as great a shock to you as it was to me. The notion of the vanished ones returning is nonsense, she scoffed, and only the lords of the air know what manner of prodigy a sky trillium might be. As for the so-called star man, what if the worst has happened? Jagan ventured, and the accursed sorcerer himself has come back once again from the dead. Impossible! Haramis's own talisman told her that Oregastus had died. Cadia's lip curled in disgust, and my silly sister has wept secretly for his damned soul ever since. Do not mock the white lady's honest emotion, Jagan said sternly, especially when you have never known love's passion yourself. One does not pick and choose whom to love, as I myself know to my sorrow. Cadia looked at him in surprise, for as long as she had known Jagan, he had had no mate. But this was not the time to question him on such a delicate subject. Do you think, then, she asked him, 
that Oregastus might have left others to carry on his impious work? The six acolytes that we know of, the ones he deemed his voices, most certainly perished, and no more apprentice wizards were found when my brother-in-law searched the haunts of Oregastus in the land of Tuzuman. Such persons might have fled from King Antar's justice when news of their master's doom reached them, Jagan said, and if they were clever and avoided the overt use of magic, then they might also have escaped the white lady's scrutiny. Not even her three-winged circle can oversee every part of the world, every moment of the day and night. Katia finished her bread and Adolf and began to pry open block nuts with her small dagger and prick out the meats for the two of them. It is more likely that this so-called star man is nothing but an imposter, an agent of some enemy of Labor Uenda intent on stirring up trouble for political reasons. It was very clever to arouse the Skritek now, at the beginning of the rains. The court of Anagel and Antar is about to withdraw to the Labernaki flatlands for the winter, leaving behind only a reduced garrison in Ruenda. That young scoundrel, King Yandramel of Zenora, would love to see the two thrones pulled into a series of ruinous conflicts with the swamp fiends during the wet time. Then his nation might take over Labor Ruenda's western trade routes. That is plausible, Jagan conceded. Oragath did say that the star man went off in that direction. If Yandramel is up to mischief, King Antar and Queen Anagel will put a stop to his games in short order. He cannot afford to be caught blatantly undermining the stability of the two thrones. Other civilized nations will ostracize him, and he will have no one to peddle his pearls to, except the feathered barbarians. Jagan had been rummaging in their bag of supplies, searching for a corkscrew. Finding one at last, he opened a flask of haleberry wine and filled two wooden cups. The lords of the air grant that this matter be swiftly resolved, he said, in a pious toast. Cadia lifted her own cup, and they both drank. When Jagan spoke again, his tone held dire warning. But if the Star Guild has truly revived... Then not only our own land of Labor Ruenda, but also the rest of the world may be at the brink of collapse. With your talisman useless and that of Queen Anagel lost, there is no possibility of putting together the threefold scepter of power, and that is the only certain weapon against the ancient magic of the Star Guild. Eyeing him over the cup's rim, Cadia smiled. Be of good cheer, old friend. My sisters and I will find out the truth of the situation. Tomorrow, after I have slept in my own bed and refreshed my frazzled brain, we will bespeak Aramis. For now, let us drink our wine and say no more. But the next day, when Cadia had Jagan send the call to the Archimage of the land, using the speech without words, there was no reply. 3. Iriani Haramis called softly into her talisman. Iriani, do you hear me? I have very serious tidings to impart to you, and I need your advice badly. Please answer. But the area within the three-winged circle that she held, looking into it as one would study a hand mirror, remained a formless swirl of pearly luminescence. The plump, cheerful, azure-tinted features of the Archimage of the Sea did not appear. Aramis frowned in perplexity. Talisman, can you tell me why Iriani fails to respond? She is shielded by magic. Is she in her own dwelling? No, she is in the hollow isles, among the mere folk of the far west. Why does she refuse to bespeak me? Aramis asked the circle impatiently. The question is impertinent. Bother. Now I suppose I shall have to go find her. She took up her harp, which had rested on the carpet beside her, and struck a few slow chords to calm herself and assist fruitful thought. In a large ceramic pot beside the curtained window was a huge plant covered with three-petaled flowers as dark as night, and she gazed upon it and was comforted. All evening long, Haramus, archimage of the land, had remained in her study using the three-winged circle to view the conflict between her sister Cadia and the Skritek. Haramis had been both startled and deeply concerned at the words spoken by the leader of the monsters. 
No sooner was Cadia victorious than Haramis cut away from the scene of the ambush, hoping to consult with her colleague and mentor, the Blue Lady of the Sea. Not for a moment did the young archimage of the land think of dealing with this present situation all by herself. If another star man was at large, bent on carrying out the schemes of his dead master, then the world was once again in terrible danger. As for the idea that the vanished ones might return, it was so incredible that Haramis hardly dared to consider it. Oh, Iriani, she exclaimed aloud, of all the inconvenient times for you to go off and hide. With some effort, Haramis again stilled her agitation by strumming the harp and contemplating the flowers. She must not let her unruly imagination run away with her. Before undertaking the task of hunting down the flighty archimage of the sea, she should first find out just who had fomented the uprising of the swamp fiends. The Scriptec aborigines were notoriously gullible, and the one who had incited them to hostility might be only some common human rogue. She put down the harp and lifted her talisman once again. Show me the person who told the Scritek that he was a member of the Star Guild. Obediently, the three-winged circle produced a murky scene of deep night in some rocky fastness, lit by the crimson embers of a dying campfire. Someone lay asleep on the ground. The vision expanded at the Archimage's command until it seemed that she stood within it and was able to walk about and examine everything closely seeing as well as in broad daylight. Lofty mountains reared up on every side, many of them capped by glaciers. There was no snow on the ground in the camp, but a chill wind blew gustily, causing the fire to flare up and then almost expire. Where is this place? she asked the talisman. In the Ohogan Mountains above Zenora, some nine hundred leagues west of your tower. With the darkness abated by the circle's magic, Haramis could see a large fronio, well cared for and having its antlers bedizened with silver, hobbled near a brawling stream. It was sluggishly cropping leaves from shrubs growing among the boulders. The saddle and other tack, piled neatly at one side of the fire, were of high quality and styled in the Zenoran manner with pearl-studded silver accoutrements. On the other side of the fire lay the sleeper wrapped so tightly in zook-wool blankets that only his nose was visible. Close by him rested a stout pair of what looked like saddlebags, except that they were fashioned not from leather but from exotic bird skin with the red and black feathers still in place. Only Sobranians could have made them, those wealthy but rather uncivilized humans who dwelt on the western frontiers of the known world, beyond the nation of Galinar. Leaning against the bags was an intricate contrivance made of dark metal, and at the sight of it Haramis felt a pang of unbelieving horror and could not help but cry out. Her sending was imperceptible to the sleeper, however, and he did not stir as she knelt beside the device and studied it. It was about half an ell in length, flattened and triangular at one end, almost like the stock of an arbalist. From this protruded three slender cylinders or rods bound tightly together by rings and terminating in a much perforated metal sphere. Where the upper stock joined the rods was a kind of flared cuff, and behind it numbers of knobs, studs, and appendages of mysterious function. This particular device was unfamiliar, but the Archimage had seen others like it. In her own cavern of black ice behind her tower on Mount Brom, and also four years earlier during the siege of Deraguilla by the sorcerer Orgastus. The thing in the possession of the alleged star man was an antique weapon, one of those artifacts of the vanished ones that used to turn up from time to time in the ruins of their crumbling cities. Both folk and humankind had long been forbidden to possess these fearsome armaments, but Orgastus had acquired numbers of them by looting the cash of an earlier archimage of the land, and his Tuzumani and Ractumian warriors had used the weapons to deadly effect, waging war on King Antar and Queen Anagel of Labor Ruenda. When the sorcerer's force was defeated, Haramis had caused all of the archaic arms used by the enemy to be collected and destroyed. She had also rendered useless the weapons and other dubious apparatus of the vanished ones stored at her own tower, as well as those remaining in the ancient Kimelon cache partially plundered by the sorcerer. 
methodically over many months she had used her talisman's magic to visit every ruin and other forgotten spot on the world continent where operable ancient weapons were hidden away she had finally destroyed every one of them the talisman had confirmed it where then had the specimen at her feet come from from beneath the sea her talisman said and the archimage groaned at her own stupidity of course the talisman ever took her words literally, and she had bade it search the land. The weapon was slightly battered, but quite clean and obviously in working order. Used in some lethal demonstration, it would command respect and fear for its owner among both folk and humankind in any part of the world, whether or not the wielder was truly a member of the Star Guild. By now, other weapons like it might also have been gathered from submarine hiding places and put to nefarious use. Haramis arose and stood over the sleeper's shrouded form. Talisman, let him turn about so that I may see him clearly. A muffled grunt came from the blankets. The man rolled over and in doing so exposed his face and upper body. He was young and well-built perhaps two and twenty, with nut-brown hair and a meager beard that he had perhaps grown to lend his rather soft features an appearance of greater maturity. His over-tunic was heavy gray silk, tattered and soiled but richly lined with fur. Around his neck, hanging from a beautifully wrought platinum chain, was a disc with a many-pointed star. Magnifying her view of it, Aramis saw that the medallion was no counterfeit. It was identical to the one Oregastus had worn, but in her sending she could not tell whether or not it invested its wearer with a magical aura. Who is this man? Haramis asked the circle. Where does he come from? The questions are impertinent. Is he the only one of his kind? The question is impertinent. What are his plans? The question is impertinent. Where did he obtain this weapon? Does he have access to more of them? The questions are impertinent. Why have you given me sight of him, even though he wears the star? Because he is a novice, as yet without the full powers of his guild. Haramis uttered a grim laugh. Well, that was useful knowledge indeed. She now knew for certain that the sleeping man was no impostor, but a genuine initiate of the dread body of ancient enchanters too lacking in training to have shielded himself completely from her scrutiny as his late master had done, but adept enough to conceal his identity and intentions. The talisman's refusals also confirmed the archimage in her suspicion that the young star man had fellows more powerful and dangerous than himself. Haramis had no desire to take him prisoner, nor would she destroy his weapon. Instead, she intended to oversee his actions with her talisman, and hoped that he would provide valuable information about the guild. Dealing with him, and any companions or allies he might have, would have to wait. I have seen enough of this vision, she said. Instantly she was back in her study, seated in her chair by the cozy fire, with the black trillium flowers blooming in the shadowed window niche. She let the three-winged circle swing free at her breast and sat back, thinking. So the weapons came from under the sea. She had never suspected that the vanished ones might have lived there as well as on the land, nor had the blue lady ever mentioned the fact. Easy-going and unsuspicious, Iriani ruled her naive aboriginal subjects with a light hand. Most probably she would not even have noticed the Star Guild quietly seeking out forbidden weapons. Unfortunately, the sweet-natured archimage of the sea knew little of the perfidy of humankind. Iriani's secretive mere folk, able to dwell for long periods underwater, would have to assist Haramis in retrieving and destroying those dangerous artifacts that were still hidden beneath the sea. Even more urgent would be Iriani's cooperation in hunting for the home base of the Starmen. It was more than likely that the villains had made their lair in the remote and uncharted western regions of the world continent, or even on an island. A chilling idea struck Haramis at that moment. She lifted her talisman. Show me a vor's eye view of the Hollow Isles and the realm of the Blue Lady. Again the room vanished. It seemed as though Haramis soared at a great height on the pinions of a mighty lammergeier, 
those two birds of high intelligence who were her friends and helpers. She saw below another peninsula, thrusting seaward from the southwestern margin of the world. Offshore lay a sizable cluster of islands, some barren and some clothed with unfamiliar vegetation. A few had active volcanoes that steamed gently. In her sending, she flew among the sea-girt specks of land, noting the entrances to many caves. To a human, this was a cheerless and desolate place, pounded by huge waves rolling in from the trackless western sea, and blasted by winds that raced for thousands of leagues, unimpeded by land. There were widely scattered settlements of mere folk, but she saw no trace of humanity. Does the Star Guild abide here? she asked. No, the three-winged circle said. Well, that was a relief. She studied the scene more carefully. This was a region she did not know, for no human beings had settled here. Nor, so far as she knew, had any even visited the Hollow Wilds. Those of her own race who had chosen not to vanish, who had remained on the world of the three moons and defied the conquering ice, inhabited more hospitable parts of the land to the south and east. If any brave souls had ever ventured into the alien purlieus ruled by the Archimage of the Sea, they had not returned to civilized lands to tell the tale. Haramis herself had been too busy with the affairs of her own domain to explore that of Uriani. How far are these islands from my tower? Haramis asked the talisman. Over seven thousand leagues as the Vor flies. By sea, as humans would make the journey, it is nearly eight thousand leagues. Sacred flower, the Archimage murmured. What a blessing it is that I do not have to rely upon a ship or a bird to carry me there. She abolished the vision and returned to familiar surroundings. Her talisman would transport her bodily to the place in a trice, as easily as ascending, and for this exceedingly useful mode of transport she could thank dear Iriani. By teaching Haramis how to use personal magic expertly, the Blue Lady had enabled her young colleague to command the wider powers of the three-winged circle, in ways that Cadia and Anagel had never been able to achieve with their talismans. Haramis knew that she owed Iriani more than she could ever repay. I only hope I can find her quickly. She stared into the now empty circle. Haramis's talisman was not a large thing. The silvery wand had a ring at one end for the chain that suspended it about her neck, and at the other end a hoop slightly more than a handspan wide, topped by a trio of tiny wings. These enfolded a drop of glowing amber with a fossil black trillium in its heart, identical to the amber amulets of her two sisters. At their birth, the triplet princesses of Rwenda had been gifted with the magical amulets by the late Archimage Bina, who had named them Petals of the Living Trillium and prophesied for them a fearsome destiny and terrible tasks. Living that destiny, Haramis, Cadia, and Anagel had faced and overcome many of their own personal weaknesses. All three sisters had taken on responsibilities both awful and magnificent. Were the events now taking place, leading them to a challenge greater than any they had yet faced? Like the Holy Flower, they were three and also one. The futures of Archimage, Lady of the Eyes, and Queen were entwined inexorably, whether they willed it or not. Countering the Star Guild threat must then involve Cadia and Anagel as well as herself. Of that, Haramis was more than certain. She decided that she would transport herself to Katie's home immediately after speaking to the Blue Lady. The three-winged circle would then carry her and her sister to Queen Anagel, who was in residence at Ruenda Citadel. The Queen was four months pregnant, but that would not stop her from working with her husband Antar and the heads of other nations to counter the Star Guild's armed threat to the already faltering balance of the world. Katie would have to rally the folk. With their ability to speak without words to each other across great distances and their intimate knowledge of the land and sea, the Aborigines would be invaluable in any quest against the Star Guild. I will also insist, Haramis decided, that Katie now give up her impotent talisman to me for safekeeping, as she should have done long ago. Unbonded, it could be stolen by any sneak thief or even by the Star Men. 
It was bad enough that Queen Anagel's talisman, the coronet called the three-headed monster, should have gone missing during the late war with Oregastus. Losing a second piece of the scepter of power would be insupportable. Oregastus. She had hardly dared speak his name since his death four years ago. What was the connection between the star master she had loved so helplessly and this resurgence of the guild? Harimus rose from her seat and began to pace before the window. It was a wild night in the high mountains where her tower stood. Snow fell thickly and a bitter wind from the ice cap to the northwest howled round the casement like a chorus of demons from the ten hells. She toyed with her talisman as she brooded over events of the past. When Orgastus began his last assault on Dera Grilla, the northern capital of the two thrones, he had in his possession not only the three-headed monster and the three-lobed burning eye, but also a certain glassy container with a star guild emblem on its lid that could bind or unbind the talismans. He had used this crucially important star box to transfer ownership of the monster and the eye from Anagel and Cadia to himself. The box, like the queen's magical coronet, had disappeared in the tumult of battle. For some time, Harimus had been certain that an unknown person had found both of these missing magical items and was now the true bonded owner of the three-headed monster. Her own empowered talisman, which would readily pinpoint the location of Cadia's dead eye, and which had led her without demur to the young starman, had steadfastly refused to reveal anything whatsoever about the missing coronet or the box that controlled its bonding. Iriani had agreed with Harimus that this could only mean that the three-headed monster's magic was fully potentiated. It had cleaved to a new owner. And yet no great upstart sorcerer had appeared in the world of the three moons. The coronet's master was keeping it hidden and unused. Harimus could not imagine why, unless this person was waiting until he could also get his hands upon Cadia's talisman and bond to it also with the star box. Owning two parts of the scepter of power, the unknown sorcerer would command magic almost surpassing that of Harimus. If this person should ally with a reborn star guild, equipped with the marvelous devices of the vanished ones, the world would certainly be lost. Lords of the air, Harimus prayed, we have had peace for these four years, and yet it is clear that the world never truly regained the balance that Orgastus upset. Is this my own fault? Is it my love for that dead sorcerer, which I confess has endured undiminished, that has left us vulnerable? Or might the unthinkable have happened, as it had once before? No, thanks be to the triune, that was impossible. Harimus would remember forever the day she and her valiant sisters had turned back upon the sorcerer, the destruction he would have wreaked upon them. The flower had overcome the star. There had been unexpected victory for the living Trillium, and annihilation for Oregastus, even though Harimus had hoped to spare him. The moment she had inquired of her lover's fate, and the talisman's pitiless reply were still branded upon her heart. Standing at the embrasured window beside the black trillium plant, she began to weep. There was a small clear area in the frosted pane. Windborne snowflakes rushed at her, seeming to be fatally drawn to the light within the room, smashing themselves into oblivion as they struck the thick leaded glass casement. He had also been fatally drawn. Harimus had wanted to spare Oregastus the ultimate punishment, before their final encounter, she had placed the black hexagon called the Sinisher of the Star Guild within an ancient prison of the Vanished Ones. This place, a chasm hewn from living rock and lying deep underground, would have held the sorcerer securely no matter what magic he called upon. The Sinisher was to have drawn Oregastus to it like a magnet at the moment he exerted his ultimate powers on behalf of evil. Once in captivity, perhaps reformed by gentle persuasion and their mutual love, she hoped he might undergo a change of heart that would eventually allow her to free him. But a tremendous earthquake had shaken that part of the world, collapsing the chasm where the sinisher lay. The device still performed its intended magic, however, drawing Oregastus into airless rocky chaos at the instant of his defeat. 
She had asked her talisman what had become of him, and it had said, He has gone the way of the vanished ones. He is no longer in this world. Dead. Aramis drew back from the window and wiped a cold hand across her streaming eyes. You are dead, my poor flawed sweetheart, and I am left with nothing but my somber duty, which obliged me to destroy the only man I ever loved. And now the duties of that office must no longer be postponed. It was time for her to go in search of Iriani, then meet with her sisters. But first... She lifted her talisman and looked into it. Three-winged circle, show me that which I have been afraid to conjure heretofore, a true vision of my dead love's face. I am sorely in need of comfort, and the refreshment of my memory of him is the only boon that will suffice. The talisman came alive, its circle filled with pale glowing colors. It said, The request is impertinent. What? she cried in shock. You deny me this simple thing, you cruel, capricious talisman. The request is impertinent. Will you drive me mad as well as break my heart? Show him to me. No, the talisman replied calmly. I cannot show you the dead face of Oregastus because it does not exist. What do you mean? she asked sharply. I know he is ashes, scattered amongst red-hot subterranean rocks. I ask only to renew my memory of his features. If the world is indeed out of balance, then I must embark upon new and parlous adventures. I, I would fashion for myself a portrait of him as a consolation, and perhaps as a warning to myself as well. Surely there can be no harm in that. I command that you depict for me his face as it was during his last days in this world. Now your request is one I can fulfill. The restless eddies of pearly light brightened, became solid. For a moment she saw a head encased within a dramatic silvery headdress, haloed by pointed rays, with two fearsome white stars for eyes. No, that is not the way I wish to remember him. Reproduce the face of the one I loved. The vision faded, then reformed. The countenance of a white-haired man, haggard and lined and yet strangely beautiful, seemed to gaze directly at her from within the circle. His jaw was strong, his mouth wryly smiling, his eyes were the color of her own, the lightest possible shade of blue, with great black pupils holding secret glints of gold. As she drank in his image, Haramis called upon her personal powers. In her right hand, she held the talisman. In her left, something ghostly and crystalline suddenly appeared, flat and slightly smaller than the circle, glittering like an insubstantial gem. A portrait, she commanded. The lens of crystal fog darkened and became a likeness identical to that produced by the talisman, delicately painted on horic ivory and framed in gold. The vision within the three-winged circle vanished, but the sorcerer's picture was real. Aramis put it into one of the pockets of her gown, then left the study to make preparations for her magical journey. 4. After giving instructions to her Visby Chatelaine Majira and to her steward Shiki the Dorok, the Archimage changed into warmer clothing and put on the long cloak of her office. Its fabric was white, seeming to change with movement into that delicate blue seen in shadowed snow. The cloak was bordered with platinum bands and had on the back the emblem of the black trillium. She pulled its hood over her long black hair, then donned gloves. In the silence of her private apartment, she prayed for strength and success. Then, standing on the fur rug at the foot of her bed, she took up her talisman again. Transport me bodily to that place in the hollow isles where the Archimage of the sea is. Her bedroom dissolved, and she seemed to be within some fantastic theatrical set, a cave made of insubstantial diamonds, glittering in a hundred rainbow hues. An eye blink later, the illusion vanished. She stood inside a genuine cavern, dank and extremely cold. Dripping stalactites hung from the ceiling like the tusks of a gigantic slavering beast. Beneath them were inky pools into which falling water tinkled and plopped. 
Rock pillars, water-sculptured shapes like half-dissolved statues, and other strange formations loomed up on every side. Blobs of glowing matter that might have been fungus or even slime dawdler colonies were scattered about the irregular surface of the cave ceiling, shedding light on the eerie scene. Iriani, she cried, but no one answered, and she demanded of her talisman, Where is the Archimage of the Sea? As if in answer, there came a sudden splashing from one of the larger pools. Three aborigines of a form unfamiliar to Haramis climbed out, shook themselves, and stood in a row, regarding her with luminous golden eyes. They were of small stature, like the Nisimu and Wizgu, but had the fully scaled skin of the taller forest races. Their faces were slightly muzzled like the Wavilo and Glismak, but were otherwise human in aspect. They had webbed hands and feet, with stout talons upon the three digits, and about their upper arms were rows of golden bracelets inset with colored discs made from fish scale. Instead of having hair, their round heads were adorned with many parallel crests, tending from the brow to the nape. These and their large ears were ribbed, like the fins of fishes, with a translucent membrane connection. They wore no clothing, but the scales of their bodies seemed almost like flexible armor of green and dark blue, giving them a neat and attractive appearance. I offer you greetings, Haramis said. I am the Archimage of the land, and I seek my friend, the Blue Lady of the Sea. We will take you to her, the mere folk replied in unison. Their language was unfamiliar, but, as always, her talisman let her understand the sense of it. May I ask your names, and to what race of folk you belong? The central aborigine, who wore a necklace of the colored discs, pointed to his heart and said, This one is Ansebado, first of the Lurkomi, and these are the second and third, Nilimi and Tirano, also faithful subject of the Blue Lady. If you would look upon her, follow us. Look upon her? Aramis felt a tingle of apprehension. Could Iriani be ill, or had something even worse happened? The three Lurkomi set off at a rapid pace in single file, the talons of their toes clicking on the wet stone. The cave air became colder the farther they progressed, and as the temperature fell, the numbers of luminescent creatures decreased drastically. After stumbling several times in the growing darkness, Haramis held her talisman high, bidding the trillium amber within its wings to shine more brightly and light away. What a dreadful place, she thought. Except for the glowing lumps, this particular hollow isle seemed sterile and lifeless, with no sign that thinking beings had ever made their mark upon it. There was no sign of mineral ore or anything else of value, and the aborigines did not investigate such places for amusement as humans did. What in the world was Iriani doing here? Aramis had not seen her friend in some time, and realized now that she had greatly missed the Blue Lady's tart good humor and common sense. The Archimage of the Sea was no otherworldly mystic. She loved good food and beautiful clothing, teasing Aramis for her disinterest in either, and she had been the only one to sympathize truly with her young colleague's doomed love for Oregastus. Aramis thought, Iriani will understand my carrying his portrait, too, while my sisters never would. Because of her vast age and experience, the Blue Lady would almost surely know whether there was any possibility that the Vanished Ones might return, as the young Starman had told the Skritek, and what the so-called Sky Trillium portended. Ariani might even be able to obtain the counsel of the mysterious Archimage of the Firmament concerning the rebirth of the Star Guild. The enigmatic Dark Man in the Moon had only grudgingly lent assistance during the late war, and he had ignored every attempt of Haramis to communicate with him since then. The underground journey beneath the Hollow Isle seemed to be taking hours, leading from cavern to cavern, moving ever deeper into regions of frigid darkness. At last, after they had traversed a cramped, stalactite fang tunnel, the Lurkomi led the Archimage into a chamber very different from the others. It was full of icy mist that was suffused with a rich blue glow, swirling and billowing like phantom draperies and concealing details of the cave's interior. 
There, said the aboriginal spokesman, pointing toward the indistinct source of the illumination. The lady is there. Iriani? Haramis's call was hesitant. She went toward the hazy light, stepping gingerly on the frost-cracked rock floor. All at once the mist thinned, and she saw ahead of her a sight that brought her up short, exclaiming with amazement. Row upon row of the Lurkomi stood in silence, with bowed heads, before what Haramis at first thought was a colossal glowing sapphire. The object was twice her height, with a darker heart. Coming closer, she found she had been mistaken in thinking it a gem. Within the blue transparency was the ample form of a woman, standing upright. She wore an indigo gown spangled with tiny jewels that pricked out graceful designs of marine growth. A filmy cape of midnight blue fell from two pearl brooches at her shoulder. Her dark hair was elaborately dressed in coils and rolls, held in place by ornate shell combs and hairpins with pearls at the ends. The plump arms of the Archimage of the Sea were extended in motionless, futile appeal. Her open mouth seemed to have been frozen in mid-scream, and her eyes glittered with terror. Oh, Triune God, no, Haramis whispered. Yes, ah, yes, the Lurkomi folk wailed in heartbroken response. Haramis ran forward to what she thought was a glass case imprisoning her friend. As she touched it, she discovered the truth. The blue lady's eyes moved ever so slightly. She was entombed within a great chunk of blue ice. And she was alive. Who has done this? Haramis asked on Sabato, after some time had passed, during which she tried without success to free Iriani. Four humans, the first of the Lurkomi declared, came in a small sailboat to our village on Sundown Isle, which is half a day from here by water. Three were men and one was a woman, and they demanded that we summon the Blue Lady. When did this happen? Nearly twelve moons ago. We were most astonished, for the only people of your kind that we ever see are the feathered barbarians, and they come very seldom to trade for fire shell, gold, and precious fish scale, and never during the stormy time of year. These human persons were lofty in demeanor and atrociously rude. Each one wore a star hanging on a chain. When we asked their reasons for wanting audience with the lady, they did not answer, but instead killed several of our old people by means of awesome magic. They repeated their demand, threatening to destroy our children next, and then all of our tribe, if we did not hasten to do their bidding. We had no choice but to give in. No choice. Do you understand, white lady? Haramis said nothing. The Meerman continued. We explained that our Blue Lady's magical portal is here, in Flyaway Isle. The strangers compelled the three of us to bring them here to the cave. Then, this one made the perfidious call. As first of the Lurkomi, it was my melancholy duty. But if I had known what would happen, I would have begged those brutes to slay us all instead. He began to weep and the second and third also, and in another minute the entire crowd of little people in the blue misty cavern howled and sobbed in contrition, striking their crested heads on the ground. Haramis calmed them and commanded that the rest of the story be told. Ansibado said, No sooner had the archimage of the sea stepped from her enchanted door, which lies right behind her even now, than the awful deed was done. The female stranger, one having flame-colored hair, used a magical device that sprinkled the poor lady with some gelid astral liquid. She froze instantly. Further sprinkling produced the blue ice block that you see. No fire can melt it. No prayer can banish it. Not even your own magic can overcome it. The name of the Lurkomi Merfolk will stink throughout the sea realm forever for we have condemned our dear blue lady to living death. Perhaps not, Haramis said none too kindly, lifting her talisman to forestall another mournful hubbub. This ice is not true magic, but something else appertaining to the vanished ones and their science. I cannot free the blue lady now, 
but perhaps a way might be found. Ansevato and his people fell on their faces to thank her, but she ordered them to arise, pull themselves together, and answer more questions. Haramis learned that the human villains were all dressed in the silver and black robes of the Star Guild. They were none of them above thirty years in age, were of differing stature, and all, save the red-headed woman, had hair of grizzled gray or dirty white. Each Star Guildsman carried a dissimilar ancient weapon, one killed by boiling the blood, another threw forth a deadly small thunderbolt, the third provoked fatal convulsions, and the fourth, much larger than the others and more complex in aspect, had ensorcelled the Blue Lady. The malefactor stayed with us for several days, Anzavato said, questioning us about the underwater regions hereabouts where the vanished ones once flourished. Then another sailboat came with two more star men. One of them was young, of no special distinction, save for his loud and bullying speech. But the other human was different from all the rest. He was much older, and he wore a many-rayed starburst headpiece of silvered leather that concealed his upper face, while leaving the back of his head uncovered. His long hair was as pale as the platinum of his star. Haramis gave a low cry. I seem to have congealed in her own vitals. This could not be. Must not be. She found herself asking, Was, was he tall? Taller than the others, who gave him great reverence and called him master. He came into this cavern, stepped into the portal of the Blue Lady, and disappeared. The others waited for some hours, whereupon he reappeared. Then the lot of them got into the boats and went away. Oh, lords of the air, Haramis whispered. With her gloved fingers stiff and clumsy, she drew the gold-framed small picture out of her robe and was barely able to ask her last question. And was this the Star Master? The little aborigine frowned at the portrait, then replied, His face was partly masked by the starry headgear, but, yes, it was he. He had eyes like that. Eyes like yours, white lady. Pain, born in her swelling heart, was spreading like molten metal through the entire body of the Archimage of the land. It was a jubilant hurting, mingled with stark fear. She spoke in a voice made unsteady by emotion. Since the Blue Lady's imprisonment, have the Lurkomi folk visited underwater ruins of the vanished ones at the Starmen's behest? Nay, said Anzabado, but we have heard that other mere tribes have been compelled to do so. They have gathered certain ancient artifacts coveted by the Starmen, but none of them knows what these things might be. Nor do we. But Haramis knew. I will come to you again, Anzabado. Command your folk to watch by the imprisoned Blue Lady until then. Should any person emerge from her magical portal, bespeak me at once, even if you must lay down your lives to do so. Now, farewell. She clasped her talisman and commanded her magic to take her to Katya. Five. Queen Anagil stared at the plate of food before her a simple grilled fillet of garsu fish and a helping of glazed darun tuber, and put down her knife and fork. I confess that Hera's dreadful account of the poor blue lady has robbed me of my appetite. It pierces my very soul to know that there is nothing we can do to free her from that hellish enchantment. If Iriani is frozen stiff, Cadius said reasonably, she cannot be suffering. What good can it do her if you pine and starve yourself? You are ever practical, Anagil said with a sigh, but hard-hearted. Nonsense, said the Lady of the Eyes, taking a goodly helping of bittercress salad and pouring rich cheese dressing over it. One must sympathize with the troubles of others, but not to the point of impairing one's own good health, especially if one has duties of state to perform. Don't you agree, Hera? The Archimage inclined her head. 
My talisman refuses to confirm my suspicions, but I believe that Iriani's imprisonment may be only the beginning of a new time of peril for all of us. The return of the Star Guild, and the possibility that Oregastus may be gathering weapons of the Vanished Ones, poses a grave danger to the peace and good balance of the world. It may be that we three will once again be called upon, and if this be so, then we will need all of the physical and mental strength we can muster. And you, dearest little sister, have important personal obligations as well. Queen Anagel received this admonition in chilly silence, but she began with obvious reluctance to eat. The triplets were at dinner in Rwanda Citadel, seated at the high table with the queen presiding, while others of the court feasted at lower boards in the torchlit great hall. There were many persons missing, including King Antar and his military advisers, and the usual cheerful conviviality attending the evening meal was absent. Less than an hour earlier, the magic of Haramis had transported Cadia and herself to the citadel, where they had reported to the labor Rwandan court not only the misfortune of the Archimage of the Sea, but also the apparent resurgence of the Star Guild under the leadership of Oregastus. The latter piece of news had caused a furor, since only a single day now remained before the departure of the royal entourage on the long journey to Labernock. King Antar, Lord Marshal Lacanilo, and General Gorkane had sequestered themselves in order to make hasty plans for increasing the security of the train, leaving the Queen and her two sisters to speculate upon what the dire events might portend. At the present time, the Archimage said, only the lords of the air know what Oregastus' long-range plans might be, but we can be assured that they involve the conquest of the world, both by physical means and by dark sorcery. Anangel added more crystallized honey to her cup of Darcy tea and stirred it morosely. I find it hard to believe that once again that evil man has cheated death. Who would ever have thought such a thing possible? Hara, how could your talisman have deceived you about his fate? It was Cadia who made the unpalatable reply. The talisman spoke true. Only the Archimage misinterpreted its words. Haramis admitted the accusation with a doleful nod. She brought forth the portrait of Orgastus and put it on the table before them. When I requested a view of his dead face, the talisman could not comply. Only when I worded the command differently, avoiding the mention of death, did it show me his likeness so that I could fashion this picture. Now the Lady of the Eyes cried fiercely, Damn that wizard! For all we know, he has already found a star box and bonded Annie's three-headed monster to himself. No, Haramis stated positively. My talisman indicates that he is not. Some other person has the coronet and the box but the circle will not tell me who. Cadia took up her table knife and with precision sliced a drumstick from the succulent roasted togar on the platter before her. You may wager, platinum to plarpits, that Orgastus will seek out this coy new magician and attempt an alliance. You are probably right, Katie, Anna Jill said, and this is all the more reason why you should heed Hara's counsel and give up your own impotent talisman into her safe keeping so that neither villain gets hold of it. Never, Katie has said through her mouthful of meat, even though the three moons tumble from the firmament. Oh, Katie, cried the exasperated queen. It is the only safe course, and you know it. All very well for you to say muttered the Lady of the Eyes, pointing an accusation with the fowl's leg bone, having given up your own talisman to Oregastus in ransom, thus saving the life of the king, my husband, Anagil exclaimed in high dudgeon. Should I have let Antar die in captivity? You did not give Hara and me time to rescue him, Cadia retorted, but capitulated to the kidnappers with unseemly haste, opening the way to the invasion of your kingdom very quietly, so that none of the other supping courtiers noticed. The queen began to weep. You are right. I was at fault. But so are you. Your three-lobed burning eye is sure to be stolen by Oregastus or this unknown wizard sooner or later. My own foolishness, 
and your stubborn vainglory may yet doom us all. For shame, Katie, the Archimage said, taking her youngest sister in her arms. Have you forgotten that Annie is with child and should not be upset? She is as rugged as a draft volumnial dropping its yearly calf, for all her fragile looks, Katie remarked callously. And do not either of you think to convince me to give up my talisman through this soppy charade. Anagel ceased crying. She sat up, wiped her eyes with a napkin, and shrugged. It was worth a try, she said sweetly. By the flower, the Archimage said, chagrined as much by the Queen's artful deception as by Cadia's intransigence. You two will drive me to distraction. No, dear Hera, said Anagel, now in deadly earnest. We will rather do whatever must be done to help you conquer the star men and restore the balance of the world, no matter what, the personal cost. She turned to her other sister with a steely glance. Is it not so, Katie? Oh, Lothok dung, cried the Lady of the Eyes, flinging the drumstick down onto her plate. I suppose I will have to give in. You shall have the burning eye, Hera. What matter if my pride is in rags and my confidence undermined? It is for the best, the Archimage said, with evident relief. May I keep the talisman with me until we three separate at least? Cadia asked. Certainly. There can be no danger here within the citadel. I know for a certainty that there are no viaducts here, through which Oregastus or his agents might enter and steal the eye. Those triply bedamned magical bolt holes, Cadia exclaimed. Harimus pushed aside dishes and tableware, laid out a large clean napkin, and touched her talisman to it. There was a faint smell of scorched linen, and immediately the cloth became a wondrously detailed map of the world continent. The viaducts are not truly magic, even though they seem so to us who know little of the science behind their making. Behold the viaduct portals. Anagel exclaimed in amazement, for the map became peppered with innumerable scarlet pinpoint dots. So many! And now, said the Archimage, since Aurigastus stole a certain book belonging to Iriani that explained their operation, they are accessible to the sorcerer and his star guild. Cadia said, the villains are capable of popping up out of any one of those points like Ziklu from a warren, and they can also go to ground through them, escaping their pursuers. Hera is thus far unable to destroy the viaducts or close them with her magic. It seems that the vanished ones used these passageways for casual travel about their world, the white lady explained. To ordinary people, the viaduct openings are invisible and imperceptible. But if one knows more or less where the portal is, it is only necessary to utter the proper arcane command. Viaduct system activate, whereupon it becomes visible and operative. Some of the viaducts were destroyed in the great conflict between the Vanished Ones and the Star Guild, but these on the map remain. Heretofore, they have been used only by the Archimages of Yore and by the Sindona when they venture forth from the place of knowledge. Cadia said, You'll be interested to know, Annie, that this viaduct, she stabbed her finger at one of the dots, opens right into Zotopanion Keep in the Winter Palace of Labernock. It was the way by which both Iriani and the Sindona gained access to the keep during the climax of the Battle of Deragrilla. Holy flower, cried the dismayed queen. Is there no way of getting rid of these abominable tunnels? My talisman says there is, Harimus replied. However, its instructions are given in archaic scientific gibberish, and so far I can make no sense of it. When I return to my tower, I will look further into the matter of obliterating the viaducts. But for the present, we shall have to barricade them instead. All that are in critical locations must be enclosed within sturdy cages or earthen mounds and be heavily guarded with all. Anagel studied the map intently. There are not so many portals in the mazy mire as elsewhere, but here is one not far from the Queen's Mireway. I wonder. The trip to the winter capital will be so lengthy and tedious in the early rains. If, as you say, 
There is a viaduct leading directly to Zotopanion Keep. Do not contemplate it for a moment, Aramis said aghast. Only one adept in the science of the vanished ones dare use the things. Sometimes their routing is fixed, and one has no control over the ultimate destination. At other times, if a kind of complex magical spell is recited before entry, the viaduct carries the traveler to the location that is specified. But if this spell is not said properly, the person risks emerging within the sempaternal ice cap, or even deep beneath the sea. She pointed again to the map, and it was indeed true that some of the scarlet dots were in perilous places. "'Damn!' said the dainty queen. Her fair hair was bound up with ribbons of a gold so deep it was nearly brown, and she wore a loose-fitting smocked satin gown of the same color, trimmed with warm fur and adorned with a collar of trillium amber. Her pregnancy of four months was still unnoticeable. I would have gladly whisked myself in the court by viaduct from here to Deragrilla and spared us the long journey in the rain. I could transport you, Antar, and the children, Harimus offered, albeit hesitantly, even though carrying others strains my magic to the utmost. But the queen shook her head. It was but a jest, Hara. I would not dream of asking you to exhaust yourself. No, we must go to Labernock with the others of the court entourage, as is fitting. I shall give each of you copies of this map to keep, the Archimage said. Annie, you will have to arrange for soldiers, preferably with aboriginal helpers, to stand guard at those viaduct openings in critical places within Labernock and Rwanda. I shall command Cady's folk to watch the terminals in more remote regions, the Maisie Mire, the Ohogan Mountains, and the Tassileo Forest. If members of the Star Guild are seen, the folk will sound the alarm using the speech without words. What of the viaducts in other nations? inquired the Queen. I have already bespoken a warning, Harima said. Every civilized country will soon be on the lookout for suspicious persons wearing stars. The scoundrels can wreak no sorcery without their medallions, Cadia explained to Anagel. Unfortunately, this does not hold true for their use of weapons of the vanished ones, which are not truly magical, but partake of the same ancient science as the viaducts and those antique artifacts one may purchase from certain traders. How shall we defend ourselves against starmen equipped with such dread armaments? asked the queen in apprehension. We still have our magic, the Archimage said. And if the Triune wills it, we will also soon have an alliance of every nation under the Three Moons to counter the much smaller forces of those loyal to the Star. After giving warning to the other nations, I also requested that they dispatch special envoys in fast ships to Deraguilla. The delegations should have arrived by the time the royal retinue of Labor Uenda completes its journey to the Flatlands. We will hold a conclave of mutual defense there in your capital in forty days. I will gladly assist you and my royal husband in rallying the nation, said Queen Anagel. I suppose Katie will be doing the same work amongst the folk. Not for some time, the Lady of the Eyes said, for I have been given a larger job to do. Only one state balked at Hara's plan of alliance. Sobrania. The Queen assumed a rueful face. I might have known. The feathered barbarians are so fearful of plots against them by Galinar or the Imlet and Okamizi republics that they resist any pact that infringes upon their much-vaunted independence. Emperor Dinambo of Sabrania is an honorable man, according to his lights, but impetuous and short-sighted, and hardly inclined to concern himself with nations other than his own collection of fractious tribes. Will you go to him, Katie, and attempt persuasion? Yes. May the flower defend me. Hara has commanded it, and I will willingly obey. She will also have another task. The Archimage spoke more quietly, even though musicians had begun to play the introduction to the night's entertainment, making such a noise that eavesdropping seemed impossible. I told you of observing a young starman in the mountains above Zenora. He had with him feathered saddlebags of Sobranian make. This could be a meaningless detail, or it might be a valuable clue. To the location of the Star Guild headquarters, 
Queen Anagel's eyes, blue as the dry time sky, sparkled with excitement. Have you any other indication pointing to Sabrania? None as yet, Haramis admitted, for my talisman is powerless to descry guildsmen who are in full control of the star's magic. It was only good fortune, or the kindness of the lords of the air, that enabled me to detect and send to that young star man who incited the Skritek. He was a novice, not yet fully adept in commanding the star's protection, perhaps undertaking a mission of minor import while his fellows deal with weightier conspiracies. They left off talking for a moment while Pages cleared the table of earlier courses of food, brought in tarts and fresh fruit, and refilled the wine goblets. Then there was a fanfare of bugle horns. A troop of Tuzamani acrobats pranced into the hall to much applause. But how? the queen asked Taramis under cover of the renewed noise. Will Katie hope to spy out the starmen in Sobrania if your own great magic is powerless to do so? Eyes, said Cadia laconically. Not three-lobed burning ones, but the two that God set into my head. Wherever the starmen hide, and it might well be in a backward place like the land of feathered barbarians, the scoundrels must eat and sleep, and unless they subsist wretchedly as wanderers in the wilderness, they require a permanent dwelling of fair size, food to eat, clean clothes to wear, beasts to ride when they are not zipping hither and yon through magic viaducts, and a corps of servants to keep all these things in order. Nor will they go invisible at all times, for that takes much effort. If they are hiding in Sabrania, I will find them. If they are not, I will look elsewhere, as Hara instructs me. The starmen will know that you search for them, Anagil said baldly. They will descry you through sorcery and hunt you down. Have you forgotten, Cadia said, pretending to watch the performers with an idle smile, how we three, as young princesses, fled for our lives from Oregastus, his voices, and the evil King Voltric? None of those miscreants could seek us out through magic, because we were protected then, as we are protected now. She drew from the shirt beneath her forester's jerkin a faintly glowing amber pendant with a fossil black trillium within, swinging upon a golden chain. Only the three talismans of the Scepter of Power were able to countermand the magic of the flower. Ah, breathed the queen, smiling with relief. Of course. I fear that I take its magic too much for granted. Her hand moved briefly to touch her bodice where her own amulet was hidden. Haramis smiled. Her trillium amber nestled within the silvery wings of the circle wand hanging about her neck. Katie will be shielded from the oversight of those who would do her harm through magic. The Amber has other powers, but that one is perhaps the most valuable. The Starmen or their followers may still recognize my person as I go among them, Katie admitted, as I may know them by their stars, but I will disguise myself and my traveling party well. Perhaps, if I can persuade the Amber to obey, I will even be able to go invisible. If you take any of your mere folk with you to Sobrania, you will be conspicuous, Anagel warned. The aborigines of that distant region are said to be much different in appearance from those of the peninsula. I must take Jagan, for his counsel is necessary, as is his ability to speak without words across long distances and keep me in touch with Haramis. My other comrades on this quest will be human. Annie. I ask that you find six of your most valiant young oathed companions to accompany me as volunteers. The Wavilo will take us down to the great Mutar to Var and the sea. I have friends in the Veronian capital who will provide us with a ship and all other things necessary for the Sobranian quest. The acrobats did a spectacular turn, and the queen clapped her hands dutifully. It seems you have thought of everything. Of course I will find you six brave knights. More, if you wish. I would travel lightly and swiftly. Six will suffice. There is still great danger in the enterprise, Haramis noted. And as you have said, if Oregastus should once again obtain a working talisman, not even Trillium Amber would prevent him from viewing and listening to all of us. With a talisman, he could locate you easily, Katie. 
I do not know if he could slay you while you wear the amber, but you would ill serve our cause, embedded in a block of blue ice like poor Iriani. Cadia grinned at the Archimage. It is your job to see that does not happen. Keep me under surveillance as best you can, and warn me of danger if you are able to. I will find the Starmen's nest and smoke them out like night carolers from a honey tree. You will act only according to our agreed plan, the Archimage admonished. You must not attack Oragastus or the Star Guild on your own. Cadia sketched a mocking bow. Of course not, white lady. Forgive my abruptness, Haramis apologized. But for the love of God, Katie, promise me to eschew any rash action. You must take great care, Anagel added. I feel guilty. My own task is so much easier and safer than yours. Dearest Katie, I would accompany you myself, together with all my knights of the oath company, if I were bearing but a single babe and not triplets. Triplets? Both Cadia and the Archimage were astounded. Emu has only lately been certain of it, the queen said, referring to the little old Nisimu woman who had been midwife to their own unfortunate mother, Queen Calantha, and later the nurse and trusted friend to the sisters. Can this pregnancy be another omen? Haramis wondered. Might these also be children of high and awful destiny as we three were? Anagel placed a reassuring hand on that of the Archimage. More likely, it is an entirely natural thing. At any rate, Emu says that all of my unborn babes are boys, so the petals of the living trillium need fear no usurpers. Idiot, laughed Cadia, and turned in her chair to embrace and kiss Anagel. May the flower bless you and your new sons. Antar must be so proud. He is, said the queen, and so are my two eldest children. Only Tolliver seems dismayed by the prospect. Twelve is such a difficult age, when a boy is on the brink of manhood and torn by unfamiliar emotions. Poor Tolo has always been plagued by self-doubt and envy of his older brother and sister, and he seems now to resent the impending birth of the babes. But when he sees them, I am sure he will love them dearly. Haramis and Katie exchanged glances over their sister's head. Young Prince Tolliver was a secretive and jealous boy who had been a thoroughgoing brat not too many years earlier. He bitterly resented being subordinate to Crown Prince Nicolon, who at fifteen was not only taller and better looking, but also considerably more popular with the courtiers and common people. Princess Janiel, a year younger than Nicky and clever as a she fidoc had never been able to resist teasing her little brother, whom she thought deficient in character. Tolo loathed her heartily in return. Over the years, Cadia had made a special effort to be kind to the unhappy younger prince, but she feared he might think she was only taking pity on him. Tolliver seemed to have no real affection for either of his illustrious aunts, and had been barely civil when presented to them tonight before dinner. Cadia now studied the lad, who sat with the other royal and noble youth at one of the tables not far from the triplet sisters. Crown Prince Nicolon and Princess Janiel were laughing and throwing coins with the others as the acrobats retired, but Tolliver only sat with his elbows on the table, an inscrutable expression on his face. The boy's Meyer name was Hiddenheart, and Cadia thought that it suited him only too well. Tolo needs to be given useful work to do, she said. Annie, have you ever considered cutting him free of your apron strings, letting him leave the court for a time so he would not constantly compare himself to Nicky or feel belittled by Jan? He was always my baby, Anagel confessed, and since he was restored to me four years ago, I have kept him close to me, hoping that my love would suffice to boost his fragile self-esteem. But perhaps you are right. The newborn sons will take all of my attention for some time, and Tolo might possibly feel worse than ever. Let the lad accompany me, Cadia said impulsively, perhaps not as far as Sabrania, but at least during the first part of my mission. Jagan and I will keep him so busy, he'll have no time to sulk or feel sorry for himself. He is so young, Anagel said, looking doubtful, and his body is not strong. Cadia's expression was sardonic. 
He survived being snatched by pirates and held captive by Oregastus. Even though he is a bit lacking in stature, he is robust enough. Do not overprotect the boy, Annie. We may not deny children the right to encounter and overcome great obstacles. Such can turn even a shy or petulant soul heroic. As I myself know full well, the queen admitted, smiling. What do you think, Hera? The idea has merit, said the Archimage, provided that the lad is carefully supervised. Is not the retired stable master Ralibon his close friend? He is a responsible person, if not overly endowed with brains. Perhaps he could accompany Tolo. Let us put it to the boy himself, Cadia suggested. I would not take him were he unwilling. Very well. Queen Anagel gave in with reluctance. But if he accepts, you must promise to send him home before you venture beyond the peninsula. He and Ralibon can catch a fast engine cutter to Labernock from Mudavari, Cadia said, and with fair winds reach Deraguilla not too long after the arrival of the royal entourage. What say we speak to the boy, right now? We may as well. The queen beckoned to a page, telling him to summon Prince Tolliver to the high table. Six. Tolo's mouth tightened as the message was given to him. Now what trouble have you got yourself into? Princess Janiel inquired. Have you filled too many wagons with boxes of your precious books? Perhaps, Crown Prince Nicolon suggested, he decided to take so many that there was no room for his boots or underwear. That set the entire table of young people to laughing. Tolo flushed and lowered his head to hide his anger as he accompanied the page to the high table and bowed deeply. How may I serve you, great queen and mother? he inquired. All expression had now been banished from his features. He was a thin lad with fair hair and skin that was very pale, as though he spent too much time sequestered indoors. Your Aunt Cadia has a proposition to put to you, Anagel said. The Lady of the Eyes explained in some detail, not minimizing the hardships of the expedition, for they would travel downstream when the great Mutar was in flood, and the seas on his journey home from Var would doubtless be racked by storms. To Anagel's surprise, Prince Tolliver's listlessness dropped away like the husk of an emergent gnass beetle. His eyes shone with excitement, and he exclaimed, Oh, yes, Aunt Katie, take me and Ralevan with you. I promise to obey you in everything and never complain or shirk my duties or vex you. Then it is settled, the Lady of the Eyes said, clapping the boy on the shoulder. I only wish you would let me help in your quest against the Starmen, Tolliver said stoutly. The three women laughed. You are brave, but still too young, said the Archimage. The world must be saved from Orgastus, the lad said in a low voice. I have personal knowledge of his evil and treacherous ways. If necessary, I would give my life to destroy him. It will suffice if you serve your aunt faithfully, said the queen. Leave graver matters to those older and wiser. Yes, mother. The prince's demeanor could not have been more respectful and docile. He bowed and took his leave from the great hall, saying he was eager to tell the great news to Ralibon. Poor Tolo. Anagel's concerned gaze followed her son. He was so deeply affected by his time of captivity with Oregastus. He still feels guilty because he believed the sorcerer's lies about becoming his heir and his apprentice in enchantment. He was too immature then to understand the enormity of his actions, the Archimage said kindly. But the queen shook her head. He was eight years old and capable of knowing evil. Again and again he has besought Antar and me to forgive him for repudiating us, and we have tried with all our hearts to reassure him. But his guilt remains unassuaged. Katie, be kind to him. Try to ease his troubled spirit. I will do what I can, said the Lady of the Eyes, but I suspect Tolo's healing will come only with time and with some atoning action he himself must perform. The times are perilous, Aramis said with a sigh. 
There will be dangers and challenges and opportunities for heroism sufficient for all of us, even the young prince. Pray that we will measure up to them, sisters. Pray with all your hearts and souls, for I cannot help but feel that some fresh disaster will confront us very soon. Long after the midnight hour, he dared to unlock his iron strongbox, which he had refused to let the servants take away until the very moment of the caravan's departure. He took out the smaller cloth bag, unwrapped the three-headed monster, and held it in trembling hands. The silvery coronet shone in the light of the guttering candle on the bedside stand, shadows making the awful faces carved upon it seem almost alive. Did he dare? Was there a chance of success if he did? The unexpected great opportunity had come almost like a miracle, but it would not last long. He placed the coronet upon his head, took a deep breath, and strove to speak without faltering. Three-headed monster, he whispered, you belong to me. Answer me true. If I obtain the dead three-lobed burning eye from my Aunt Cadia and place it in the star box, Will it bond to me? For a moment, nothing happened. Then a mysterious voice within his own head replied, Yes, if you press the colored gems within the box in consecutive order, the eye will cleave to you alone, slaying any other person who presumes to touch it without your permission. Will the eye obey my commands? It will, if the commands are pertinent. Tolliver nearly shouted with elation, Can... Can you make me invisible so that I may enter my aunt's room without her seeing me? The question is impertinent. The prince nearly burst into tears of frustration. Not again. Not now. Make me invisible. I command you. The request is impertinent. The talisman would sometimes obey his commands, especially when he asked it simple questions or bade it give him sight of some person or place far distant. But more often it spoke that maddening phrase of refusal. His attempts at sorcery, undertaken either in the hut out in the mire or in his other hiding place in the Derragwilla ruins, had always been timid and hesitant, and not often successful. Tolliver had good reason to be afraid of his talisman. Sometimes, for reasons unknown, the power would turn upon the one who wielded it. This had happened to Oregastus while Tolliver was his hostage. The sorcerer had not been seriously hurt. But even though there was danger, Tolliver could not let this fortuitous opportunity pass by. I will not give way to faint-heartedness, the prince said to himself. After all, the monster did make me invisible once before when I first obtained it. He squeezed his eyes shut, breathed slowly in and out until he felt calmer, and then spoke to the talisman again this time choosing his words with care. Instruct me how I may become invisible. Visualize the deed to be accomplished and then command it. Could it be that simple? Was the talisman's operation triggered by his thoughts then, rather than by spoken words? Was that the great secret to successful wizardry? It was a notion that the boy had never considered before. Had he perhaps done the visualization inadvertently earlier on when issuing the successful magical commands? Let it be. Please let it be. With his eyes still closed, Tolliver conjured a picture of himself within his imagination, sitting on the bed in his room, wearing the coronet. Keeping the vision clear, he caused his body to fade away like dissipating smoke. He did not speak until the imaginary bedroom was empty. Talisman, he intoned, now render me invisible. He waited for a few heartbeats, then opened his eyes. Slowly, he lifted his hand in front of his face. He saw nothing but the room and its furniture. There was a small mirror mounted on the wall near the washstand, and he rushed to it, no face returned his gaze into the glass. The talisman had obeyed him. He sat down on a stool and pulled off his boots, which immediately became visible once they dropped from his hands, and ran on tiptoe to the door. 
There he paused as a thought struck him, inspired by the reappearing boots. Would the burning eye seem to vanish when he picked it up? If it did not, and if Aunt Katie awoke and saw it wafting away from her, borne by a magical force, she might lash out with her dagger. Invisible or not, if that happened, he might be wounded, or even killed. He experimented, lifting the silver pitcher from its basin on the washstand, and uttered a groan of disappointment. Horrors! The thing did remain quite visible, seeming to float in midair. But then he collected himself, once more closed his eyes, and imagined that the pitcher disappeared. Without speaking aloud this time, he formulated a thought command. Talisman, render the pitcher invisible. He opened his eyes. His fingers still grasped a smooth metal handle, and his arm muscles were aware of a weight being held, but he saw nothing. Carefully, he put the invisible pitcher back into its basin. He heard a faint clink, withdrew his hand momentarily, then poked the unseen vessel. It was there, all right. He found himself smothering a delighted laugh. He was getting the hang of it. Not even speech was truly needed. The thought was what counted in reeking magic. Is that true? he asked the talisman, and the voice within him said, Yes. Serious again, he caused the pitcher to reappear. Then he slipped out into the corridor and headed for his Aunt Katie's room. She had kept it, as always, at her side in bed. But when she awoke the next morning, the three-lobed burning eye was gone, leaving only its empty scabbard. Jagan swore to her that no one had entered, for he had slept just outside her door. The citadel servants and guards had noticed nothing unusual. Nevertheless, the burning eye had undeniably been stolen. What was worse, Haramis's three-winged circle refused to show the whereabouts of the magical broken sword, nor would it say who was the thief. This can only mean, the white lady said to her two badly shaken sisters, that Katie's talisman is now bonded to another and empowered. There is no use attempting a physical search of Rwanda Citadel. It is too vast, with countless potential hiding places. Besides, the thief is no doubt long gone with his booty. A search would not only be futile, it would also trumpet the fact of the second talisman's theft and dishearten the people. Only we three and Jagan must know of this. Now we are surely lost, the queen said, her voice heavy with despair. All this time, one of my own courtiers has had both the star box and my purloined coronet, and now he owns the burning eye as well. The wretch is probably already on his way to a rendezvous with Oregastus. The situation is hopeless. Don't talk like a fool, Annie, snapped Cadia. We will carry on, as we did once before when the sorcerer himself owned two talismans. Now that was a time seeming to be truly without hope, and yet we prevailed. If the Triune wills, we shall do so this time also. On the following day, the three sisters said their farewells and quit Ruenda Citadel. The Archimage Haramis used her magic to transport herself instantly to her tower on Mount Brom. There, she began preparing proposals for the defensive conference in Derguilla, as well as devising instructions for those folk who were to be entrusted with the blockade of the viaduct. After that, she intended to search her own archives and those of the Blue Lady, in hopes of discovering a way either to control the invisible portals or to destroy them. She was not optimistic of swift success. Cadia, Prince Tolliver, Ralavan, and six of the Queen's valorous old companions set off on the first leg of their journey to Far Sabrania. The prince was allowed to bring along a locked iron box of modest size, which he said contained certain of his most valued books. Lightweight boats drawn by Rimericks would carry them through Lake Womb. After bypassing Tass Falls, they were to travel down the Great Mutar through the vast Tassaleo Forest to the Wavilo town of Let, where they would take passage on an aboriginal trade boat bound for the kingdom of Var and the Southern Sea. The caravan with Queen Anagil, King Antar, and all of their court began the long journey northward to Labernock, which was expected to take at least thirty days. The wet time was now well and truly begun, 
and the unrelenting rain poured down upon the long train of coaches, carts, riders, and foot travelers like a cataract from heaven. In spite of the inclement weather, the advance of the slowly moving royal entourage through the swamp was marked by many a furtive eye. 7. By the time the traveling court was ten days out of the citadel, Anagel was bored to death riding in her lumbering great carriage with Emu and the four ladies-in-waiting. The new Queen's Mireway, opened only the previous year, was living up to its reputation as a great marvel of the world. It was as sturdy as any dryland thoroughfare, even in the exceptionally heavy rains that plagued the trip this year and Anagel saw no reason why she should not go riding up and down the procession visiting and sightseeing, as the king and the royal children and the male members of the nobility did. The women were shocked at her daring and tried to dissuade her, but the queen swept their objections aside. After all, it was her Meyerway. For nearly six years she had supervised its construction, eking out funds from a shaky budget, coping with rebellious Glismac road gangs and other aboriginal problems, and bolstering the confidence of engineers who insisted that certain sections of the thoroughfare could never be built. Anagel lowered the coach window and called to a page riding hard by. Summon the royal Fronial master. She smiled at the perturbed noble ladies around her. I refuse to travel shut up in a stuffy coach like an invalid, simply because I am with child. It will not harm my unborn babies if I take to the saddle in the honest Druendian rain. But such things are not done by pregnant queens, exclaimed Lady Bellanil. She was of an ancient Labernaki family, and only too eager to voice disapproval of the more easy-going Ruendian customs. Surprisingly, the old Nisimu nurse Emu piped up in support of Bellanil. Your Myrway is not Deragrilla High Street, my queen. It traverses some of the most dangerous country in the peninsula, particularly in this section, and there is a scent of Skritex born in the air. I beg you to stay in the carriage. Nonsense, said Anagel. I smell only muck and wet leaves and the spore of harmless terennials, and someone's oversweet perfume which is giving me a headache. She called out the carriage window to the middle-aged peer she had caused to be summoned. Lord Carajil, pray bring me a mount at once, and have my old companions attend me. I will ride for the rest of the day. This is very unwise, Emu said grumpily. One shouldn't take chances when spawn are about. The Fronial master was equally dismayed at Anagel's decision. The oddling nurse is right about the Skritek, my queen, for our scouts have come upon fresh sign. It is unusual for the horrid offspring of the drowners to range this far east, but— Obey me, said the queen, her voice low and pleasant, but her intent unshaken. If my oath's companions cannot protect me from Skritek's spawn, then it is time they turned in their swords and took up fancy needlework. I shall first visit with my royal husband— who is in the advance party? Stubborn, 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 said Emu to Anagil, using the over-familiar manner of venerable retainers. It is indecent for a gravid royal woman to go off galloping amongst a cavalcade of soldiers and teamsters, even if there were no danger from spawn. Nevertheless, Anagil said blithely, I am going. Emu besought the noble women. Will not one of you ride with the queen? But the ladies only made excuses and continued to remonstrate. Finally, Emu said, in besetment, Then I will go myself. Anaja looked upon the Nisimu nurse with some doubt. You may certainly ride pillion with me if you insist, dear friend, but I dare say it will be most uncomfortable for a small person such as yourself, jouncing along at my back. Lord Carajil suddenly brightened. I have an idea that may serve all purposes, he declared, and rode off. He returned anon with two grooms, one leading a white fronio comparisoned royally for the queen, and the other bringing the she-beast's gentle, half-grown colt, fitted out with an improvised saddle and bridle for Emu. Happily, Anagel put on boots and a cloak, accompanied by twenty knights of her old companions, and with Emu following resignedly on the long-legged colt, the queen rode forward along the line of march until she reached the vanguard. There she found King Antar and his commander-in-chief, General Gorkane, 
dismounted at one of the new bridges that spanned a swollen tributary of the River Verkar. They were conferring with two aboriginal scouts clad in the livery of the two thrones. Lord Marshal Lacanillo and numbers of other noble officers sat their steeds close by, waiting upon the royal pleasure. They wore only light helmets and cuirasses beneath their raincoats, as did the oathed companions, the king and the general. A troop of well-equipped men-at-arms and a single knight in full battle armor had gone down to the river bank, where they prepared to board a large raft manned by two human boatmen and a Nisimu guide. King Antar greeted his wife and the other comers courteously, then showed Anagil the map he and Gorkane and the scouts had been studying. One of those infernal viaducts Haramis warned us about lies some six leagues downstream from here, Antar told her. Soldiers under Sir Olavik's command have volunteered to guard it while the main body of our train passes by. They will travel on that raft. But what can our brave men do, the queen asked in a low voice, if villains should pop through the magical doorway while they are on watch? Soldiers cannot fight magic, and surely there will be no time to barricade the viaduct effectively. No, my queen, General Gorkane admitted. In truth, all that Sir Olavik and his force can hope for is to divert any invaders for a brief period, selling their lives dearly, while their oddling comrade bespeaks us fair warning. They have brave hearts, Anagel murmured. There is small chance of an attack by star men so soon, Antar reassured her. Nor is Oregastus likely to assail a huge, well-armed column such as ours. We are merely taking due precaution. Within two ten nights said one of the little Nisimu scouts, our folk dwelling in this part of the mazy mire will have secured that viaduct, as the white lady and the lady of the eyes have commanded. We will heap a tall mound of stone and soil over the site and set a guard. It will be very hard for star men to emerge unnoticed from a viaduct after this is done, said the other scout. They will have to resort to powerful magic to dig their way out. This we will surely detect, and then sound the alarm in the speech without words. Anagel looked again at the map. It seems there are no more viaducts near to the road until we reach the mountains. We can be thankful for that. A ragged cheer now arose from the oathed companions as the raft with Sir Olavik and his men pushed off from the shore. May the flower bless you, the queen called, sketching the sign of the trillium in the air beyond the bridge railing, and bring you back safely to our company. Those on the raft responded with spirited cries of their own, brandishing their arms. Then the raft rounded a bend and was lost to sight behind a dense stand of trees. The advanced riders resumed their slow progress through the rain, with Anagel and Antar riding side by side amidst the troop of knights, and Emu trailing behind the queen. Coming after them at a fair distance was a parade over two leagues in length, voluminal drawn wagons loaded with baggage of the court, more carts carrying food and supplies, fine coaches and carriages bearing the nobility and civil servants, royal officers and knights on Fronio back, and nearly a thousand other retainers, both mounted and afoot. Double files of soldiery plodded along on either side of the main column, and the sound of their singing came softly through the swamp to the ears of those riding ahead. The queen was well content now, making proud inspection of her mire way. What had been from time immemorial an indistinct and hazardous track, only negotiable in the dry time, and then only by those possessing local knowledge or the secret maps of the master traders, was now a handsome paved road. Its elevated bed, formed of alternate layers of crushed rock and massive logs from the Tassaleo forest, stood three ells or more above the swamp and was surfaced with cobblestones. Wooden bridges had replaced the old fords of streams and rivers, save for the crossing of the broad Verkar at the edge of the Dilex country, where there was a ferry. Hostels with guard posts, sighted a day's journey apart, provided secure places where smaller parties of travelers or merchant caravans might rest, but the huge royal train, perforce, camped on the road itself, with only the royalty and elderly or infirm nobles taking shelter beneath hostel roofs. The middle section of the mireway that the entourage now traversed was more narrow than the rest since it had been so difficult to build. Twisting nearly a hundred leagues between Bonar Castle and the Dilek city of Verk, 
This part of the road crossed a wilderness devoid of human habitation. Soaring trees and dense tangles of thorn fern, vines, and nearly impenetrable vegetation hemmed in the mireway and even overhung it in many stretches, so that it sometimes seemed to Queen Anagel that they rode through a green tunnel, curtained by misty rain. The advance party made a halt at midday, eating cold food and resting, while a welcome sun broke briefly through the clouds, causing the roadway to steam. But by the time the riders remounted, storm clouds had returned, together with a rising wind. Nevertheless, Anagel found herself dozing in the saddle as the patient Fronials moved slowly onward, their antlered heads bobbing, the tendons in their legs clicking, and their splayed hooves clip-clopping on the mossy stones. Overhead, the leaden sky became more and more oppressive, although the heavy rain held off. The queen was jolted into wakefulness when occasional whiffs of stomach-turning stench began to contaminate the wind. No one was much surprised when General Gorkane came riding back through the ranks of knights and saluted the king and queen before delivering grim news. A scout reports freshly scoured raffin bones on the mireway ahead, and the cobbles show sign of Skritek spawn. We will halt here in order to close up the gap between our advance group and the main body of the caravan. The Lord Marshal and the old companions will provide your majesties with close escort, and foot soldiery will come forward to accompany us until the danger is past. I have also sent a messenger to summon Crown Prince Nicolon and Princess Janille. It is no longer safe for them to range up and down the procession casually with their young friends. Very well, said Antar. You may carry on. The general touched his helm visor in salute and spun his fronio about, but before he could ride away there were shouts from the knights ahead. Spawn! Spawn on the road! Gorkane swore and spurred his mount forward, drawing his two-handed sword. Marshal Lacanilo and a dozen oathed companions closed in around the king, the queen, and Emu, lances couched, while others of the elite group followed the general. An excruciating foul odor spread through the air. For a time everyone was quiet, and the only sounds were distant hoofbeats, the creak of harness, and the hiss and patter of the rain. Then Emu whispered, See there! She pointed to a dark slough at the right of the mire way, half screened by thornless fodder fern, twice the height of a man. Rising from the scummy water were dozens of glistening white shapes, some nearly the size of a human body, others much smaller. They resembled odious fat worms or grubs, lacking obvious heads, but having stubby limbs equipped with razor like claws. Their foreparts lifted as they reached the narrow verge beside the roadbed, revealing wide-open mouths with green teeth that dripped venom. The blind monsters swayed from side to side, questing for prey, which they tracked with their keen hearing. For an instant the riders were frozen with horror. Then one young knight exclaimed, Zoto's stones! What detestable things! Like giant corpse maggots!' At the sound of his voice, the Skritek spawn began humping and wriggling up the embankment toward the road. King Antar's longsword sang as it left its scabbard. Follow me, oathed companions. He set his fronial skidding down the steep slope, the Lord Marshal and the knights following closely after, and with a single sweeping stroke, he smote one of the leading spawn in two. It disintegrated, splashing vile jelly-like eye coral over the king. The companions spitted other bloodthirsty Skritek young on their lances, or put them to the sword, crying out in anger and disgust as they were also drenched by evil-smelling fluids from the spawn bodies. Lacanilo's fronial fell to the muddy ground, squealing in agony, its foreleg held fast in poisoned jaws. But the companions raced to the Lord Marshal's rescue, hauling him to safety, slaying the tenaciously clinging spawn, and granting merciful death to the doomed antelopine steed. It was not long before all of the larvae were either killed or fled, leaving Antar and the knights beslimed from helm to heel. Victorious cries from the road ahead signaled that the other pod of immature Skritek had also been routed by Gorkane and his men. Well done, cried Queen Anagel warmly. But the king looked down upon his filthied person with a grimace. Only the triune knows how we shall remove this mess from ourselves, unless we take a headlong leap into the swamp and exchange mud for spawn slime. 
As if in answer, thunder rumbled overhead, and a deluge of rain pelted down. Antar removed his helm, tilted his head so water bathed his face, and laughed. Thank you, gracious lords of the air. By the time the main column catches up with us, we may almost be fit for civilized society again. Perhaps you should return to your carriage, my queen, Lord Marshal Lacanillo suggested to Anagel. He was a tall man of sparse flesh, whose manner was grave and dignified in spite of his befouled appearance. He had been appointed to his office following the heroic death of Lord Marshal Awanan in the Battle of Derogwilla. The queen shook her head, dismissing the suggestion that she should retire. Heavens, no, Lacko. With the smell of Skritek now stronger than ever, my ladies will wrap their faces in perfume-soaked veils. Frankly, my nose is less offended by the smell of the monsters. Princess Janiel and Crown Prince Nicolon came cantering up with a group of noble attendants and gave noisy greeting to their parents and the old companions. Phew! cried the princess, pinching her nose. The spawn reek is much worse up here. Oh! She screamed at the sight of the slaughtered creatures. They are quite dead, my lady, the Lord Marshal said. There is nothing to fear. Prince Nicolon had drawn his sword, and his eyes were alight as he surveyed the noisome remains. Are you certain, Lacko? Perhaps we'd better reconnoiter the swamp. I'm ready. At fifteen, he had nearly attained a man's stature and wore a helm and breastplate and military cape. Ready, 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 Emu exclaimed crossly. Your royal parents and the old companions must now feel very relieved that such a great champion has arrived. Oh, Emu, groaned the prince. The knights were laughing, but with good humor, for they were all very fond of the impetuous Nicky. There is no need for us to leave the road, Antar said. Indeed, it would be foolhardy for us to do so, since the water continues to rise. Well, I'm sorry I missed the fight. I never saw Skritek spawn before. The boy sheathed his sword and began questioning the knights about the attack, and the Lord Marshal sent off for another mount. Janiel rode closer to her parents and the little old nurse, expressing relief when she was told that the only casualty was a single fronio. What horrible things the spawn are! Is it true that they kill their dams at birth? More often than not, Imu said, Adult Skritek have the use of reason, more or less, but the young are ravening and mindless. If the mother is lucky, she may leap to safety as each larval offspring drops from her womb, and the spawn will feed upon meat she has provided. But it is more common for the offspring to awaken before birth and gnaw their way from confinement through the mother's body wall. Ugh, said Janiel. Her face had gone white within the hood of her rain cape and she would gladly have departed the nauseating scene, were it not that Queen Anagel seemed unfazed. No wonder Skritek know nothing of love or gentleness. And yet, Prince Nicolon interposed with grisly relish, having rejoined his parents and sister, the Skritek are the oldest race in the world, and sages say all folk are descended from them, even you, Emu. I thought humankind was the most ancient race, the princess said. We did not originate in this world, said the queen. Your Aunt Haramis the Archimage learned that human beings came here from the outer firmament, uncounted eons in the past. The vanished ones were our ancestors. What is even more amazing, said King Antar very quietly, is that the vanished ones used the blood of both Skritek and humanity to fashion a folk race that might withstand the conquering ice. But why? The princess, unlike her older brother, had never heard the story, nor had most other people, for the Archimage had decided that it must be kept secret, except among the royal family and its most trusted confidants. The ancient humans felt guilty abandoning the world their warring had largely destroyed, Antar said. You see, Jan, the vanished ones believed that the ice they had unwittingly created twelve times ten hundreds ago would devour all the world's land, save for the continental margins and some islands. They thought the Skritek would surely die, leaving the world devoid of rational beings. But that did not happen. The ice failed to conquer after all, and both the Skritek and the new race of hardy folk lived on together. 
So did certain stubborn humans who had remained behind when the rest vanished into the outer firmament. Those aborigines that we call Visby, said the queen, the high mountain dwellers who aided your Aunt Haramis in obtaining her talisman, and who are now her special folk, are the result of that long-ago experiment. They are the true firstborn, combining the Skritek and human lineage. Of course, they give birth in human fashion, as other high races of folk do. But the Visby are so beautiful, Jan said, while the other races of folk are... She broke off, realizing how improper it was to speak thus before the old Nisimu nurse. Oh, Emu, I beg pardon. I did not mean to insult you. I take no offense, sweeting. Emu was calm. To Nisimu and Wizgu, the Vizpi appear unattractive. You call them beautiful merely because they most resemble yourselves. But how, then, did the other races of folk come about? Janil inquired. Some were engendered through new infusions of Skritek blood, said the queen in a somber tone. The princess thought over the hard implications of this, and she and her brother were silent for some time. Then Emu added, Over the ages, fresh human blood also contributed to the racial mixing. In ancient times, humans often mated with folk. It is just within the last six hundreds that your people began to call mine oddlings, insisting that we are inferior beings. In other human kingdoms, the disdain for us persists. Only in Labor Ruenda are the folk acknowledged to have souls, and certain of us are granted privileges of citizenship. I will see that the nation of Raktum does likewise, Princess Janiel stated offhandedly, when I marry Leda Vardis and become its queen. Oh, Jan, Anagil exclaimed angrily, you know I have forbidden you to speak of that matter before your royal father. What's this? Antar glared at his daughter. Don't tell me she still fancies that goblin kinglet. Leda Vardis of Raktum is a brave man, Janiel said, and no more a goblin than Nicky is. Even though his body is not handsome, he is noble of heart. So you say. The furious king spoke to the princess through clenched teeth, and his blond beard bristled. To my mind, the Raktumians are naught but half-reformed pirates, and no daughter of mine will wed their malformed king. How can you forget that Raktum allied with Tuzuman and the despicable Oragastus to make war upon us? Lido fought and surrendered with honor, Janiel retorted, and he has ever since then commanded his people to change their old lawless ways and behave in a civilized manner. Civilized? The king's laugh was contemptuous. Nothing has changed in the pirate kingdom, except now the Raktumian corsairs commit their crimes on the sly, whereas before they were bold as the vipers of Viborn. You shall never marry Lita Vardis. The princess burst into tears. You care nothing for my happiness, father. The real reason why you reject Lido is your vain hope that I will marry King Yondramil of Zenora, that scheming braggart. But you will never force me to accept him. Let him marry one of Queen Jiri's daughters. Jan, my dearest, Queen Anagil hastened to intervene. I beseech you to forbear. This is not the place for such discussion. Let us wait until we reach the next hostel and... Her words were drowned out by a colossal thunderbolt. Simultaneously, the mireway shook as with an earthquake, and a flash of light blinded all beholders. The rain now fell prodigiously. Shouts arose from the shocked knights, who had withdrawn some distance in order to give the royal family privacy. The Phronial shied in terror from the unexpected noise, and the king forgot his anger as he strove to prevent his daughter's crazed steed from slipping off the road into the swirling floodwaters. Prince Nicolon was similarly occupied with the distraught mount of his mother. Anagil's ramping white beast pawed the savage downpour with its split hooves and tossed its antlered head wildly. The queen regained control only with difficulty after Nicky dismounted and clung to a bridle. Several ells away, the young Phronial Emu Road lay on its belly near the road's left-hand edge, shaking with terror, while its rider urged it vainly to rise. But then Princess Janiel's animal escaped Antar's grasp and nearly trampled the colt and emu as it galloped back down the road toward the main column. Oath oh, companions, cried the queen, after the princess, and to her son, save emu, 
Look, the verge of the mireway near her is crumbling. Prince Nikolon leapt back onto his mount and went pounding down the rain-lashed road. Leaning from the saddle, he swept up the little Nisimu woman just as the Fronio colt tumbled down the embankment and vanished without a sound into churning muddy water. Bring Imu to me, Nikki, the queen shouted. Then aid your father and sister. Anajo could not understand why the old companions had not come to the rescue. Her sight of the knights on the road ahead was obscured by the pounding rain and the growing darkness, but she heard their shouts amidst continuing rumbles of thunder and a strange rushing sound. When Emu was safe on the pillion behind her, and the prince gone to Antar, who had halted Janiel's runaway mount some distance away, the queen put spur to her froniel in order to fetch the companions. But the white beast skidded to an abrupt halt after taking only a few bounds. Great God! The road! Anagel screamed, looking down from the saddle. Between the queen and her knights stretched a steep break in the mireway over five ells wide. It appeared that lightning had blasted the road asunder. High water, formerly impounded on one side of the causeway, was now pouring through, laden with downed trees and other floating debris. Before Anagel could recover from her astonishment, another brilliant flash and a shattering clap of thunder rocked the mazy mire, causing her mount to stagger. Hold tight, Emu! she cried, reining the animal's head far to the right so that it whirled in tight circles, squealing. But it did not panic this time, and she was able to calm it at last, urging it back toward the king and the children. Then the beast again stopped abruptly. Anagel gasped as she saw a second gap in the mireway, narrower than the first but growing wider every second as swift waters chewed away at the road's foundation. The queen and Emu were marooned on a small island of cobblestone pavement in the midst of a raging flood. Annie, howled the king, and Nicolon and Janiel cried, Mother! Thunder seemed to give mocking answer. The old companions stood helpless on their side of the severed road, but several carts and numbers of men-at-arms had finally reached the king. One quick-thinking fellow dashed up to Antar with a coil of rope, and both father and son dismounted and helped to fling it across the water. Anagel and Emu also slid from the saddle, crouching at the lip of the shrinking section of Mireway. Twice the rope failed to reach them, but on the third throw Emu took hold of it, screeching in triumph and nearly falling into the rising flood. Come, the nurse cried to the queen, not it about your waist. Anagel tried, but at that moment the waters undermined the roadbed beneath and the cobbles under her feet shifted and separated. She fell into a shallow, water-filled hole, her arms and legs entangled in her long rain cape. Dropping the rope, Emu scrambled to Anagel and helped to free her. Queen and nurse crawled over the treacherous, dissolving surface, while the king recoiled the rope and flung it again and again across the widening breach. But the line kept falling short, and soon the island of roadway would be entirely washed away. Your trillium, Amber! Emu screamed at the queen above the roar of the storm. Did it save us? They were clinging to each other. Anagel took hold of her magical amulet with one hand, holding Emu tightly with the other. Behind them, the white froniel scrabbled and shrieked, consumed with terror. The ground melted under it, and it was swept away into the torrent. A third monstrous explosion sounded at the same time that lightning struck. Stones, broken timber, clots of muddy earth and roiling mist filled the air, together with shouts from the frustrated rescuers. Queen Anagel felt herself falling, felt Emu torn away from her grasp, felt strangely painless blows from the wind-flung branches whirling all around her, felt her slow slide into dark rushing water that filled her mouth and nose, choking off her prayer to the black trillium. Then she felt nothing. Eight. The viaduct on Mount Brom was situated in the cavern of black ice. Long ages ago, it had given the vanished ones access to their mysterious storage place deep in the Ohogan Mountains. And now, as Haramis had anticipated, the viaduct provided the sorcerer Oragastus with a means of entry to her tower. Through her magical three-winged circle, she watched him emerge out of nowhere through a dark disk without thickness that vanished with a loud bell chime as soon as he was beyond it. 
He wore his silver and black Starmaster regalia, including the gauntlets and the awesome starburst headpiece that hid the upper part of his face. He stood quietly in the very middle of the cavern's obsidian-tiled floor, looking at the vault of quartz-veined granite soaring overhead, and at the hundreds of alcoves, compartments, and roomlets on every side. The peculiar illumination of the place, shining from unseen sources, caused the icy extrusions in the rock crevices to gleam like polished onyx. The sorcerer seemed bemused as he walked slowly toward the exit, perhaps remembering the time that the cavern of black ice and its wondrous contents had belonged to him. The glassy dark doors to the chambers and niches were all open. A few sophisticated trinkets and trifles remained, useless to his purposes. The compartments that had contained ancient weapons or other devices intended to intimidate or harm were empty. So you destroyed them, did you? He addressed thin air, knowing she viewed him through her talisman. And yet you kept the most deadly instrument of all. Did it never occur to you that the other two parts of the scepter of power would be denied their greatest, most awful usage if there were no three-winged circle? Taramis said nothing. She had thought of it, had even contemplated throwing the circle into one of the active volcanoes in the flame-girt isles when it became obvious that the other two talismans had passed into the hands of a person unknown. But that small silvery wand had been purchased at such a great cost to herself, and the original purpose of the threefold scepter, thwarted twelve thousand years ago, had never ceased to intrigue her. She could not bring herself to cast the talisman away. Orgastus reached a large wooden door encrusted with hoarfrost and addressed her once more. The set of his mouth had become ironic. Do I have your permission to enter the tower, white lady? It is mine, after all, even though you have made free with it for these sixteen years. Haramis made the door swing silently open. He would be allowed this single visit and during it she would do that which must be done. The sorcerer bowed his thanks and hurried up the rough corridor that he himself had bored through the mountain with one of the ancient devices. Memories crowded his mind. He had dwelt here on Mount Brom during most of his frustrating association with Voltric, late king of Labernock, and here he had trained his first three followers, the green, blue, and red voices. May the dark powers grant them eternal joy, had not only served him faithfully unto death, but had also helped amplify his thaumaturgical vision, as had their three less worthy successors. Now, of course, thanks to the Dark Man and Narenyi Daral, he needed no help from other minds in order to command the full magic of the star. Unfortunately, the star alone would not suffice to fulfill his ultimate design. For that, he would require the threefold scepter. Obtaining two parts of it would be comparatively easy, but the third piece belonged to Haramis, and taking it from her by force or coercion was very likely impossible. There was an alternative, and he had come here tonight to explore it. At the tunnel's end, he found himself at the lowest level of the tower's stairwell. He stood on flagstones just across from the main entry, sampling the aura of his former home. It was much different from the way he remembered it permeated with the Black Trillium's alien enchantment. Now this tower belonged to Haramis absolutely. For an instant, a brief thrust of fear touched him. Would the star grant him sufficient protection? In truth, he did not know. But he had come anyway. On either hand were storage chambers, now quite empty, and the stable where he had once kept his mounts, and the small room housing machinery for the bridge that spanned the chasm outside. He was not surprised to discover that the mechanism he had tended so carefully was now rusty and neglected. No one used his amazing bridge any more. The white lady called upon her preternatural powers for travel, and the Visby aborigines who were her servants flew wherever they wished on gigantic birds that dwelt among the nearby crags. Except for the night wind, faintly audible through the thick walls, the tower was silent. There was no hint of her presence but he knew she awaited him, and he knew where to find her. Climbing the spiral stairs, we wondered if she felt as torn by this impending meeting as he did. 
He was here on her sufferance. It would have been easy enough for her to destroy the tunnel connecting the cavern and the tower so that the viaduct became a dead end. But she had forborne. The last time the two of them had shared the tower's shelter, she had been little more than a girl, newly possessed of a talisman with powers unknown to her, foolhardy and susceptible to the appeal of a handsome older man. He should have been able to bewitch her as easily as a newborn Trevard. Instead, she had bewitched him. He reached the library, the place where they had shared their first and last kiss, and opened the door. It had been his favorite place, his sanctuary, crammed with the rarest and most valuable volumes in the world. She had not changed it much. Heavy drapes had been drawn across the tall windows on this evening of biting cold. Two high-backed armchairs, cushioned in rich red damask, were drawn up close to the comfort of the fireplace. Between them was a pedestal table with a flagon of white wine, two chunky cut-glass goblets in the Visby style, and a plate of small sweet cakes. She arose from one of the chairs, for a moment nothing but a dark silhouette against orange flames. Then she stepped forward so that light from the quaint library lamps of the vanished ones showed her clearly, and he felt his heart catch in his throat. Her black hair fell in glistening tresses to her waist. She wore a white velvet gown with silver-blue fur at the wide sleeves and hem, and a belt of soft azure inset with moonstone. Her underdress was powder-blue chalet, embroidered with tiny black trilliums at the neck, where the wand of the three-winged circle hung on its chain. Good day to you, Star Master, Haramis said. Dressed for combat, I see. What a shame. I had hoped for a brief truce while we discussed what is to come. And that was a lie, a small one but the first Haramis had ever told since becoming Archimage of the land, done deliberately in order to provoke him into the actions that must follow. He said nothing, but deliberately pulled off the silver gauntlets and dropped them on the carpeted floor. Then he removed his headpiece and black cloak, also letting them fall. Doffing his odd vestment of metal mesh with its shining black leather panels, he stood before her clad in a simple tunic of unbleached wool and trues of darker material stuffed into high boots. A pouch laden with something heavy hung from his belt. Greetings to you, Archimage of the land. His voice, unfiltered by the talisman's magic, was as mellifluous and beguiling as she remembered it to be. But his face was older than the portrait had shown, gaunt and weathered, having deep creases between the pale eyes and on either side of his mouth. Behold, I have cast away the habiliments of sorcery and herewith invite an armistice. I accept, she said, lying for the second time. And in a gesture that was clearly a challenge, she lifted the three-winged circle on its chain from around her neck and placed it on the table. A breathless silence followed. He came closer, and one of his long-fingered hands stretched out and hovered over the wand. The three tiny wings at the top of the circle unfolded, and the glow of the trillium amber within throbbed a warning. Would you really let it slay me? he asked in a playful tone. She shrugged. If you wish to take my talisman up, Star Master, I grant you permission to do so. It will not harm you, but you will find it as unresponsive as a common fork or spoon. You know it obeys only its bonded owner, and even then, sometimes capriciously. He laughed, then took the wine flagon from the table instead, filling goblets for both of them. Capriciously, indeed. Let us both pray that whoever now owns the other two talismans experiences as much trouble learning to command them as we did. So you know that Katie's eye was stolen? Yes. Was it taken by one of your agents? He smiled enigmatically. The thief is no ally of mine. Yet. She ignored the provocation, her eyes fixed upon his star. I have set aside my talisman. Can we not, at least for a little while, forswear magic and meet as man and woman? His eyelids lowered, veiling his gaze. Did he dare to face her unprotected? But he was confident that she would never be so base as to violate a truce, 
just as he was confident that her love for him had endured. He lifted the star medallion from his neck and laid it on the table next to her talisman. Then they both sat down, she rather stiffly and he in an easy sprawl, warming his boots by the fire. So you have been spying upon my sisters, Haramis said. I cannot see them individually, as you know well enough, because they are shielded by their trillium amber, but their associates have unwittingly revealed what has been going on. The theft of the burning eye is a most vexing development, and a puzzling one as well. One must ask why this mysterious burglar has made no use of the magical loot. Is he a paragon of prudence, content to keep both talismans safely hidden? Is the thief too timid to wield them, knowing that the vanished ones themselves were afraid of their terrible power? Or is our wily pilferer merely cautious? Has he been testing the magical devices in unobtrusive ways until he attains expertise and confidence in their use? I think we will find out before long, Haramis said with dark certainty. And to our woe. Perhaps, Archimede, she said lightly, we should consider an alliance against this mutual menace. Her smile was cold. I am no longer the simple child you hope to win over to your dark powers, Star Master. I know that full well, and you shall discover that I am no longer the man I was when I last contended with the petals of the living trillium and uh, went the way of the vanished ones. For an instant, ardent hope transfigured her face, but then she looked away from him, lips tightening in unrelenting resolve. I can only judge you by your actions, which tell me you are the same as ever, charming, persuasive, and completely ruthless in pursuit of your evil ambition. He threw back his head and laughed, and his brilliantly white hair reflected the fire like high clouds at sundown. His amusement was youthful, heartfelt, having nothing in it of slyness or cynicism. You know nothing of my present ambition, dear Haramis, any more than you know where I was held captive while you thought me dead. His eyes sparkled as he bent closer to her over the table. Would you care to hear the tale? She nodded, still frowning, not trusting herself to speak. He sat back then and took a deep draught of the wine. It was the great Sinashore that saved me, of course that magical device of my guild that was created as a countermeasure to the scepter of power, drawing to it any wearer of the star who is smitten with the scepter's magic. Twice it has preserved my life. The first time, with the existence of the cynosure unbeknownst to any of us, I was drawn to the inaccessible Kimelon, deep within the ice cap, and marooned there for twelve years. I knew not how I had been transported to that land of fire and ice. The Archimage Iriani made off with the Sinisher after it had done its work, and in time gave it to you. Cruel, Haramus, you intended to use it to imprison me forever in that chasm of durance that lies beneath the place of knowledge. But death would have been more merciful. I, I hoped you would amend your ways. I could not bear to destroy you, even indirectly. Her eyes were fixed upon her tightly clasped hands lying in her lap. She felt ashamed, as he knew she would. He was manipulating her feelings again, as he had done before. But this time the outcome would be different. As it happened, he went on, another person thwarted your plan. He took the cynosure from the chasm, just before you and your sisters conquered me with the scepter for the second time, and thus it was that I awoke to find myself safe abed, within one of the three moons. By the flower, Haramis cried in sudden understanding. Denby! And now I suppose he has sent you back to carry on where you left off. Oh, the perfidious wretch! What manner of archimage is he to play such games with the very balance of the world? In my opinion, the dark man is a senile lunatic, but one who nevertheless taught me much. Do you know who the Archimage of the Firmament really is? Iriani told me something of his aloof and vagarious ways. I know he is very old and cares little for events of our world. Yet he did vouchsafe to us the assistance of those Sindona called Sentinels of the Moral Dictum, defeating your army and saving the two thrones. Why he saved you? She shook her head. Are you glad that he did? 
Orogastus spoke very softly. She replied, Yes, God help me. And this was not a lie. Even now, the sorcerer continued, I know almost nothing of the man in the moon's motives, but I do know who he is. He is that same great hero of the Vanished Ones who both conquered the Guild of the Star and brought about the birth of the folk. He is Denby Varkur, a man of dusky complexion who is over 12,000 years old. When the Vanished Ones fled the conquering ice, he remained, together with a small cohort of others, hoping to undo some of the damage humankind had wrought upon the world. The Visby folk and their telepathic bird friends were created in workshops inside his moon. Haramus was shocked. The moon is hollow. He does not live upon the orb's surface as we live upon the world. All of the three moons are artifacts of ancient magic. The one called the Dark Man's Moon, where I was incarcerated, has every manner of thing necessary for civilized life inside of it including abandoned workrooms with marvelous tools and beautifully appointed apartments without a single soul dwelling within. The second orb is called the Garden Moon. Although I was not allowed to visit it, I know that it is a conservatory of plants and animals, and some of our food came from there. It is also the residence of numbers of those damned living statues who acted as my jailers and served Denby in other mysterious ways. The Sindona. Aramis murmured. She had recovered her composure and now sipped a bit of wine and tasted one of the small cakes. The third orb is called the Death Moon. I do not know why. The three moons are connected to each other and to this world by viaducts. I escaped two years ago through one of these bizarre passages. Never mind how. Oddly enough, the Archimage of the Firmament has made no attempt to recapture me since then, but of course he is mad. Why do you call him so? Because of his behavior. He holds conversations with the dead and berates himself for unspecified sins. At other times he seems unaware of his surroundings, as if in a trance. During most of my captivity he was considerate, even jovial, permitting me to roam the entire moon and study its weird treasures. But on occasion, for no reason I could fathom, he would scream vulgar imprecations and threaten to banish me to the Death Moon, saying all members of the Star Guild deserved no better than to perish under torture. These moods of deranged fury were all the more frightening because he had been the model of sweet reason immediately before. And so you escaped, she said flatly, and for two years you dwelt. Where? But Orogastus only shook his head, smiling. I know you are searching for the headquarters of my star guild, as is your sister, Cadia. But by the time you find our place of habitation, the knowledge will do you no good. The guild of the star is reborn to assist me in attaining my great objective. She regarded him with a steady and somber mien. So now we come to the crux of the matter, Star Master. Just what is your objective? Do you and your guildsmen intend to conquer the world on behalf of your dark powers? Is your barbaric imprisonment of poor Iriani a warning of the fate you would inflict upon me, if I oppose you? Instead of answering, he poured more wine into his glass and drank. Then he said, You carry my portrait, Haramus. Why? Because I am a fool, she retorted. But in spite of myself, I am bound and determined to do my solemn duty as Archimage of the Land and Petal of the Living Trillium, no matter what the personal cost may be. And this time, if my duty encompasses your destruction, I will not hesitate. She took the picture of him from an inner pocket of her gown, letting him glimpse it briefly. Then she rose from her seat with abrupt swiftness, strode to the hearth, and cast the framed ivory image into the flames. He bowed his head and when he finally spoke again, his voice was unsteady. I love you, Haramus. You must believe me. Believe me also when I say that my intentions in regard to this world of ours are neither evil nor selfishly motivated. She stood with her back to him, staring at the blackening portrait. I wish I could believe you. I learned much while I was Denby's prisoner, 
about the mortal imbalance threatening the world, about myself, about my reason for being, and about you. You think that your life work is inevitably conjoined to that of your sisters. I say that your fate is as far beyond their paltry concerns as the sun is beyond the glowworms of the mazy mire. He opened the pouch at his waist and took out a second star. Its chain blazed with jewels as he held it out to her. This is for you. She turned and beheld the medallion, and her features stiffened with dismay. Never! Together we can save the world. Dearest Aramis, you and I are wielders of transcendent magic. We are more alike than either of us ever realized. Only look in a mirror. The very eyes in our heads reveal it. Denby Varkor has the selfsame silvery eyes, and so does the woman he loved, whose dead hand aided my escape. We are of the vanished ones. Can't you understand what this must mean? It was some minutes before Haramis replied. The Blue Lady of the Sea, who is my dearest friend, was also my instructor in the high magical arts. She imparted to me all she knew, charging me to restore the lost balance of the world, that chaos brought about by you and your crimes. My sisters declared they would assist me, but I believe that the first responsibility was clearly my own. In my perplexity, still torn between my love for you and my duty, I went to the Sindona called the Teacher. She provided me with one last precious nugget of guidance. Love is permissible. Devotion is not. He smiled, once again proffering the second star in its gem-studded chain. An intriguing riddle, one that gives me a modicum of hope. But she shook her head, speaking hesitantly and low. I heard Iriani repeat the aphorism at that awful moment when the flower conquered you and the cynosure snatched you out of this world. All throughout the years that I thought you dead and damned for your wickedness, I pondered the saying, unable to discover its meaning. Only now, knowing that you live, have I been able to draw fresh insight and strength from the teacher's words, from that mysterious and terrible saying that can bring no sweet solace to the contemplator, but only the wintry satisfaction of duty fulfilled. She came to the table, took the star of Nereni Daral from his hands, dropped it onto the carpeted floor, and spurned it with her foot. Do you understand the meaning of the riddle, Star Master? He exploded from his chair and seized her with an emotion akin to ferocity. I understand only my love for you, and that you also love me. Yes, she said. I do love you. The pupils of her eyes had gone wide, and centered in each was a pinpoint of white radiance. Aramis he groaned, and the eyes looking down at her were also twin blazes of starlight. His first embrace was painful in its strength, but then his arms gentled and she felt his hands cradle her head. His face descended, and their lips met. For uncounted minutes, the only sound in the room was the crackle of the fire in the great hearth. But the kiss ended at last, and the ineffable light dwindled and was gone. The eyes of both of them saw the real world again. He gave forth a shuddering sigh. She spoke his name for the first time. Her head fell upon his breast. He pressed his cheek to her soft black hair, and they stood together motionless until Haramis finally disengaged herself and stood apart. Her face was calm, almost wistful. Love is permitted, she whispered. Devotion is not. What does it mean? His voice was harsh with alarm. It means that there can be no more than this, Oregastus. No avowed consecration of one to the other. No union within your star. And above all, no mutual bodily worship, for that is what devotion implies. Can you deny the special magic we have created together? He cried, clasping her hands. This is only the beginning, Haramus. You and I... Our antagonists, she said, pulling away again and turning away. We oppose each other, as the dead champions of the vanished ones oppose the ancient star guild. 
I am the servant of the human people and the folk, obligated to guide and assist them through my magic. You and your followers worship dark powers and do not scruple at any wrongdoing that would forward your schemes. You don't understand. All that has changed. Why won't you let me explain? I understand Iriani enduring a living death. I understand the provoking of the Skritek by your agent and the misery thereby inflicted upon harmless Nisimu folk. I understand that you have terrible weapons at your command, that your guild has used in the wanton murder of innocent Lurkomi. And I doubt not that you and your henchmen are guilty of other crimes that have yet to come to my attention. She turned about to face him. Am I wrong? Iriani will be released in good time, he said. I regret the deaths of the little mere folk. My followers are of a nation that believes they are soulless animals, and I cannot always control them. But I did ensure that no Nisimu were killed by the Drowners. Free the Blue Lady now, Haramis pleaded. Destroy the ancient weapons you have gathered. Abandon your plan to conquer the world. I cannot, he said, for it is part of my greater intention that would save it. Iriani would have thwarted me out of ignorance, as would the rulers of the nations if they were not compelled to do my bidding. As every right-thinking person would thwart you, Haramis said in a voice of thunder. The talisman was suddenly in her hand. I knew you would come here, Oragastus. I knew you would try again to win me over as you did before. Deciding what to do has torn the heart from my body and perhaps condemned my own soul to hell. But I have vowed that you shall not go forth from this tower to resume your evil work, not while it is in my power to prevent you. A sudden billow of smoke, blacker than midnight, enveloped her form. As the sorcerer fell back, stunned by the sudden change in her aspect, the darkness swirled and gathered into three great petals, becoming a looming tripartite shape reaching to the library's high ceiling. A black trillium. She came forth from the center of the flower, suspended above the floor, a woman cloaked and hooded in lucent white that somehow seemed to combine within it all the colors of the rainbow. Held high in her right hand, the three-winged circle enclosed a dark void that the sorcerer could not take his eyes from. The void expanded suddenly, as if it were a great round window opening into a night without moons or stars, hiding the glowing form of the Archimage, but her radiance still shone from within the boiling smoke. She did not speak, and yet he felt himself impelled to enter that circle as though it were some viaduct leading to eternity. No, he cried, unwilling to accept that she would really threaten him with death when he had left himself unguarded for love and trust of her. Aramis, you cannot do this. The circle widened further, obliterating all view of the library shelves, the furnishings, the great stone hearth, swallowing the very light in the room. He hung amidst shining smoke with doom only an arm's length away, magnetic and terrible, compelling him to enter into unending night. He was afraid, mortally afraid. But as the dread circle continued its advance, his prayer was not to the dark powers, but to her. Aramis, dearest Aramis, you cannot play false to our truce, to your oath as Archimage, to our love. Let me go. I know it is unjust to destroy you in this way, Oragastus. I know I have lied to you and broken faith. But by doing so, I can spare our world great pain, perhaps even prevent its destruction. Without you, your star guild will founder and disappear. There will finally be peace and balance. My dearest love, is it you yourself who contemplate this monstrous betrayal? Or is it that perfidious talisman? Has it tempted you to impose your own will upon destiny? Denby Varkor knew the peril lurking within the scepter of power. He argued with Bina and Iriani against letting you and your sisters possess the pieces of that dire instrument, even when broken apart from its threefold whole. Do you know why? It is because the talismans can own their owners. Aramis was silent, hidden. The enormous circle drew nearer until it hovered only a finger's length from his paralyzed body. Beyond was nothingness extinction. In another moment he would be gone. 
She would consign him to emptiness everlasting, thinking that by trampling her own conscience she would bring about a greater good. In the extreme of desperation, he cried out to her, Do not trust yourself, nor the talisman. Ask your flower if you should do this. Ask the black trillium if it is right that I die this way. Ask the flower if this is the way to restore the world. He was suddenly blind. The circle has swallowed me, he thought, and I am alone in the dark forever, with nothing but my own soul showing me my sins over and over again. Why would she not listen to me? Why would she not let me explain? He heard her weeping, felt the fire's warmth, smelled wine and the exhalation of ancient book bindings, paper and parchment. He opened his eyes and saw her, crumpled face down on the rug before the hearth. The circle on the chain around her neck was an empty silver hoop, but atop it the trillium amber shone like a tiny winged sun. Numb with relief, he was capable only of standing stock still, daring to breathe again, looking down at her. After a time, she drew herself upright, sitting there amidst the white folds of her archimage's cloak. How could I? she asked him, speaking more like a small child confronted with some horror than like a woman repentant. Holy flower, how could I have contemplated such dishonor, even for a moment, and all the while not ceasing to love you? The answer is in your hand, he told her greatly. She lowered her eyes to the talisman. I do not believe you but her fingers opened, and she let the three-winged circle drop, swinging from its neck chain. He said, While I was Denby's captive, I discovered things about the scepter, about the magic of the three talismans, that you will have to confront and deal with, Haramis. Let me tell you. Go away, she said in a voice roughened with misery. Her eyes brimmed. You have always been a liar and a manipulator, now I have become like you. Iriani and the teacher were mistaken. Our love is a despicable thing, and I will root it out of myself or die in the trying. She attempted to climb to her feet, but her legs were bereft of strength. He helped her up. Then, before she could protest, he kissed her lips fleetingly. We will talk again, he said, when you have meditated upon this meeting further and when other events have helped to clarify your thoughts. Go, she cried, holding the circle between them with both hands trembling, her eyes squeezed tightly shut against the fresh tears that would have poured forth. Go! He gathered up his discarded vestments and the second star, put on his own medallion, and went away. Nine. Lumomuko, Speaker of Let leader of the Wavilo folk, and devoted friend of the Lady of the Eyes, had willingly obtained passage for her and her party on a flatboat owned by his cousin that was bound down the great Mutar River. Over her protests, he had insisted upon accompanying Cadia as far as the capital of Var, which lay at the river mouth on the southern coast of the peninsula. Cadia had been tense and moody during the days they had already spent on the voyage, and now the archimage had come to her in ascending, and Lumomu had waited for over an hour outside the forward deckhouse while the two sisters conferred secretly. When the Lady of the Eyes emerged at last, the Wavilo felt his heart sick. Her body was taut with suppressed anger, and the grime on her face betrayed the tracks of dried tears. The sending from the White Lady contained evil tidings indeed, Cadia declared. I must speak at once with wicked awe. My cousin is at the tiller, Lumomu said. Come with me and watch your footing. From behind, the Wavilo chief had the appearance of a very tall, robustly built man, but his race's sizable admixture of Skritek blood gave him a face that was pointed like that of a beast, having fearsome white teeth and prominent golden eyes with vertical pupils. Both his neck and the backs of his hands were partly scaled and partly clothed with short red hair. Indulging the proclivity of the forest folk for human finery, the speaker of Let was sumptuously attired. His rain cloak was supple maroon leather with embossed golden borders at the hood edge and hem. 
He wore pantaloons and a jacket of ochre brocade beneath a sleeveless jerkin of emerald green mylingle hide. His matching jackboots had platform soles and spur leathers, even though he had never sat a froneal in his life. The outfit was completed by a glittering gem-studded baldric and scabbard of flamboyant Zenoran workmanship. To the untutored eye, the young woman trailing the splendid aborigine looked to be nothing more than a servant. She wore drab gray wool and scuffed black leather, and only her magnificent sword and her assured bearing hinted that she commanded the expedition. Kadia and Lumomu made their way cautiously to the stern of the big boat, dodging around bales and hampers and casks of cargo. The deck was slickened and treacherous from the endless rain. Mist clouded the air and made the distant riverbanks nearly imperceptible, so that the flatboat's midstream progress seemed deceptively slow. But the great Mutar was already in full spate, and the aboriginal trading craft raced through the turbulent brown water almost as fast as a mounted courier could gallop. It was expected that they would reach the Twisting River's mouth and the Veronian capital of Mutavari within another nine days. As she passed the lamp-lit after-deck house, she saw young Prince Tolliver and his crony Ralibon through the thick, bubbly window pane. They were watching the old companions and the off-duty members of the Wavilo crew play game after game of dance bones to alleviate boredom. Jagan had discovered years earlier that he and Ralibon were not destined to be congenial, and so he spent most of his spare time with the Wavilo skipper, Wicket Aa. Kadia and Lumomu found the pair in the small stern house that gave the steersman meager cover from the elements. With a little crowding, all four of them shared the shelter. Jagan beheld the despondent look on the lady's face and murmured, Bad news then, Farseer. There has been a signal disaster, she said, and proceeded to describe how Queen Anagel had been swept away in the flooded mire near the Verkar River. Antar's warriors and the Nisimu scouts accompanying the royal entourage have searched for two days. They rescued Emu, who was carried off by the waters at the same time as the queen. But of my poor sister they found no trace. Surely the white lady's talisman, Jagan began, but Katia shook her head. It will not show where Annie is, nor reveal anything else about her state, not even if she is alive or dead. Clearly there is dark magic at work. Jagan Lumomu and Wicked Aa bowed their heads and intoned, May the Triune and the Lords of the Air have pity, Cadia continued. Since the Queen's Mireway was ruptured, perhaps by lightning, more likely by the sorcery of the Starmen, the royal caravan has had to turn back to Ruenda Citadel. It will be impossible to perform road repairs until the dry time. And the hunt for the poor Queen continues? Lumomu inquired. It does, Cadia said with reinforcements from Bonar Castle and the local Nisimu settlements. But the search may be futile. Just before my sister disappeared, a party of warriors was sent out from the royal train to guard a viaduct site near the Mireway. These men have also vanished utterly. By the holy flower, Jagan exclaimed, then it is virtually certain that the starmen have abducted them all through that viaduct. Certain as the changing phases of the three moons, Cadia said with a grimace, and the almighty white lady says she can do nothing about it. Nothing. She has been dallying with that bastard Oragastus, and he has somehow got her all in a swivet. And she says she must think over the alternatives before taking action. While she dithers about, my poor pregnant sister and the others could be dying, or enduring torture. And so I will go to their rescue myself, since Haramis declines to do so. We must turn back at once. Lady, no! exclaimed the Wavilo skipper, in a voice full of dismay. You do not understand the difficulty. I have made up my mind, wicked Ah, uh -uh, Katia stated. You will be handsomely reimbursed for any losses. That is not the point, Wicket said. I would gladly sacrifice my cargo if it would help to rescue your sister the queen, but to return to let the way we came, against the flow of the great Mutar in flood, would take no less than two ten nights, possibly three. Lumomuko added, and then it is still nine days or more of travel from Let to Bonar Castle via Tass Falls, Lake Womb in the Marway. After so long a passage of time, how can you hope to find the queen alive if the white lady herself has failed? I will seek them until the conquering ice freezes the ten hells, Katie declared. 
As to how, the answer came to me moments after the sending of the Archimage had withdrawn. I shall go to the site of that viaduct with a force of brave warriors, and I will command it to open, using words the White Lady taught me. Wherever the viaduct leads, my comrades and I will go, and at the other end we will find the Starman's hideaway, and the Queen and the other persons held captive. Your royal sister may already be dead, Jagin said quietly. Anagil is alive. Cadia insisted. We are daughters of the threefold, petals of the living trillium. I would know if she had expired. Wicked Ah, uh -uh. I order you to turn back. The Wavilo skipper said, Lady of the Eyes, you must understand that this boat is not suitable for upstream travel against a strong current. It is little more than a massive raft with twin deck housings, as befits a watercraft that must withstand the rigors of vicious rapids and the battering of floating debris while hauling much cargo. It is our usual custom, after descending the river to the capital of Var, to sell the boat for its timber after the cargo is disposed of. We make the return journey paddling small Veronian canoes through the shallows. Then you must put me and my knights ashore at the nearest village, Cadia said. I will procure other small craft and boatmen to take us back to Rwenda. Prince Tolliver and Ralaban will remain with you, and take ship from Mutavari as we had planned. There are no human villages in these parts, Wicket told her. Until the truce of the mire, the people of Var were too terrified of the savage Glismak folk dwelling hereabouts to even consider using the great Mutar as a trade route. Even we Wavilo shun the lower section of the river passing through Glismak tribal territory, and this prevented commerce between the Veronians and us. Now, of course, the merchants of Mutavari eagerly welcome our boats, but human settlements along the river are still almost non-existent because of the uncertain temper of the Glismak. There are only rude outposts here and there where factors of the Mutavari companies trade with tribal gold gatherers or trappers. He gestured toward the right bank, which was largely obscured by fog. One such trading post is nearby, but it is an unsavory place. Pull in, Cadia ordered, and we will review the situation. It was midday when the flatboat docked. The Veronian factor in charge of the dismal outpost was a stocky, bearded fellow named Termale Jans. He wore greasy buckskins and had a suspiciously enthusiastic manner. When Cadia and her party came ashore, he greeted them cordially and brought mugs of Salka, the bitter cider that was the national beverage of Var. He went away then, promising to check into the availability of manned small boats. The day remained dark and gloomy, and the rainfall was unabating, leaking through the ill-thatched roof of the porch attached to the factor's squalid lodge. Cadia, Lumomu, Jagan, Wicket, and Lord Zondane, the senior knight of the six oathed companions, sat waiting on crude stools at a rickety table. At least the factor seemed sanguine about being able to assist us, Lord Zondane said in a hopeful tone. Can't say that I liked the fellow's looks much, though. The knight was a burly man of two and thirty, whose sparse hair was already going gray, a native of the Dilex country in northeastern Rwanda. His younger brothers, Malpotus and Calipo, who were also part of Cadia's company, had remained on the boat with the other three knights. This Termalay has the smile of a brigand, little Jagan said, scowling. I have seen his like skulking about the waterfront of Deraguilla and the Travista trade fairs. They will promise you anything, but delivery is something else again, especially if you have paid in advance. I doubt any well-found craft can be obtained in this wretched pelric hole, growled Lumomuko. With increasing unease, he had been watching the activity down by the dock, where figures could be discerned loitering around the Wavilo vessel. The humans in these regions are poor and lawless. The honest merchants of Mutavari hold them in contempt. That is true, said Wicked Ah. Uh -uh. These river people also hate Wavilo folk, since we are so much more hard-working and prosperous than they. We never stop at these sorry outposts if we can help it. And I tell you with all sincerity that we would be wise to quit this one promptly and move on. He tapped his muzzle with one talon digit. My nose itches, and amongst the Wavilo that is a sure sign of trouble ahead. I must find a way to return to Rwanda, 
Katie was undaunted. I don't need a royal trireme, only three or four dugout canoes to accommodate me and Jagan and the knights. And I myself, Lamomu appended. You require a trustworthy guide to lead you through Glismac country, and can hardly hope to find one here. Wicked Ah Ah tossed Salka down his throat with practiced ease. It will be touch and go for the lady and her party, even with your redoubtable assistance, cousin. Would it not be wiser to continue downriver to Mutavari, and there embark with a young prince on a ship sailing around the peninsula to Labernock? The sea voyage would take even longer than going up the river, Lumomu said, because of the greater distance and the adverse winds at this time of year. And we would then have to travel overland from Deraguilla to Rwanda in order to reach the viaduct, Cadia said, crossing the Vizpir Pass. With the yearly monsoons, we could find the pass snowed in by the time we arrived. No, I am determined to return up the Mutar. The sagging door of the lodge creaked open, and there stood the beaming factor with a tray, on which stood a steaming crock, a stack of chipped bowls, and a collection of wooden spoons. Noble guests, this humble one begs you to partake of a nice, fresh Kerouac stew. Although the utensils are lowly, you will find the dish both belly-warming and delicious on this dreary day. Katie frowned. That is most civil of you, Factor Termalay, but we did not order food. The bearded man chortled and began setting out the bowls. He nodded at a pair of tall, shabby youths who had emerged from some rear door and were carrying a covered cauldron and a big wicker-covered salka jug down the muddy path to the river. I have taken the liberty of sending my sons with refreshments for your companions on the boat. The cost will be modest, I assure you, while you eat. My associates are looking into your request for small boats with paddlers. The stuff smells edible, Lord Zondane conceded, sniffing the portion of stew that had been ladled into his bowl. And I for one am famished. Splendid, the factor rubbed his hands and grinned. I'll fetch more salka. He hurried off into the lodge. Cadia stared at her dish without enthusiasm, but Zondane was already eating heartily. Dig in, the companion urged. It's actually quite tasty. Jagan lifted his spoon and touched his long tongue to the contents. His yellow eyes popped out on their stalks and he spat, leaping to his feet and knocking over the table so that bowls and salka cups and the stew crock scattered onto the rotting planks of the porch. Sacred flower! It's laced with yistok root! Don't eat it! Kadia, Lumomuko, and Wicked Aa flung away their spoons and started up, reaching for their weapons. But Lord Zondane still sat on his stool, head lolling forward on his breast. Poisoned, cried the Lady of the Eyes. Oh, the treacherous warm scat! Lumomu, do what you can for poor Zondane, then go deal with Termalay. You others, with me to the boat. She went flying down the path, her great steel sword shining in the rain, with the Wavilo skipper and Jagan following. The dock area was an untidy collection of rickety sheds, baled furs and hides, carelessly stacked lengths of timber, and beached watercraft. The factor's sons were evidently aboard Wicket's flatboat. Three other tattered Demalion Veronians guarded the gangplank, one waving a rusty saber and the other two holding long knives. Cadia screamed to those aboard, Poison! Poison! Don't eat the food! At the same time, she swung her blade at the saber-bearer, he parried her blow clumsily, then rushed at her in an attempt to push her from the dock into the fast-flowing river. She sidestepped and thrust forth her booted foot. As the Veronian howled and lost his balance, she clubbed him at the base of the neck with her heavy sword hilt. He hit the brown water with a loud splash and was swept away. Wicked Aa -Ah had already disposed of his human foe, running him through with a fine blade of Zenoran steel. His muzzle opened in a hideous grin of triumph. I'll see what's happening aboard, he shouted, and leapt aboard the boat and ran to the afterdeck house, from which came sounds of fighting. Cadia whirled around to help Jagan. He had sliced his attacker's left leg, drawing blood, but the ruffian had backed the diminutive Nisimu into a cul-de-sac formed by two big bales of terrenial hides. Giggling in anticipation, the human was drawing back his arm to fling his knife into Jagan's throat when Cadia hacked off the limb below the elbow. The Veronian fell screaming in a welter of blood. 
At that moment, a human form crashed out through the starboard deckhouse window. It was one of the treacherous factor's sons, who hit the boat's rail, clung to it precariously for a moment, then slid screeching into the river as a knight leaned through the window frame and swiped at him with a bloody sword. There were cheers from inside. Another oathed companion, Sir Bathrick, came to the deckhouse door and yelled, We've done for the bastards, princess. How fare you? Go up to the lodge, some of you. See if Lamomo needs assistance. As several knights dashed away, she turned back to the injured Veronian, who sat clutching his severed arm with an ashen face. Will you die, fellow, or shall I tend to your wound? If, if you please, gracious lady, he moaned. The rain had stopped, and it was nearly dark. Sir Bafric and Sir Sainlat brought out a gore-smeared youth and flung him unceremoniously onto the dock next to the dead man, where he lay half-conscious. Young Prince Tolliver crept from the deckhouse with Anissimu Ralliban, both of them seeming to be dazed with terror, and surveyed the scene. Wicket A'a gave his crewmen a few orders, then came and stood impassively with Jagan, watching Katie administer to the wounded man. She used his belt to make a tourniquet, which stanched the deadly spurting of blood. Her nearly clean kerchief served to bind the stump. Do you have halaka resin among your stores? She asked the patient when she had finished. It is the only thing that will do for treating this kind of injury. I, I know not, he whispered. Factor Termalay keeps all such medicaments under lock and key. If there is none, I shall have to sear the stump with fire, Cadia warned, or you will die of the putrid rot. On your feet, then. The skipper and I will help you up to the lodge. With Jagan following, she and Wicket supported the one-armed Veronian, who was on the verge of collapse, and dragged him to the factor's dilapidated hovel. Termalay, alternately bellowing curses and sobbing, had been lashed to a stout wooden chair and was guarded by Lamomu and Sir Ednar. Cadia directed the two of Ilo to put the injured man in another room and care for him as best they could. Then she noticed for the first time that Sir Melpotus and Sir Calipo knelt beside an improvised pallet in a corner. Lord Zondane rested there, unmoving and with features pale as wax. How fares he? Cadia asked. Young Melpotus shook his head. His cheeks were wet with tears. Calipo said, Lady, our noble brother Zondane has passed safely beyond, born into glory by the lords of the air. May the triune god grant him mercy, Cadia whispered. For a minute she gazed down at the dead companion. Then her blazing brown eyes lifted slowly and regarded the captive factor, who had not ceased his noisy lamentation. Maggot-ridden awful, she said, striding to confront him. Is it your usual mode of hospitality to poison your guests? Termalay Jans made no reply, but only continued to keen and sob wildly over his lost sons. He had seen the fight on the dock before being captured and tied up by Lamomo. Cha! Wicked Aa uh -uh exclaimed in contempt. The one murderous stripling was only knocked senseless after receiving small wounds, while the other who went overboard was seen to reach shore some fifty ells downstream. My precious boys are alive? the factor cried. Praise be to Tesdor the Compassionate, the Life-Giving. Cadia seized a handful of the factor's dirty hair and hauled his head erect. Her other hand held a poniard. You are indeed blessed, you sack of wath vomit, she remarked conversationally. Your misbegotten whelps have escaped death they justly deserved. Her blade's point pricked Termalay's throat. But you will face the judgment of your god not two minutes from now, unless you give me true answers to my questions. The factor squirmed and made a gargling cry. Why did you poison our food? Cadia demanded. Was it only for merry mischief's sake, in order to rob us, or did you have another reason? Termalay's eyes rolled desperately. The sharp steel at his throat drew a thread-like trickle of blood. There was an offer, he croaked, to all of us who dwell along the river. If we were able to capture you, dead or alive, and bring you to a certain spot before the next fullness of the moons, there would be a reward of a thousand platinum crowns. Soto's holy heel spurs, exclaimed Sir Calipo, for the amount was literally a king's ransom. He and his brother Melpotus left off their vigil beside their dead brother and stood with the Lady of the Eyes. 
Who promised this extravagant largesse? Cadia let loose of the factor with a grimace and sheathed her dagger. There was no name given, Termalayon said sullenly. Only the place where you were to be taken, beside the double cascade that lies up the river Oda, which has its confluence with the Mutar some twenty leagues downstream from here. I could not believe my good fortune when you came ashore. Katie reached beneath her cloak and drew forth a folded piece of cloth, which she opened. Can you read a map, Cubar dropping? Yes, lady. She indicated a river on the inscribed napkin. Here is the Oda. Is this red dot the location where the reward was to be paid for us? He squinted at the claw thrust beneath his nose. Yes, the very place. You were to be brought there at dawn on any day during this present moon, and those putting up the reward would be waiting. Dawn. Cadia gave a curt nod, then put away the chart of viaduct sites and turned to the knights. Companions, bring Lord Zondane's body down to the dock. We will build his funeral pyre with the trade goods of this pitiful assassin. No! Termalayans cried. I'll be ruined! Be grateful, Sir Calipo retorted, that you and your surviving people are not also serving as fuel for the flames. He, Ednar, and Melpotis bore away the body. Lumomo and Wicket came out from the other room. We found the medication, Lumomo said, and applied it to the rogue's wound. There was also a bottle of fine Gallinari brandy, which he consumed to the relief of his pain. He now lies senseless. You didn't give him the last of the good stuff, the factor wailed. Melpota smote him on the ear, and he subsided, whimpering. What shall we do with this abominable creature, lady? Lumomo asked Cadia. Let him stay lashed to the chair until someone comes to free him. If the wounded man does not die, he will awake from his drunken stupor sometime late tomorrow. And what of your desire to travel upstream? Wicket asked. There are skiffs here that might serve your purpose. I have changed my mind. Please return to the flatboat and make ready to cast off. Jagan and I will join you shortly. Katia beckoned to her Nisimu friend, and he followed her out into the darkness. They went off to the side of the lodge and stood beneath the dripping branches of a large umbaco tree. I would like you to bespeak my sister, the white lady, she said to the aborigine, and bid her send to me. Very well, said Jagan. His luminous eyes closed, and his small body became rigid as a billet of wood as he sent out the call in the speech without words. An instant later, Harimus stood there, so ghostly and insubstantial that one five paces away would not have been able to discern her. What is it, Katie? Have you watched what took place here? No, said the Archimage. I have been occupied with other matters. Katie told the tale quickly, whereupon the White Lady became very agitated. I should have anticipated this. What a fool I have been. Of course they would try to seize you after capturing poor Annie. To exert pressure upon you, Cadia inquired grimly. Beyond doubt. And would you surrender your talisman if Oregastus showed you Annie and me embedded in blue ice? No, said the Archimage. Cadia smiled. Good. Obviously, I cannot attempt to return upriver through the shallows now. Not with every low-born mudsucker on the great Mutar lying in wait for me, licking his chops. I shall have to go on as we planned originally to Sobrania. Not long ago, I viewed the young starman who incited the Skritek taking ship from Taloazan in Zenora. He was bound for Sobrania as well. Whether or not the Star Guild is headquartered there, it is at least a suitable place to begin our investigation. What will you do about Annie? I have made up my mind to enter that viaduct in the Maisie Mire in search of her, whether you approved or not. That will not be necessary. I have already decided to go through it myself. Pray for me, dear Katie. The sending vanished, but Cadia stared for some time at the patch of dark foliage where the image of Haramis had been. Finally, Jagan put a hand on her shoulder. Farseer, they are lighting Lord Zondane's pyre. We should be there. Yes, she sighed. They set off for the dock together in the dreary rain. After a few moments, she said, Jagan, are you willing to accompany me on a journey that may be far more dangerous than a sea voyage to Sobrania? You know that I am, 
and the five old companions will surely tell you likewise. Where are we to go? We will discuss it, said the Lady of the Eyes, after bidding farewell to Zonde. 10. After Queen Anagel's struggle in the chill water and subsequent plunge through the clangorous void, there was a long interval of complete silence. Then her senses began slowly to return. She lay in some sort of conveyance that moved and jolted along, feeling in many different parts of her body severe pain that ebbed and flowed, blurring the passage of time and making rational thought impossible. She was aware of green twilight through briefly opened eyelids and spicy forest smells and the sound of unfamiliar birds. Someone spoke to her, but the words were impossible to understand. She drifted back into unconsciousness. Then it was night, and she heard hoofs clattering on rock in the darkness. The wagon pitched wildly, aggravating her injuries. She wept in helpless anguish until finally they came to a halt. Rough male voices mingled with the nervous wickers of steeds and draft beasts and her own feeble sobs, muffled by blankets. Every breath she took produced a stab of pain. Her right leg would not move, nor would her left arm. Suddenly she was shocked by a thunderous explosion, and her body leapt as lesser concussions occurred, and the animal shrieked in terror. Someone shouted a command. The wagon lurched forward once more, resuming its jarring progress, but now it seemed to her confused brain that they had departed from the natural world somehow and traveled instead through the innermost of the ten hells, for she saw through swollen eyes roaring columns of fire, orange against the night sky. Their heat was so intense that she thrashed about the wagon bed in an agony of fear, calling out brokenly for her husband. King Antar did not reply. All she heard was a hoarse shout. Faster, damn you! Use your whips! Any minute it'll rain, and that'll be the death of us all! The jouncing and tossing movement of the wagon then increased so tremendously that the pain-racked queen fainted away, once again entering a world of formless dreams. This state continued until a light, so bright that it penetrated even her closed eyelids, flicked briefly over her face, and left colored stars in its wake. She heard indistinct speech. The fire heat was gone. She was no longer traveling, but at rest upon a couch or bed indoors, quite unable to move. Then something hard and dull jabbed at one side of her throat, and once again she lost her senses. When she came to herself again, it was daytime and very quiet. She lay betwixt sleep and waking, unsure at first whether that which she experienced was real. I am Anagel, she said to herself. I am queen of Labor Ruenda, and I was broken and drowned, but now I am whole and alive. She was not certain how she knew these things, and she had no memory at all of how the drowning had come to pass. She lay flat on her back beneath a thin coverlet. Two unyielding pillows as firm as sandbags prevented her from moving her head, which was slightly elevated. Her hands and feet were also restrained in some manner, but she was not uncomfortable. Deep within her abdomen there was an infinitesimal flutter, and she smiled. Her babes were also alive. Anagel could see a low ceiling framed with ancient timbers and the upper parts of stone walls. On her right was a casement window open to a gray sky, having coarse-woven draperies. The breeze carried a faint, pungent scent that she could not immediately identify. On the left-hand wall hung a large tapestry done in vivid colors. What she could see of it depicted a female hero with long red tresses, clad below the neck in exotic plate armor, poised to smite some downed foe with her sword. Tall flames, nearly the color of the woman's hair, spewed from the rocks on either side of the combatants. In the background, the charred remains of a devastated forest made skeletal black patterns against a lurid sky that was heavy with storm clouds. Yes, the smell in the air was that of burnt wood, intensified by recent rain. Puzzled and disoriented, Anagel studied the wall hanging for some time. It was not of woven fabric. What was it made of? What land was it intended to show? And what manner of foe was it that the heroic barbarian woman was about to dispatch? 
It seemed vitally important to Queen Anagel that she know these things, although she did not understand why. She cudgeled her brain until the answers came. Feathers. The brilliant tapestry was wrought of intricately layered feathers, and the triumphant woman was about to slay a cringing red-bearded man of oddly familiar aspect. He wore a gaudy cloak and clutched the handle of an ornate battle axe. Feathers. Sobrania. Suddenly she knew beyond any doubt that she was in that country of the far west, where the weather was clement throughout most of the year, and prodigal numbers of birds inhabited the fertile forests. The land of the feathered barbarians was a scattered collection of little kingdoms and tribes, whose self-styled emperor, Denombo, reigned over but did not truly rule the truculent people. But Sabrania lay thousands of leagues distant from the mazy mire. The only way she could have been transported there was— No! the queen cried out. She began to fight against her restraints with all her strength, but to no avail. She was as helpless as a trussed togar lying on a poulterer's stand. But why, she asked herself, did not my trillium amber protect me as I fell into the floodwaters? Was it because she had failed to formulate the prayer in time? Or was there some other reason? Had she lost the amulet? Had some villain taken it from her? There was no way she could tell, for the coverlet reached to her chin, and she was unable to shift it, in spite of her futile struggling. She fell back exhausted at last and let her eyes close, trying not to weep. Anger, frustration, and fear laid siege to her, but she refused to surrender to them, taking long, slow breaths in an attempt to calm herself. She tried to think who might have captured her, and for what reason, but her muddled mind gave no answer, and the very attempt at thought made her head ache. Black Trillium, she prayed in despair, help me, help me. For an instant, the tripartite flower seemed to glow behind her lowered eyelids. Then Queen Anagel slipped again into dreamless sleep. Eleven. White lady, all of us in your household beg of you. Do not do this baneful thing. Tears brim from the enormous inhuman eyes of Majira, Visby Chatelaine of the Archimage's Tower. For an instant, the tall, slender body of the aboriginal woman seemed to flicker and disappear, leaving only those ice-green orbs, overflowing with woe and apprehension, shining in the dimness of the archimage's room. Then the eyes blinked, and Majira became visible once more, clad in her filmy scarlet gown with a jeweled collar. Her face was nearly human in delineation, save for the overlarge eyes and the graceful upstanding ears, nearly hidden in her pale hair. She and others of her race had served Haramis zealously ever since she had assumed her white cloak of office. Although Visby folk were notably hot-blooded, Majira was shivering violently from the intensity of her emotion, clasping her own body as if to fend off deadly chill. Forgive me, she wailed. She disappeared again briefly, as her kind were liable to do when gripped by strong emotion, and when she rematerialized, she seemed more composed. I beseech you most urgently to reconsider. Do not enter the viaduct that swallowed your sister the queen. Haramis was sitting at a small table in her private sitting room, where she had been making a few last notes on her magical slate concerning a sea search for ancient weapons to be conducted by the mere folk. It was nearly midnight, the time she had selected for her departure. The latest snowstorm to sweep the Ohogan Mountains had blown itself out, and the three moons shone brilliantly through the chamber window on a night of intense cold, silvering the leaves and flowers of the great black trillium plant in its pot. Majira, dear friend, my mind is made up, the Archimage said with kindly firmness. You must reassure the others and tell them that I do this only because I have no other choice. I am sorry that you are so distressed. Majira interrupted, speaking in a tremulous whisper. White lady, never before, during all the years I have served you, have I presumed to question your wisdom. But this journey you would make into the viaduct is different. You know that we Visby are the most ancient of folk, charged with special tasks by our vanished creators. 
Over thousands of years, memories of our duties grew dimmer and dimmer, and much was forgotten or passed into legend. But our obligation concerning the viaducts has remained clear. We were commanded to shun them because they are mortally dangerous, and see that no other beings entered them inadvertently. If you go into one of those secret portals, we may never see you again. Only the vanished ones understood the way that the viaducts worked. Others who dared to enter never returned. It is said that the most awful thing about the viaducts is that they do not lead an intruder to clean death, but rather to a realm of unending horror where the soul abides alive, in an agony of fear forever, with no hope of escape. I cannot simply remain here waiting upon events, Haramis said with determination. Every day I discover new mischief wrought by the minions of Oregastus. I have not yet told you of the latest enormity, which I confirmed only this morning. Seven other rulers besides my sister Anagil have mysteriously vanished. Dear old Wid and Revaya of Engi, the Queen of Galinar, the King of Raktum, and the elected chief executives of Imlet and Okamus. All of them disappeared shortly before Queen Anagil was taken. No one in the affected nations would admit to me what had happened, doubtless for fear that the missing rulers will be slain. I only confirmed their absence through my talisman's magic, after my requests to confer with them in person were oddly denied. I have since told the heads of state of Var, Zenora, and Tuzaman what has happened, and I have also cautioned King Antar. They will take stringent precautions against being kidnapped themselves. Do you think that the captured human rulers were spirited away through viaducts in the same manner as Queen Anagil? Beyond doubt, and this makes it all the more urgent for me to locate the headquarters of the Star Guild myself, and as soon as possible. I can no longer wait while Cadia takes a long sea journey to Sobrania. If I do not take action, I can only yield the advantage to Oregastus. Do not fret about me, Majira. I shall go invisible into the viaduct that swallowed Queen Anagil, armed with my strongest magic. But if aught goes awry, I am confident that the three-winged circle and the amulet of Trillium Amber within it will keep me safe. Haramis rose from the table, coming to Majira and laying her hand upon the chatelaine's shoulder. I have no other choice, dear friend. Katie was quite right when she pointed out to me that the viaduct through which Anna Jo was abducted is our only significant clue to the whereabouts of the villainous starmen. It must certainly lead to a region not far from the guild's stronghold, if not within the very headquarters itself. I do not intend to attack the starmen at this time, nor undertake any other rash encounters. I shall simply observe them. If all goes well, I'll return before morning. The Chatelaine bowed. Very well, lady. May the lords of the air defend you. Majira left the room. Haramis went into her bedchamber and donned a sturdy outfit she had had specially made by the tower tailor, a hooded tunic and trousers of water-repellent white cloth. She also wore leather gloves and boots, and at her belt was a pouch with food and water and a small clasp knife. Over this garb she fastened her archimage's cloak. After kneeling briefly in prayer, she lifted the three-winged circle. Talisman, I command you to make me invisible to all viewers. When this was accomplished, she transported herself to that viaduct in the mazy mire through which her sister the queen had been kidnapped. As the usual crystalline vision of her destination attained solidity, Haramis found herself standing on a small patch of high ground in the midst of the flooded swamp. It was night and raining dismally but her magic gave her clear sight of the locale. She had been here before, of course, seeking clues to Anagil's abduction. The trampled mud round about the side of the viaduct had long since been smoothed by the unrelenting downpour. The only peculiar thing about the place was a nearly imperceptible straight line an L or so in length that persistently indented the soggy earth. Her talisman would have called forth the viaduct had she made the request, but it was high time that she used non-magical means for the summoning. Aramis conjured in her mind a vision of the uncanny portal, at the same time that she softly said, Viaduct system, activate. And it was there, heralded by the usual bell chime, 
a tall disk blacker than the shades of night, standing on edge within its notch in the ground and faintly haloed with pearly light. It had no thickness, and both its front and back surfaces were identical. It mattered not which way the thing was entered by a would-be traveler. Haramis remembered from her cursory examination of Iriani's book that the viaducts had two principal modes of operation. One might simply step in and be taken automatically to a preordained destination, as she herself had once traveled from the Kimelon Plateau to Iriani's home in the Auroral Sea. Or one might enter and simultaneously give a rather complex mental command, asking to be transported to the place of one's choice. Haramis did not intend to risk the latter option until she understood the viaduct much better. The only sign that this wondrous device of the vanished ones was more than an impenetrable ebon cutout was a faint breath of moving air emanating from it. Earlier, when Haramis had experimentally activated this particular viaduct but had not dared to enter, that breeze from nowhere had carried a pleasant woodsy scent. Now, oddly enough, the smell was unmistakably that of baking bread. She asked her talisman, Where does this viaduct lead? The three-winged circle replied, The question is impertinent. She sighed. It was as she had expected. The viaduct would yield up its secret only in one way. She stepped inside. Now she felt again the same horrid suffocation she had experienced while traveling to the Blue Lady's northern realm, the same sense of hanging suspended in nothingness while her mind exploded to the accompaniment of a gigantic, throbbing musical note. The trip to Iriani's artificial iceberg had taken scarcely a moment, but this passage was more prolonged, bringing Haramis to the edge of panic as the explosion seemed to go on and on, separating the very fabric of her body into its component atoms, scattering them beyond any hope of retrieval, leaving her soul adrift in a hammering void. Oh, dear God, she thought, have you abandoned me after all? Am I trapped here in the dark forever? Welcome. She heard a raspy voice, smelt the wonderful homey scent of fresh bread more strongly, felt sudden warmth and a firm surface beneath her feet, saw a very old man with a brownish complexion and silvery eyes with great black pupils nodded at her. He was grinning in delight. Obviously, the talisman had not rendered her invisible to him, his white hair was curly, standing out from his pate like sparse zookwool. He wore a floor-length robe of dusty black with a hem border of tarnished diamond glitter, and over it an ordinary cook's apron, badly in need of laundering. She gaped at him, astonished beyond speech. They stood in a kind of foyer with the standing black disk of the viaduct in the center, and four corridors extending away into dim distance like the spokes of a wheel. The old man beckoned for her to follow him a short distance down one of the hallways and turned into an open door. The chamber was brightly lit, cluttered and bizarre, but nonetheless recognizable as some kind of kitchen. Along one gleaming greenish wall was a metal counter crowded with baskets of fresh fruits and vegetables, transparent crocks of honey, colorful jars of jam and conserves, and neat little vials of dried spices. Copper pots and pans hung from ceiling hooks, and on cupboard shelves stood smallish machines of unknown function, and an astonishing variety of ceramic boxes and containers, all labeled in an unfamiliar alphabet. In the middle of the room stood an oddly styled table with a stool beside it. It held a large glass bowl covered with a red-checked towel, a greased metal sheet having coarsely ground meal scattered on it, a flowered board, a saucer of pale bubbly liquid with a brush in it, a lump of butter on a plate, and a large serrated knife. Against another wall were what appeared to be more storage cupboards, and also several singular doors with little windows in them, one of them obscurely illuminated within. Above it, a glowing red gem blinked slowly. Just in time, too, the old man giggled. I know I should let it cool, but it tastes so much better fresh out of the oven. He picked up a pair of padded cloth potholders and opened the bejeweled wall door, whisking out a sheet with three long, narrow, golden-brown loaves upon it. He slammed the oven door, causing the red light to wink out, and transferred the bread to a wire rack. 
Then he took off his apron and began to wash his floury hands at a marvelous sink with no pump, which apparently produced both hot and cold water if one simply willed it. We haven't met formally, the elderly man continued, looking at her over his shoulder as he shook off excess water and fumbled with another check towel. I'm Denby Varcor, your celestial colleague. He spun about, struck a pose, and pointed his right index finger at the smoking bread. Can't wait! Pachoop! He giggled as one of the long loaves executed a kind of skip, rising minimally into the air and then dropping back onto the rack. Yes, that's cooled it just enough. Taking a handsome wooden tray from a sideboard, he began loading it up, opening one cupboard after another. He found two faceted crystal plates and matching mugs and a pair of small silver spreading knives. He took a glass pitcher of white liquid from what was apparently a magical cold vault located next to the sink, then grabbed the plate of butter from the table, the big sawtooth knife, and the loaf of bread he had lately enchanted. Do you fancy jam or meat paste? he inquired. She could only shake her head mutely. Quite right. Plain and simple's the best, I say. Come along. He kicked at a swinging door, which opened wide into a large room of surpassing untidiness that seemed to be a study or library. The shelves contained not only books, but also transparent holders full of the magical slates that she knew were the reference materials of the vanished ones. Peculiar metal contrivances that might have been scientific instruments stood here and there on stands. Marching ahead of her, Denby plopped the tray down onto a wooden table in front of an expanse of closed blue velvet draperies. Beside the drapes was a tall round door having a very elaborate bejeweled plaque instead of a latch or knob. A conjuring flick of Denby's finger sent books, papers, and mysterious small black gadgets cascading off the table onto the carpeted floor, giving room for them to eat. He drew out a leather chair and bade her to be seated, then plumped down into another chair opposite her. Forgot the napkins, he observed, twinkling, but never mind, one of the tenders will oblige. He snapped his fingers. In a moment, an amazing little machine, like a mechanical linget with an open box for a body, pushed through the kitchen door and crept up to the table. One of its many jointed limbs took two folded linen squares from its back compartment and laid them neatly beside each plate. Will there be anything else, master? The thing inquired in a buzzy, small voice. Perhaps a cup of tea? Denby asked Haramus. She shook her head, still too bemused to speak. Denby told the machine, pick up the stuff on the floor and put it on the desk over there. Then he folded his gnarled hands and bowed his head. Thanks be to the source of eternal light for this good food. Seizing the loaf, he gleefully sawed it into slices with a bread knife. It was still hot enough to steam slightly. He slathered butter on both their portions and filled the mugs from the pitcher. It's nice cold volumnial milk. You still drink it down there, don't you? Yes. She picked up her piece of bread, stared at it for a moment, then lifted her eyes to her host. You are he, the archimage of the firmament. His mouth stuffed full, the old man gave a blissful nod. Was it you, then, who abducted my sister the queen and the other human rulers? Denby shook his head, still chewing. Just you. Necessary. The old man downed a gulp of milk, then wiped his greasy fingers on his napkin. Temporarily changed Oro's programming of the viaduct to bring you for a visit. Of course I'm able to countermand anybody else's transportation directives. Then Anagel and the others are not here? No, but you most indubitably are. And to stay, at least for a while. He began to laugh uproariously wheezing and rocking back and forth, flinging crumbs in all directions. The small domestic machine patiently began cleaning up the mess. Haramus was striving to keep control of her emotions. What do you mean, to stay? Oh, dear child, we'll have such wonderful talks, you and I. You must tell me all about your life, and the lives of your sisters as well. 
I've been so disgusted with the world below, sunk in melancholic despair. What to do? What to do? I arranged for Orogastus to be born before Bina came up with a new scheme. And from the start, I thought that hers was silly and futile. But sentimental Iriani loved it, and between the two of them, they bullied me into giving it a try. I couldn't believe three young girls would be able to set things right when we tried and failed. But you triplets did find the pieces of the scepter. It seemed that there might be something magical about you, after all. Something to do with the way you focused and influenced the threads of worldly destiny. Petals of the living trillium combined with the resurgence of the star. Magical science versus scientific magic. I never did divine the straits of it myself, and now it doesn't matter. You ultimately failed, just as I knew you would. But I'll see that it all comes right in the end. Wait and see. I don't know what you're talking about, Aramis said in great bewilderment. He gave a crafty wink. It's genuine magic in that trillium amber of yours, quite beyond the magical science of the star and the archimagical college. Most intriguing and dangerous as well. I was half afraid the amber might prevent my bringing you here and winding it all up. But everything worked splendidly. She decided that he was certainly mad, just as Oragastus had said, but she gave calm reply. I am sorry that I cannot accept your kind invitation to stay, Archimage of the Firmament. In plain fact, I intend to leave you at this very instant. Other important business demands my attention. She grasped the three-winged circle, visualized her tower on Mount Brahm, and awaited the crystalline vision that always preceded her magical transport. Nothing happened. The zany good humor left Denby's face as swiftly as a footprint in sand is obliterated by an ocean wave, leaving his countenance grimly triumphant. He stood up, leaning his knuckles on the table, and his voice, formerly cracked and enfeebled, now had a metallic resonance. The magic you learned from Iriani won't work here, Harimus. It draws its potency from the land which is your personal archimagical domain. Neither will the talisman obey you, because its power derives from planetary wellsprings, and you are beyond their sphere of influence as well. The only way out of here is through the viaducts that I control. Or that way. He chortled, nodding at the round door beside the drapes. It was made of a metallic black material with a single enormous hinge. But that door leads to a release that is eternal, and only I myself will ever pass through it. Haramis's face was alight with anger. Denby, I warn you, resign yourself, Archimage. The condescending smile reappeared. I intend that you shall stay with me until the time is appropriate for you to leave. And I say you are wrong for I can still call upon a third source of magical power that has been mine since my birth. Haramis touched the silvery wings, shielding her trillium amber, and they spread open, revealing a tiny bright light like a golden star. Denby gave a squawk of dismay as she got up and went to the round door. You were quite right about the magic of my amulet, Haramis continued. It is independent of the talisman and capable of aiding me in many ways. I regret that I shall be unable to discuss them with you. Suffice to say that the amber will open every lock in this dwelling of yours, including this one. Denby leapt to his feet, genuine alarm on his brown withered features. Haramus, wait, he cried. You don't understand. You can't open that. It would be the death of you. He stumbled to the enshrouded window beside the round black door and pulled the blue velvet draperies back. Haramis uttered a cry of consternation. Leaning heavily against a chair, she stared at the scene outside. It was a night sky, strewn with multicolored stars beyond counting. Three side-lit heavenly bodies hung amidst the profusion of twinkling points, one seeming to be of modest size, colored blue and white, the other too much larger and silvery, without recognizable features. Sacred flower! 
Aramis whispered. You've taken me to your moon. Yes, Denby said, now almost apologetic. You really can't go until I let you. It's necessary that you stay, I tell you, just as it's necessary for Iriani to remain out of the picture for the time being. What? You know of her monstrous captivity and will do nothing to help her? Eyes ablaze, Haramis strode to the dark man and took hold of his skinny shoulders. You doddering lunatic! What kind of silly game do you think you're playing? No game? No game? he wailed. Ow! Oh, that hurts! Forbear, young Archimage! I'm twelve thousand years old, and my bones are brittle, and my poor heart is weak. I may just drop dead on you if you treat me too roughly. Then you'll never get back home. She turned him loose and spoke in tones of icy contempt. Explain yourself, then. Where is my sister Anagel if she is not here? And why have you dared to interfere with me in the execution of my solemn duties? He lifted his hands in a placating gesture. The queen is safe enough, along with the other rulers. Oregastus has them locked up in his castle in Sabrina. It's all part of my plan. The drop of trillium amber atop the three-winged circle now began to shine like a tiny sun as the face of Haramus became awesome in its wrathful resolution. Denby Varkour, she intoned, I command you, as your fellow Archimage and peer, to send me back to the world at once or face dreadful consequences. His shaken nerves seemed to be mending. He tilted his head pursing his lips in a teasing grimace. What consequences? Do you plan to shake the teeth out of my crumbling skull if I disobey? Or deny your sacred oath and slay me, a feeble old eccentric who only has the best interests of the world at heart? You could easily do so with just your bare hands, you know. But I beg you to hold off, lovely young Haramus. I brought you here for a very good reason. His expression turned mock reproachful. And I was so sure you'd enjoy the new bread. What do you want? she cried in desperation. Abruptly, he seemed both serious and sane. Archimage, you know that the world of the three moons that you love so much is out of balance, threatened with catastrophe. I, I do know that. My sisters and I have tried to restore this balance, as it was prophesied of us. Once we thought all would be well when Oregastus was conquered, but that did not prove to be the case. Now I suspect that only the reassembly of the broken scepter of power will alleviate the peril that threatens. Yes, the Archimage of the Firmament affirmed. It holds the secret, all right. The scepter, that damnable instrument capable of both restoring the world and annihilating it. You have one piece, and the other two are... The old man trailed off, shaking his head. But there is much more to the matter than that. Then explain, she demanded. He essayed a tentative little smile. It would help your understanding, I think, if you first allowed me to show you something. Will you accompany me to that moon over there? There's a viaduct in the alcove next to the middle bookcase. She frowned. Oregastus spoke of a garden moon and a death moon. It is to the latter we must go. As Denby gestured, opening the viaduct, the familiar bell tone sounded, and a dark disc sprang into existence. I'm not trying to trick you, lass. I'll go first, if you like. He disappeared. Haramis hesitated for a moment. The death moon. I must be as mad as Denby. She took hold of her talisman, murmured a brief prayer, and followed. They emerged and stood side by side on a round piece of transparent scaffolding, suspended in murky crimson twilight. Above them, below them, and on all sides extending as far as they could see into the distance, floated a myriad of golden spheres, some two ells in diameter, 
each one tethered to others nearby with barely visible gossamer threads, as though they were caught in an enormous, elegantly woven linget web, spangled with huge drops of dew. When her eyes became better accustomed to the dim light, Haramis realized that the spheres were transparent, filled with some kind of luminous mist. Inside each one was a human form, motionless, attired in garments of a strange cut. Dear lords of the air, Haramis exclaimed, stricken, there must be thousands upon thousands of them. Who are they? Those who are unable to vanish, said Denby Varkor. Twelve. Are they truly dead? Haramis asked, overwhelmed with pity and horror at the sight of the countless glowing bubbles and the bodies within them. Men, women, and children. No, said Denby. They sleep, as they must continue to do, forgotten by everyone except me and the surviving Sintona. But why can't you free them, she cried. The poor souls, neither dead nor truly alive. It's dreadful. I've waited twelve thousand years, hoping that the appropriate time would come, but it never did. If these people were revived now... He broke off, shaking his head. What would happen? Aramis demanded. I'll tell it all to you, lass, said Denby, taking her arm and pulling her back toward the black disk of the viaduct. The real story. Not the half-truths you got from Iriani during your time of study. But we can't talk here. Not in this accursed death moon. Come with me. In spite of herself, she was drawn away again into ringing darkness. When the passage was complete, they were in another place that at first sight seemed ordinary enough. A paved hexagonal eminence, a dozen L's in diameter, bordered by a parapet of pierced stone. The sun shone brightly overhead, and for a moment she felt a great surge of joy and relief, thinking that they had returned to the world of her birth. Come and take a look. Denby said, going to the platform's edge and flinging out one arm in an inviting gesture. Standing beside him, Haramis gave a cry of amazement. She and the Archimage of the Firmament stood atop an enormous pyramid composed of stacked terraces. The level directly beneath was planted with geometric beds of blue and orange flowers, alternating with orchards of small trees laden with many different kinds of fruit. The third terrace from the top had groves of larger trees, meadow-like expanses where some kind of animals grazed, and irregular bodies of water that glistened in the sunlight. Still lower were more green terraces, broad and encircling, that spread far down into the misty depths. Aramis lifted her eyes, looking off into the distance, and was astounded to discover other huge pyramids dimly visible in every direction. There was no horizon, only a dizzying concavity soaring upward, bearing endless numbers of the mysterious prominences, and what she at first thought were oddly shaped dark clouds on the blue bowl of the sky turned out to be more hexagonal shapes, closely spaced, with the sun obscuring the smallest ones immediately overhead. They were inside a colossal globe studded with pyramidal gardens having a bright light source at its center. Once there were dwellings and pleasure domes and places for games here, the dark man said, but their emptiness made me sad, so I had the Sindona take everything away but the plantings and the things in the grotto of memory. Again he took her arm. We'll go down to the grotto now, but I wanted you to see the garden moon from this vantage point first. The viaduct had changed into a black circular pit precisely at the center of the platform. Before she could say a word, Denby stepped nonchalantly into it and dropped out of sight. I'll never get used to this, Aramis murmured crossly. Holding tight to her talisman, she followed the old man. Instantly, she found herself in a sun-dappled woodland clearing standing beside her smiling host. A little pool glimmered in the distance. Aramis looked at the peculiar vegetation underfoot, which had a certain familiarity. The grass was very fine and smooth-edged, rather than properly saw-toothed, 
and odd wildflowers with cushiony yellow heads grew here and there in sunny spots. The place of knowledge had strange plants like this, she observed. Yes, that was the landside floral archive of our university. But mine's much nicer, don't you think? The old man reached down and plucked a globular seed puff. These are the plants of our original homeworld, kept in both places for sentimental reasons, as well as for their unique genome. He blew and the seeds flew off, hanging from tiny parasols. Eons ago, these plants served as foundation breeding stock for the hybrids that are the most valued crops down below. Of course, there were many more varieties before the conquering ice came along and destroyed the ecological and geophysical balance. I don't understand. Of course you don't. That's one of the reasons why you're here. He turned and started off in the direction of the pool, forcing her to trail along behind. The Grotto of Memory is over yonder, among those rocks on the other side of the water. It has something interesting inside that I want to show you, and we can sit down and rest for a bit, too. Skirting the shore, Harimus admired the pink and white exotic blossoms that grew in the water, surrounded by round, flat leaves that floated on the surface like grafts. Strange little green animals crouched on the leaves and watched her with protuberant golden eyes and a very large four-winged insect darted just above the water's surface, keeping well clear of the leaf-sitters. It's time for you to know the history of the world of the three moons, Denby said as they reached the cave mouth. It was broad, but only slightly higher than their heads. I know that Iriani told you something about it when you studied with her, but there is much more. Please come inside. The cave was almost cozy, the size of a modest cottage parlor. From somewhere in the shadows came the tinkle of falling water. Ferns grew lushly on the walls and ceiling, and the floor was carpeted with moss. At the center stood a low pedestal, topped by a ball of stone about an ell in diameter. Behind it was a curved wooden bench. Denby touched the ball. Instantly it glowed from within becoming deeply blue with a single irregular area of ochre and dark brown, thickly dotted with azure. Why, it's a representation of our own world, Haramis exclaimed. I recognize the single continent from charts in my tower library, even though its shape on this globe seems slightly different. But where is the sempaternal ice cap? Ah, Denby crowed. This shows the planet as it was before the coming of humanity, when the Skritet dwelt in abominable primacy at the summit of animal evolution. His forefinger poked at the brown patch. You're right about the continent being somewhat different in contour, then. The sea was higher, but the land was, too, because it wasn't weighted down by a thick icy mantle covering over half of its surface. He motioned for her to sit down on the bench. One of the omnipresent domestic machines called Tenders now appeared, tiptoeing discreetly through the viridescent twilight and bearing two glass goblets of reddish-purple liquid in the box on its back. You requested refreshment, Master, it said buzzily. Will there be anything else? Bring me a schematic diagram of the threefold scepter of power, said Denby giving one cup to Harimus and taking the second for himself. The tender stalked away into the depths of the cave. Harimus gazed into her drink, as if into a scry bowl. Its scent was both heady and familiar. It was Miss Berry Brandy, one of the favorite drinks of Ruenda, her home. The scepter. Is that at the heart of the matter, then? Oh, yes, lass. It's been both our shining hope and our ultimate menace ever since the world's imbalance worsened. But let me tell the whole story to you properly, in my own way. I presume you also told this tale to Oregastus during his sojourn here. The old man giggled. Three petals of the living trillium, and the last star master. Of course I told him and he learned more delving through my archives, discovering how the imbalance might be corrected. That's why he was born. 
That's why you were born. And he began to chant, One, two, three, three in one, won the crown of the misbegotten, wisdom gift, thought magnifier, two, the sword of the eyes, dealing justice and mercy, three, the wand of the wings, key and unifier, three, two, one, one in three, come, Trillium, come, almighty. That's the rhyme, that's the secret, the way to call forth the sky, Trillium, and heal the ancient wounds of the world. Bina and Iriani thought you three girls would be able to do it, but I put my money on Oregastus. It's impossible to unite all those disparate nations and tribes with sweetness and light, you know. It's against human nature, against aboriginal nature, too. Of course, that's the only way to get things done. Crush the opposition. We tried persuasion and reasoning during the War of Enchantment, and what did it get us, eh? Disaster, that's what. And in the end, a death moon. Could never let them wake up into this primitive environment. They'd destroy your simple civilization with their science and high magic. Start the fracas all over again. He had leapt to his feet during the fevered harangue, his eyes wide and flecks of spittle flying from his mouth. She drew back in alarm. He is insane, she thought, as unbalanced as the world itself. I know what you're thinking, he caroled. His frenzy evaporated, and he took his seat once more. After taking a swig from the cup of brandy, he stared at the shining world icon and vented a doleful sigh. Yes, I do know what you're thinking. And you're right. I'm a lunatic. That's why I could never fix things all by myself. Two great tears rolled down his wrinkled dark cheeks. Paramus spoke gently. You were going to tell me the story. Please begin. Oh, very well, said Denby Barcour. The trouble started twelve times ten hundreds ago. In those days, the whole world looked just like that globe. The continent had a myriad of lakes with islands scattered upon them, and that's where we built most of our cities. You've seen some of the ruins deep in your mazy mire, gorgeous places like Trevista, laced with canals and adorned with verdant parks and gardens. We modified the original planetary flora to suit our needs, and worked over some of the animals, too, although they were already compatible with our basic biology. The settlement was a success for many hundreds. Then we were abruptly left on our own when the outside political ultrastructure crumbled and it became dangerous to sail the firmament. For some other worlds, that spelled calamity. But not for us, oh no. Our planet was small, but it was completely self-sufficient, and our population was stable, enlightened, and contented. We lived as long as we liked then passed safely beyond when the time seemed appropriate to move on to another plane of existence. Most of us were worker philosophers, but there were lots of artists, too, and a cadre of professional scientists and engineers who kept the necessary machinery in order. I was one of those, until the restless time began. It's not easy for me to explain our restless time to a simple-minded person like yourself, accustomed to life in a relatively harsh, pre-industrial culture. Don't look at me like that. You're nothing but a barbarian, an intelligent primitive. Oh, very well. I apologize for insulting you. But it's still true. To you, the world we lived in then would have seemed like paradise. No one was hungry, sick, ignorant, or oppressed. Crime was almost unheard of. Everyone had a fulfilling job to do, as well as plenty of leisure time for other pursuits. Nevertheless, after years of tranquility, a strange new discontent seemed to appear out of nowhere. All of a sudden, people began to question the old customs and beliefs and systems of values. We argued passionately about things such as the nature of the universe and our own place in it, about the profundities of life and mind and love and free will. 
At first, the debates were civilized and rational, but as time went on, the opposing philosophical groups became more and more intolerant and fanatical. Disputes began to end in physical violence. That should have warned us what lay ahead, but it didn't. We'd been at peace for so long that we had no true weapons. The rowdiness seemed part of the fun and excitement that were sweeping the world. Not everything that happened during the restless time was bad. Scientific inventions proliferated, including the wonderful viaducts that were capable of carrying a person anywhere in the world within an eye blink. New forms of entertainment and new schools of art sprang up. The three moons were built, originally as holiday colonies and pleasure parks for those who found themselves unsatisfied with traditional modes of amusement. Novelty piled upon novelty, squabble upon diverting squabble. It was a thrilling time, and it was scary, too, for the wisest among us suspected that our once peaceful society would never be the same again. None of our historians was ever sure who first resurrected the ancient human craft that some people call magic. But there it was, all of a sudden, seeming to appear out of nowhere. Fascinating, eh? Magic was more than just another passing fad. The practitioners learned to manipulate both the inner resources of the human mind and also those mysterious wellsprings of the natural order that the mind is able to influence. Genuine magicians are always avid for more and more power, especially the ability to control other human beings. We worked away at it, and interestingly enough, those of us who had been scientists like myself, turned out to be the best enchanters. Not everyone could perform magic, of course. Those who couldn't do it began to fear and envy and hate those who could. As the magicians became more influential, they split into two opposing factions, the Magi, who were very self-righteous about using their occult skills for the so-called good of humanity, and the sorcerers, who tended to look down on non-adept persons and think that they had a God-given right to dominate society. A woman named Narenyi Daral was the spark that finally set our precarious social tinder alight. Her sort of charm and personal magnetism hadn't existed among us for uncounted ages. She was supremely beautiful and appealing, not by dint of mere physical perfection, but because of her brilliant intellect, the strength of her will, and her ability to compel loyalty and the deepest kind of devotion. She founded the organization of sorcerers called the Star Guild, and the best of the sorcerers flocked to follow her. The express purpose of the Guild was the forceful improvement of the world through magical science and the restoration of travel through the firmament. The most powerful of the Magi belonged to an opposition group called the Archimagical College, dedicated to a more conservative view of society, where no one would ever be oppressed by magic, not even in the name of the common good. I was the head of the college, and no one envied me the position. The conflict between our two factions grew into a war that raged for over two hundred years, it was fought with the most ingenious weapons and magic that we could produce. Over four-fifths of our populace died, and in the end, the very planet itself seemed finally to wash its hands of us, although we magi knew that humankind was to blame for upsetting nature's balance. From the start of the War of Enchantment, devastating earthquakes shook the regions where the worst of the fighting was going on. Volcanoes spawned by magic gone awry sprang up where none had existed before, filling the sky with smoke and turning day into night. Plants and animals perished from mysterious murrains. Wildfire engendered by occult conflicts swept the forests and grasslands. When the three moons did shine, they were a dreadful color like clotted blood, a seeming portent of the great disaster to come. Then the climate began to change. Don't think that the worldwide temperature abruptly plunged below freezing. Not at all. 
The winters did become more severe, but what actually doomed us was a speeding up of the natural precipitation cycle. It had something to do with the dust in the air produced by the new volcanoes and the smoke from the burning woods and plains. In the lowlands, the rain almost never stopped, and in the mountains and the interior highlands, snow fell in massive amounts and didn't melt. Instead, it piled higher and higher, turning to ice as it was compressed by its own weight. By the end of the two hundred years of magical strife, the sempiternal ice cap was established, and a true glacial age had begun. Even then, when most people came to their senses at last, the Star Guild refused to abandon its original goal or halt its hostilities. Not even the Sindona, those marvelous mechanical servants of ours, were able to conquer the Star. In desperation, the surviving members of the Archimagical College created the threefold device called the Scepter of Power which was designed to counter the awful sorcery of the Star Guild and restore the world to its previous natural balance. The scepter was entrusted to the three principal Archimagi, one of them being me. We set about to destroy the headquarters of the Guild, which was located in the Ohogan Mountains in the western part of the world. Each Archimage wielded a separate part of the scepter, those devices that you petals of the living trillium have called your talismans. But we prayed heaven that we would never be forced to put the three pieces together and call upon the scepter's full potential. We were afraid of it, you see. When the talismans were used separately, they were formidable channels of occult power. That we had already demonstrated but the unified scepter would theoretically command totipotent magic. It was able to tap the vitality of the entire planet and all of the living things dwelling upon it, capable not only of conquering the star, but also of reversing the ecological insult that had brought about the Ice Age. There was also a danger that the threefold scepter's power might cause the unbalanced world to be torn to bits. In the end, we could not bring ourselves to use the device, not even to end the war that had destroyed our civilization. Instead, each of us three Archimagi carried a separate piece of the scepter in the final assault upon the Star Guild's stronghold. We were supported by an army of those Sindona called the Sentinels of the Mortal Dictum, who are empowered to kill. My two colleagues fought valiantly against the sorcerers, but they perished in the far-ranging battle. I myself, using the three-lobed burning eye, defeated the star men in a climactic contest of magic against magic. Afterward, I gave the three pieces of the scepter to the Sindona, commanding that they be hidden where no one would ever find them. A handful of the surviving sorcerers fled and hid away in the glacier-bound highlands near the center of the world continent. Nerenyi Daral was among the Star Guild members captured and imprisoned by us in the Chasm of Durance. Most of my colleagues demanded that she be put to death, but I would not allow it, for as soon as I saw the Star Lady in person, I loved her with all my heart and soul. I still do. Heaven help me. When the Great War of Enchantment was finally over, our beautiful world of the three moons lay in ruins. Less than a million people remained alive. The monstrous ice cap persisted, in spite of the combined science and magic exerted by the Archimagical College, and it seemed certain to continue growing until it engulfed all dry land excepting the coastal margin and the fringing islands. In such a world, human life could exist only on the most desperate primitive level. Not even our undersea colonies, dependent for food upon a relatively warm ocean, would be able to survive when the icebergs ruled the waters. We knew what must be done. We would have to vanish, abandon the world, and attempt to find another home beyond the outer firmament. Most people began to prepare for the emigration, while we Archimagi undertook a different task. Since we shared responsibility for the war, we made a collective vow to ameliorate some of the terrible damage humanity had inflicted upon the planet. 
Our own race could no longer survive here, but it was possible that another, more hardy species might. Then, after eons of time passed and the glaciers melted, perhaps the world of the three moons would be repopulated once again by thinking beings. Our college created a new race. Combining the heritage of humanity and of the savage Skritek, the only sentient aboriginals who still lived in the swampy Ruendian plateau, where the climate was not yet too severe. Our laboratories were in the subterranean place of knowledge, also situated in the mazy mire where our greatest university had been. The newborn race we eventually created was that of the Visby. Handsome, intelligent beings having a modest ability to utilize magic in their daily lives. We also bred a species of companion helpers for them, giant telepathic birds that you call lammergeiers or boors, who would assist the Visby to travel between their scattered settlements amidst the ice and snow. Meanwhile, the time came for humanity to go off in search of a new home. Six immense transport vessels had been constructed and were waiting near the three moons. Since the voyage was expected to last for uncounted years, everyone on board was to be put into an enchanted sleep, from which they would be awakened automatically at a suitable destination. One of the moons was modified into a holding area for the passengers, since it took some time to prepare them for sleep and then close them in special containers. The first five vessels were loaded with sleepers and successfully launched into the firmament. Then it was time for the sixth to depart. As you know, my dear Haramis, at the last minute, numbers of human beings elected to stay behind. Some of them were stubborn diehards who refused to abandon their old homes. But others had more serious motives for remaining. You see, a new disaster had occurred. Nirenyi Daral and several other ranking members of the Star Guild had escaped from the chasm of Durance. We had thought the prison was impregnable, knowing nothing of the Starmen's magical safety device called the Sinisher. This contrivance, the same that twice rescued Oregastus from certain death, had been carried away from the scene of the last great battle by the sorcerers who avoided capture. Those fugitives eventually found a place of sanctuary in the inaccessible Kimelon, where they activated the Sinisher and snatched Nerenyi and a few of her chief lieutenants away from us. We of the Archimagical College were unsuccessful in our attempts to track the escaped Starman down. When the time came for us to board the last skyship, we hesitated, fearing that the powerful sorcerers of the star might find some way to enslave the naive Visby and frustrate the noble scheme we had worked so hard upon. Hoping to prevent this, we Archimagi also decided to stay behind. The last group of emigrants, already unconscious inside their womb bubbles, waited in one of the moons to be transported to the ship through a viaduct. The world below was locked in winter, and ghastly storms roared over the land and sea. With great difficulty, we had deactivated all of the landside viaducts that were not already buried in ice so that the escaped starmen would not be able to use them. None of us suspected that a single viaduct located in the Kimelon had been melted free by the original small group of fugitives. We were in the midst of maneuvering the vessel into its proper position before putting the passengers on board when it happened. Nerenyi Daral and her cohort came through that viaduct onto the ship and attempted to seize control. There was a brief but fierce affray. Nineteen of the twenty-eight surviving Star Guild members and most of our college were killed. Only six Archimagi remained unhurt, while eleven survived with serious injuries. I captured Nerenyi Daral, but the eight sorcerers who still lived escaped back to the surface of the world through the reprogrammed viaduct and once again disappeared. We sent our wounded back to the place of knowledge for the Sindona consolers to nurse, while the rest of us attempted to resume our urgent work loading the skyship. But a fresh disaster had occurred. 
The great vessel was mortally damaged by the artificial lightning of the Starmen's weaponry. Being semi-sentient, the ship bespoke us a warning of its inevitable destruction within two days, showing us also how we might send it speeding away from the three moons so that they would not be harmed when the vessel burst into fragments. We moved the ship to the other side of the planet, where it was consumed in a fireball brighter than the sun. My fellow Archimagi retired to the place of knowledge to mourn. I remained in the moon that now bears my name as custodian of the ones unable to vanish, together with Narenyi Daral, the lady of the star whose dead body you have seen. It was my intent to convert her through my love, but instead she contrived the ultimate escape, leaving me alone with those poor sleepers who would never open their eyes upon a new world. I have remained here close by them, meditating upon ways to better their sad fate and that of the world ever since. Over eleven thousand years passed. The glacial age seemed to wane. The tiny pockets of human settlement endured a difficult, primitive existence, but they survived. So did descendants of the escaped sorcerers of the Star Guild, who concealed their powers and attempted to blend in with ordinary humanity. The Visby had a better life, thanks to the remaining members of the Archimagical College and their Sindona assistants, who were their benevolent guardians. But our cherished new creatures did not multiply as quickly as we had hoped. Because the Visby are beautiful, the stay-behind humans sometimes mated with them. The offspring, who proved more fertile, frequently did not resemble the parents. Some of these oddling children were cruelly abandoned by human parents in infancy, while others voluntarily left human or Visby society to live with their own kind as they matured. Over the ages, the oddling tribes became true races. Nisimu and Wizgu, and Dorok and Thurkomi and Kadun, the people of mire and mere and mountain and jungle. The ferocious Skritek also persisted, and inevitably their blood merged with that of the folk, giving rise to taller aborigines of less human appearance, the Wavilo, the Glismak, and the Alianza. But the most prolific race of all was the paradoxical remnant of humanity, they managed to thrive in spite of the ice, and after thousands of years had passed, they greatly outnumbered the folk and took over the most desirable lands. A new human civilization was born, much simpler than that of the vanished ones, and the ancient history of the world of the three moons was almost completely forgotten. We Archimagi were less successful in propagating ourselves the surviving original members of the college were long-lived, but in time, all passed beyond, except me. Our adopted successors eventually left the place of knowledge and took up residence in different parts of the world, where they served as caretakers and founts of wisdom. Now only three of us remain. So does the star. And the world, which had seemed to be regaining its lost balance, Totters once again on the brink. Nine hundreds ago, I witnessed the dire retrogression's beginning, and so did Iriani and your predecessor, the Archimage Bina. I caused the birth of Oragastus, last of the true starmen, and Iriani and Bina contrived the birth of you triplets in hope of counteracting him. As the Blue Lady and White Lady had hoped, you and your sisters, Anagil and Cadia, found the lost pieces of the Scepter of Power. You three, and the Star Master, have endured many vicissitudes since then. My vision of your joint destiny and the future of the world is clouded and flawed. I'm so old, so worn, so tired, and very likely I am no longer even sane. Be that as it may, I do know that there are two possible ways of restoring the Great Balance, both dependent upon the Scepter of Power and both exceedingly perilous. Oragastus is certainly capable of performing the restoration, 
If he becomes ruler of the world, he can do what must be done by brute force and the dark sorcery of the star. The flower, and you three, who are its human embodiment, might also restore the balance, and your victory would certainly be a more propitious and elegant one than that of the star. But I do not understand the Black Trillium. It is part of the original magical heritage of this world, more ancient than either the college or the star, and for this reason I do not trust it. All logic says that you three petals of the living Trillium will surely fail. But I could be mistaken. That's why you're here, my dear Haramis. Perhaps we can work out the elegant solution together. And perhaps not. But I won't let you leave my moon and interfere with Oregastus. I saw the pair of you together, when you were ready to kill him in spite of your love and your holy oath. Fool! He is the true hope of the world, not you and your futile sisters. No? Don't you dare argue with me, Archimage of the Land. Here you are, and here you'll stay, until Oregastus conquers the world and uses the scepter to save it. Or destroy it once and for all. Thirteen. Following the orders of the Lady of the Eyes, Captain Wicket Aa -A brought the flatboat to the confluence of the River Oda. With the Wavilo crew manning the sweeps, the vessel moved upstream a short distance and was moored in a backwater where there was easy access to the left bank. It lacked an hour until sundown and the rain had stopped. Now I ask that you send scouts ashore, Cadia said to Wicket, and determine whether or not there is a passable trail that parallels the Oda. Meanwhile, I will confer with my people. She retired to the stern house, where the oathed companions, Lumomuko, Jagan, Prince Tolliver, and Ralaban waited. The cabin had been somewhat tidied up after the fight with the factor's men, but one of the two windows was boarded over, making lamplight necessary, and the odor of poisoned Karawak stew and spilled salka still pervaded the air. I have revised my plans once more, Cadia said, after the others were gathered around her, seated upon bunks, stools, and baggage chests. This new scheme depends upon wicked scouts finding a clear trail up the Oda River, but he thinks they will succeed. You plan to march on land, lady? The youthful knight Ednar was full of astonishment. But why? She explained patiently. As most of you now know, the wretched Termalay Yance was incited to attack us by the Star Guild. I was the principal target. A huge reward was offered for my person, dead or alive. It was to be collected if I were delivered to a certain site on this very Oda River, near the so-called Double Cascade, some twenty-three leagues upstream from our present moorage. She paused and let her eyes rove over the group. The place of reward coincides with the site of a viaduct. Zoto's sacred earlobes, cried Sir Baffrick. He was the new leader of the knights, a stalwart blackbeard, thirty years of age, now the eldest of the companions. Can we then assume that the magical passageway leads to the place where the starmen dwell? Such was my own deduction, Cadia said. The others began to exclaim eagerly, but she held up her hand for silence. Companions, you have anticipated my next statement. I intend to enter the viaduct, using it as a shortcut to the realm of our enemies. Jagan has already agreed to accompany me, and it is my fervent wish that you five will also join us. I speak for all, Baffrick said. We will go gladly. The others shouted their agreement. And I also, said the Wavilo, Lumomuko. If you think I can be useful... Cadia made a gesture of regret. My friend, the situation remains as it was before. Your inhuman appearance and great height would make disguise too difficult when we move among the enemy. I beg you to take charge of Prince Tolliver and Ralaban during the remainder of the voyage down the great Mutar and see them safely off to Derugwilla, according to our original intent. The Aborigine nodded. I will guard them with my life. Katie had turned then to the prince. Tolo, my dear, 
There are grave tidings I must convey to you that have largely influenced my change of plan. And she told him how Queen Anagel had probably been kidnapped through another viaduct back in the mazy mire, and how the Archimage had discovered that other rulers had also been abducted. Can the White Lady do nothing to save my poor mother? the boy asked. Cadia said, She has told me that she cannot even describe a place where the Queen and the others are being held. Her talisman is mute on the subject. Both of us believe that the captives must be in the hands of the Star Men, shielded from overview by dark magic. There is only one way to find out whether the headquarters of the Guild lies in Sobrania, as we have conjectured. We must pass through the viaduct at the Double Cascade. The knights murmured among themselves, and then Sir Calipo addressed Cadia. Lady, you have said that the enchanted passageways are imperceptible to the naked eye and able to be used only through the application of wizardry. Since you no longer have your talisman, the three-lobed burning eye, how shall we find the opening? The viaducts can be opened by anyone who pronounces certain words of power, Cadia said. It is true that the things are normally invisible, but there are sure to be clues in the vicinity of the waterfalls that will point out where the reward for me was to be paid. The viaduct will not be far away. If we fail to find it, Jagan pointed out, we will have wasted at least four days. Lamomu added, This part of the forest is inhabited by a particularly savage band of Glizmak. They still practice cannibalism, in defiance of the White Lady's edict. Would it not be better if Wicket's crew and I accompany you to this twin cataract? I will not have innocent Wavilo folk endanger themselves further on our account, Cadia said. It will suffice if you and the skipper wait here on board the flat boat for five days. If we have not returned by then, you may assume that we found the viaduct and are embarked upon our new mission. Or else you have suffered some fatal misfortune, Lumomu muttered, and passed beyond. You will have to pray for a happy outcome, Cadia said. But be assured that my companions and I will not be taken by surprise twice. We will go well armed and wary. Lady, the most stolid and burly of the young knights, Sir Sainlat, spoke up with reluctance. Please do not think that I hesitate to follow your command. But how shall we know what might be awaiting us at the other end of the magical passageway? We could encounter the vile sorcerer Oragastus himself, or some overwhelming force of his star guild. Don't think that I intend to pop through the viaduct like some impetuous shangar plunging headlong into a hunter's snare, Cadia replied. I have devised a prudent course of action, which I will not discuss at this time, that will enable me to spy out conditions at the viaduct's destination in advance. Melpotas chimed in. You will consult the White Lady. I think not, Cadia said evasively. My sister Haramis is deeply involved in her own affairs. If we succeed in reaching the country of the Star Men, there will be time enough to take counsel with her. Jagan said, What if you ascertain that we would face hopeless odds upon entering the viaduct? If this should be the case, we will abandon the endeavor, return to the flatboat, and fall back upon our original plan to travel to Sobrania by sea. That would be a great pity, Sir Baffrick growled. The thought that we might soon encounter the villains who abducted our queen fires my heart with ardor. The others agreed. Cadia gave a few instructions, ordering them to assemble their gear for a departure the next day at dawn, and then took leave so that she could discuss the arrangements with Wicked Aa. But no sooner had she opened the cabin door and gone out onto the rainy deck then Prince Tolliver came hurrying after her, an expression of great agitation on his pale features. Aunt Katie, I beseech you to reconsider. Let me go with you and assist in the rescue of my mother. I, I know that I am not strong, but there are many ways that I could help you. Katie regarded him with impatience. I cannot think how. Nay, you would be naught but a useless burden, Tolo, and if you had the wit God gave a cue bar you would know it already and desist from wasting my time. If I dare not risk having a stalwart warrior like Lumomoko accompany my party, why ever should I think of taking a child of twelve? Because, because... But he could not bring himself to speak the words. 
Katia pushed past the boy, striding forward to the other cabin. Tolliver stood alone at the flatboat rail for some time, pretending to look inland at the dense forest, even though his vision was blurred. When Ralliban finally came outside to join him, the prince spoke rudely, ordering him to go away. But the old Nisimu had already seen his angry tears. The nightmare came again to the prince on the threshold of the most important adventure in his life. This time it was exceptionally vivid and lacking in the fictitious details that had previously distorted his memory. He was four years younger, decked out in a tawdry miniaturized imitation of the royal regalia of Leberuenda. A tiny sword hung at his waist, and he wore a crown with paste jewels on his head. An army from Tuzaman and the pirate kingdom of Raktum had invaded the northern capital of the two thrones, and the city was near to capitulation. In the dream, the purple voice, that foul henchman of Oregastus, and a squad of six Tuzmani guardsmen were leading Tolliver through the tumult and carnage of embattled Deraguilla. The boy had discovered that Oregastus only pretended to be his friend, lying when he promised that the little prince would become his adopted son and the heir to his magic. Instead, the terrified boy had learned that when Leberuenda finally fell, he was to be set up as its puppet ruler. Even worse, he was destined to be an unwilling accomplice in the murder of his father, his mother, and his older brother and sister. All of them would have to die before Prince Tolliver could inherit the two thrones. Dreaming, he wept with rage and shame as he was dragged helplessly through the devastated streets of the capital. The exceptionally severe winter, signaling the imbalance of the world, had Deraguilla in icy thrall. Dead and wounded soldiers and civilians lay everywhere, their blood staining the snow. Smoke from burning buildings and the ghastly smells of death made the boy cough and gag. The ice-glazed cobblestones were too slippery for him to walk upon, and he fell again and again. Complaining bitterly at being delayed, the purple voice finally hauled the faltering prince up onto his back, making him hold on to the sorcerer's precious star box. The voice was taking it to his master, who was leading the attack against the palace. They forged onward, past small knots of defenders engaged in final, hopeless combat. Screaming mobs of Raktumian pirates and Tuzamani clansmen were everywhere, laden with loot stolen from the burning mansions. And then the earthquake struck. A great wall of masonry crashed down upon the purple voice and the six guards, killing them instantly. By a miracle, Tolliver was thrown clear, scratched and bruised, but otherwise not hurt. The star box was also unharmed. The prince acted swiftly, for all that he was nearly out of his mind with fright. He had only his little sword to defend himself, and knew that he would soon freeze to death or suffer a worse fate at the hands of the invaders if he tried to hide in the ruins of the city. After leaving the toy crown and some of his garments among the rubble, so that Oregastus would think him dead if he searched by magical means, the boy hastened to the palace through back alleys and twisting lanes near the frozen Gwilla River. Eventually he was able to enter the royal stable block through a secret door in the fortress wall, once shown him by his friend Ralliban. A climactic battle was being fought around Zodapanian Keep, the last resort of the outnumbered Laboruendians. Thousands of Raktumian and Tuzamani attackers surged about the palace compound. Oregastus himself bombarded the stronghold doors with balls of lightning flung from the three-lobed burning eye. Slipping through the dark corridors of the stables on his way to Ralliban's chamber, where he hoped to find refuge, the little prince came upon a terrible sight. The body of a pirate with a pitchfork in his throat lay in a pool of gore outside the groom's quarters. Sprawled atop him, still gripping the fork's handle, was Ralliban with a Raktumian dagger in his back. Oh no, the prince cried, bending over his friend. The Nisimu gave a faint groan. One bleary yellow eye opened. Go quickly to my room, Tolo. Hide there until I come for you. The eye then closed, and Ralliban spoke no more. As it happened, Ralliban was not dead, 
only badly wounded and in a swoon. But in the dream, as in life, Tolliver felt himself bereft of his last hope. Hearing someone coming, the prince fled into the Nisimu stablemaster's cozy little chamber, where he concealed himself beneath a discarded cloak in a corner. A man, moving furtively and breathing in painful gasps, as though he too had been fleeing for his life, entered the room and closed the door behind him. The prince's hand tightened upon his little sword. Meager firelight from Ralevan's hearth showed that the intruder was clad in a dirty golden robe. It was the acolyte whom Oregastus called his yellow voice, sent by the sorcerer to act as an aide to young King Lidavardus of Raktum during the invasion. A silvery gleam shone from beneath the voice's hood, and Tolliver nearly cried out in astonishment. The man was wearing the talismanic coronet called the Three-Headed Monster. Oregastus had lent it to his minion so that the voice could transmit to his master news of the battle action going on around him. It was obvious to Tolliver that the cowardly yellow voice had run away, abandoning his duty when the fighting grew too furious. In his dream, the prince's heart swelled with brave resolution. In reality, he had acted almost without thought. Except for the area next to the hearth, where the voice now stood, helping himself to Ralevan's abandoned supper, the room was in deep shadow. Tolliver crept up behind the acolyte as he began to ladle hot stew from a pot on the fire into a bowl. The boy pressed the sharp point of his little sword to the nape of the man's neck, cutting through his hood. Stand still, the prince hissed. Drop those things. I meant no harm, the voice quavered, but Tolliver pricked the acolyte with the blade until he let fall the bowl and ladle. I'm only an unarmed townsman, caught up by mistake in the fighting. Silence or you die, and do not move. I will stand quite still, the yellow voice whimpered. I would not dream of moving. The sword withdrew from his neck, and faster than lightning, it whisked off his hood and flipped the magical coronet from his shaven head. The three-headed monster spun away through the air, striking the floor with a clang and rolling out of sight in the dimness. Dark powers, not the talisman, the acolyte shrieked. Master, help me. The true foolhardiness of his action now came home to Prince Tolliver, for the yellow voice whirled about and fell over him, uttering a great howl and bearing both of them heavily to the floor. The boy was able to wriggle free, but he had somehow lost the sword. The acolyte struggled to his knees, swaying and clutching at his breast where a dark stain was spreading. His eyes had become brilliant white stars, and Tolliver knew beyond doubt that Oregastus himself now looked out through them. As the yellow voice writhed in his last agony, trying vainly to pluck forth the small blade that had by chance lodged in his heart, his head slowly turned. For a brief instant, his brilliant eyes, like two small beacons in the darkness, illumined Prince Tolliver. The boy crouched in the corner his mouth wide open in voiceless horror. Then the shining orbs winked out, and the yellow voice fell dead on the floor. In his dream, the little prince arose and pulled his sword from the body, wiping it clean on the acolyte's robe. Then he went calmly to Ralevan's bed, fished under it with the blade, and drew forth the magical coronet. He stared at the three-headed monster for some time in silence, knowing by the star emblem inset beneath the central face that it was still bonded to Oregastus and would kill him if he touched it with his bare flesh. The silvery circlet that formed one part of the mighty scepter of power had belonged to his mother, the queen, before she surrendered it to Oregastus as ransom for her husband, King Antar, and for her youngest son, Tolliver, as well. But the prince had refused to leave the sorcerer then, blinded by the great delusion that Oregastus loved him and some day would pass on to him his power. You lied to me, the boy whispered, strangely excited. But I shall have power, nevertheless. He fetched the star box, knowing full well its operation, and opened it. Inside the shallow container was a bed of metal mesh, and at one corner, a group of small flattened jewels. Using his sword, Tolliver dropped the coronet into the box. 
a bright flash seemed to indicate that it had unbonded from Orogastus. One by one, the prince pressed the colored gemstones in consecutive order, and each one lit. Finally, he pressed the white jewel. There was a musical sound, and all of the tiny lights went out. The boy stared at the three-headed monster, hesitating. Had the Starbox done its work? Was the talisman now bonded to him? If it was not, it would very likely kill him if he touched it. At that same moment, there came rough shouts and crashing sounds from outside the door. The pirates were coming. His hand shook as he reached into the star box. The metal of the coronet was warm as he took it up. It did not slay him. Beneath the central carven monstrosity, where there had once been a many-rayed emblem of the Star Guild, now shone a tiny replica of Tolliver's princely escutcheon. You are mine, he marveled, and set the talisman upon his head. The loud voices were now right outside the chamber. Make me invisible, talisman, and the star box, too, he commanded. It must have happened, for the door was flung open, and three rogues with bloodied swords peered in, made scornful note of the dead yellow voice, and betook themselves elsewhere. The prince felt a wonderful swell of confidence fill his heart. I will be an even greater sorcerer than you, Oragastus, he proclaimed to the empty air, and I'll make you sorry you deceived me. At that point, the dream ended, and the prince's waking nightmare began. Tolliver, Tolliver, Prince of Labor Uenda, do you hear me? No, go away. Still half asleep, the boy pulled the rough pillow over his head and burrowed deeper into the covers of the bunk bed. I will not go away, Tolo, not until you agree to be my ally. No, Tolliver whispered. I'm only imagining you, Oragastus. You aren't really speaking to me. You don't even know where I am. That is not true. You lie abed in a Wavilo flatboat. The boat is tied up for the night in the river Oda, not far from its confluence with the great Mutar. You can't know that, the boy said to the voice in his mind. But I do. And do you know why, Tolo? because deep in your secret heart you want me to. If you did not, your two talismans would shield you from me. No, you're only a dream. It's my bad conscience conjuring you up. I feel guilty because, because I once chose you over my parents, when I hated them. You were too young to understand what you were doing. Your hatred was not genuine. Your father and mother know that. You have long since atoned for those juvenile sins. They are of no account now, when you have very nearly reached manhood's estate. At any rate, none of that infantile naughtiness has anything to do with my solemn pledge to you, which I am now prepared to fulfill. I'm not interested in your lies. Let me alone. Of course you are interested. How could you not be, since you are so very intelligent? More than anything in the world, you long to taste the full power hidden within those marvelous things you own. Go away. Leave me in peace. Get out of my dreams. I despise you. One day I will kill you myself to expiate my sins. Nonsense. Be honest with yourself, Tolo. You know that only I can teach you the full use of the talismans. You will never learn all by yourself. Come to me in Sobrania, dear boy. Only step through the viaduct. Never. You're trying to trick me. No one can possibly harm the owner of the three-headed monster and the three-lobed burning eye. You know that. I don't have them. Yes, you do. I saw you in the stable as my yellow voice died. You are the only one who could have taken the coronet and the star box, and who but their owner could have made away with the burning eye. Not me. Not me. Dear Tolo. You know what your Aunt Cadia plans to do on the morrow. Follow her. When you step through the viaduct and arrive in Sobrania, warriors of my company will be waiting to conduct you to me. There will be a joyous celebration to welcome home my long-lost adopted son and heir. You will be initiated at once into the guild, just as I promised four years ago. I... I don't trust you. You must. I am the only one who can help you fulfill your destiny. No, Tolo, come to me. No, no, no. You know you must come to me. 
Tolo, Tolo, Tolo. The prince moaned aloud, and he felt a hand shake his shoulder. No, get away from me! Tolo, wake up, lad. It's Aunt Katie. You're having a bad dream. The prince crept out from under the covers. His aunt was kneeling beside him in the darkness, her face faintly lit by the glowing drop of trillium amber that hung about her neck. It was still deep night. Rain tapped on the cabin roof, and the heavy breathing of the slumbering oathed companions, Jagan and Ralaban, vied with the noise made by the forest creatures outside. I'm sorry, Tolliver whispered miserably. The dream seemed so very real. Cadia kissed his forehead. It's gone now. Try to sleep again. He turned away, facing the cabin wall. I will try. She gave him a final pat of reassurance and then went back to her own pallet. The prince lay very still until he was certain that she slept. Then he let one hand drop down from the bunk, feeling for the locked iron strong box shoved beneath it. It was there, with his treasures still safe within. Eyes wide open, Prince Tolliver waited for the dawn. Fourteen. After bidding Tolliver and Ralliban farewell, Cadia put on her hood cloak and came out onto the deck of the flat boat into the early morning air. It was cold and very quiet. Thick fog enveloped the water and the land, but at least the rain held off. Lumomuko and Wicked A'a were near the gangplank, assisting the five oathed companions to don packboards that bore sacks containing spare weapons, clothing, a few necessities, and food. Jagan had already gone ashore to confer with the Wavilo scouting party. We are nearly ready, Lady Cadia, said Sir Baffrick. The skipper says we must keep a keen lookout for man-eating goblet trees and poisonous suny bugs on the way to the viaduct. Sir Edinar spoke up with morbid zest, and because of the fog, there is a special danger from ravening nymphs, horrible creatures, native only to these parts. They lurk at the bottom of cleverly concealed pits, waiting for unsuspecting prey to tumble in. I have heard of these nams, Eddie. They are formidable, but no match for a well-armed champion such as yourself. She addressed Wicked Awe. How does the trail look? Do your scouts think we will be able to reach the Cascades and the Viaduct by midday tomorrow? The way is partially inundated here in the lowlands, the flatboat captain reported. My men have marked a short alternate route. As the land rises to the west, the original trail will soon become clear. Barring this adventure, you should easily traverse the distance in a day and a half. But I am still worried about the possible presence of cannibal Glismac. Katie touched the heraldic eyed trillium device and blazoned upon her my lingual scale cuirass. Even here in the southern wilderness of Var, the forest folk will have heard of the Lady of the Eyes. I fear said Wicked Aa with portentous softness, that they will also have heard of the thousand crowns offered by the starmen for your capture. Cadia only laughed. I shall claim from those villains a reward of my own choosing once we have successfully passed through the viaduct. We will wait the five days, the skipper promised. Lady, farewell. She nodded to him, gave a brief embrace to Lomomu, then turned to the knights who were waiting with ill-concealed restlessness. They wore steel helmets and full coats of mail beneath their leathern raincoats. Companions, she said, it is time for us to disembark. As they filed down the gangplank, Jagan handed out freshly cut walking staves to everyone. He led the way into the misty jungle thicket with the men close behind. Cadia brought up the rear, giving a final wave to Prince Tolliver, who watched from an open window of the boat's stern house. In a few moments, the party was lost to sight. Cousin, I like this knot. Lumomu followed Wicked Aa as the skipper made a tour of inspection, personally checking the bindings that held the massive log raft together. It had begun to drizzle. My nose has itched fiercely ever since we left the Mutar and entered this tributary stream. I should have insisted on accompanying the expedition, at least as far as the double cascade. I cannot escape the feeling that some great calamity impends. But whether it will strike us or the Lady of the Eyes, I cannot say. 
Wicked Aa shrugged, rolling his large eyes. Cousin, my nose itches also, but I can think of only one misfortune that threatens us at the moment, and that is losing our mooring. This left bank is too low-lying for comfort. Soon the rain will begin again, and as the odor rises, this shore will flood. Unless we want to risk being swept back downstream into the great Mutar, we are going to have to move the boat across the river into yonder cove and tie her up to stouter trees. If you truly desire to fend off disaster, go up to the bow and get ready to wield a barge pole. It took over three hours of hard labor to get the awkward craft into a more secure position. When the job was done, the Momoko joined the skipper and the rest of the crew in the forward deckhouse, where the cook served an enormous meal. After that, with the drizzle turned to a steady downpour, all of the Wavilo settled down for a welcome nap. The speaker had forgotten his earlier apprehensions. He woke late in the afternoon with his nose itching worse than ever. Something prompted him to investigate the stern house where Prince Tolliver and Ralliban had remained in seclusion since the departure of Cadia's party. To his horror, Lamomo discovered that the boy and his Nissimu crony had both disappeared, leaving behind an open and empty iron strongbox beneath the prince's bunk. I must go after them, the dismayed speaker of Let said to the skipper, who had followed him aft. Both Wavilo stood on deck in the pouring rain, staring across the channel. The expanse of swift-flowing brown water was at least fifty ells wide. We must move the boat back to the opposite shore at once. But Wicked Aa was more practical. Cousin, the crew is exhausted. We could not manage it before nightfall, and once we put you ashore... We would have no choice but to let the current carry us down to the great Mutar, for there is no safe moorage over there now that the river is risen. I promise to guard Tolliver with my life. If you will not carry me across, I will swim. Wicked Aa -ah laid restraining hands on the speaker's shoulders. Cousin, only stop and think. The prince and Ralliban must have managed to slip off the boat before we cast off from the left bank. This means that they left us over six hours ago not long after the Lady of the Eyes herself departed. In my opinion, the boy impulsively decided to accompany his aunt. It was a rash thing to do, certainly, but when the lady's party halts for the night, the prince will certainly catch up. You could not reach him yourself before then. Lumomo smote his scaly brow in a fury of frustration. Damn the boy's foolishness! Damn that Ralliban for conniving with him instead of acting sensibly! Ah, oh, if only I were able to bespeak Jagan and alert him. But the Wavilo, unlike the small folk of the Maisie Mire, were unable to use the speech without words across any appreciable distance. It is futile for you to follow after, Wicked Aa -Ah insisted. My honor demands that I go. Logic demands that you stay. Lumomoko lifted his taloned hands to heaven and gave a great roar of fury and humiliation but the skipper only folded his arms, shook his head, and waited for his cousin's usual good sense to prevail. When that finally happened, the two aborigines went together into the deckhouse and helped themselves to mugs of salka from the big wicker-covered jug Termalay Yance had provided. The crew had long since determined that it was not poisoned. Cadia's troop halted at midday beneath a huge sheltering bruddock for a brief lunch of cheese and journey bread, finding seats on rocks that were dry once their shroud of crypt moss was peeled away. Jagan attempted to make a fire for tea, but the air was so laden with moisture that even his skill failed to kindle a flame. They made do with cold water. A measure of good cheer was restored when the little Nisimu spied a bush with pendant clusters of white berries. These are Sifani, Jagan said with enthusiasm. They are delicious and thirst-quenching and will be a fine dessert, even if the rest of our rations are modest. I like dessert best, said Sir Ednar. The boyish knight began devouring the succulent fruit with no more ado and broke off bunches to toss to the others. The rain had abated a little, but visibility was still very poor. They had passed out of the densely vegetated bottomlands into a more elevated region where the going was somewhat easier, if more steep. In a few places, landslides had obliterated the trail, 
but detours were readily accomplished, and they had kept up a good pace. They noticed stands of deadly goblet trees from time to time, deceptively handsome things, having fleshy trunks and a cup-shaped crown of colored leaves that concealed tentacles capable of hauling a man to his doom. But the party had encountered no venomous snakes or large predatory animals. I reckon that we have come nearly eight leagues, Jagan said, munching bread. We can safely continue for another three or four hours, but then we must find a safe stopping place well off the trail, where night-prowling Glismac will not easily find us. The big rocks down along the riverside may provide shelter from the rain. Unfortunately, we dare not light a fire after dark. A pity, sighed Melpotis. He and Calipo, brothers of the murdered Lord Zondane, were long-faced men, having yellow beards and snapping dark eyes. Fire would help keep wild beasts at bay. Our main concern must be the Glismac, Cadia said, and possibly marauding starmen venturing through the viaduct. My trillium amber will give warning if my life is in danger, so we must stay close together after dark and keep our weapons handy. Do you think, said Sir Baffrick uneasily, that we will find the double cascade viaduct guarded by a troop of sorcerers? Cadia said, The villain Termalayon stated that the reward for me would be payable at dawn. It seems likely that the starmen would appear only at that time each day to see whether my precious carcass was on offer. If we arrive at the viaduct site around noon, as I have planned, we may very well find it deserted. Certainly we will do a careful reconnoiter before approaching. Surely, said Baffrick, we would be wise to wait until dark before actually entering the viaduct. If the passage leads straight into the den of Orgastus, said Big Sainlat Dourley, it will not matter whether we pass through in daylight or night. We will be forced to fight for our lives. I'm ready for anything, young Ednar declared, wiping Sifani juice from his mouth. Calipo and Melpotis also expressed their eagerness for combat. But Cadia said, I must dash your bloodthirsty hopes, companions, at least for the short term. When we reach the viaduct, I will go through first, and alone. Immediately the men began to exclaim, Nay, but she forged on. My amber amulet will conceal me from hostile eyes. If all is well on the other side of the magical gate, and it affords a safe way into the sorcerer's domain, I will immediately return to fetch the rest of you. Jagan made protest. And what if you emerge from the viaduct into some deadly locale, Farseer? My trillium amber has saved my life many times, as you know very well. It will not fail me in the present instance. The five knights sat without speaking for some minutes, each one mulling over Cadia's words, having grave misgivings about her plan, but being unwilling to speak against it, and be thought disloyal. At last Jagan said, And what shall we do, Farseer, if you enter the viaduct and do not return? Then you will bespeak news of my fate to the white lady, she told him, and follow her commands. Would it not be more prudent to consult her beforehand? No, Cadia said firmly. Jagan bowed his head in silent reproach. Cadia rose and picked up her backpack. We have tarried here long enough. Let us be on our way. The Odic tribe of Glismac had only a single settlement of less than forty souls, lying three days' journey above the Double Cascade. Most of their race eked out an austere living by simple hunting and gathering. Those who dwelt farther north, near Wavilo territory, occasionally did rough manual labor for their aboriginal kinfolk, or even for humanity. The Oda tribe, luckier than most, had been taught by factor Termalayance to trap, skin, and cure the fur of the coveted blue Dixu. Thus introduced to commerce, they were more ambitious than other members of their kind, having become accustomed to certain luxuries, such as strong drink, pearl ornaments from Zenora, and steel knives. Factor Termalay purchased their furs at the start of each wet time, and the Glismac had seen him very recently. A fur bale as tall as the Oda village headman's hut, which had taken the tribe nearly half a year to accumulate, had brought them a single golden Veronian crown. 
The folk of the Oda had been astounded when Termaleons told them about the fabulous reward offered by the Starmen for the capture of the Lady of the Eyes. The sum of a thousand platinum crowns was far beyond Glismac comprehension. Having only three digits on each hand, they had never learned to count higher than six. Still, they knew that a thousand must be considerably more than that. Mendaciously promising to share the reward with Termalay if they found the lady, the Oda Glismac returned to their wilderness trap lines. As they worked, they kept their big red eyes peeled for the valuable human prey. Yesterday they had found her. The Wavilo flatboat had come into the lower reaches of the Oda just before dusk. It had been misty, but lurkers on shore had clearly seen a smallish human female with braided russet hair standing at the rail as the boat tied up for the night. The Glismac had not dared to attack then. The Wavilo boatmen, their close racial kin, were too formidable a foe to mess with. The watchers could only wait and yearn, beseeching their three-headed god to cause the Lady of the Eyes to come ashore without her aboriginal companions. In time, their prayers were answered. The Glismac of the Oda River were a primitive race of folk, but they were by no means stupid. They decided to wait until the prey and the armed men accompanying her had reached the magic door before attacking, so that they would not have to carry her dead body very far. On the next morning, the weather was much better. The rain and fog had disappeared completely, and by the time Cadia and her party returned to the trail from their bivouac by the river, the sun was out. They hiked for four hours, seeing nothing unusual and hearing only the noise of the river tumbling over boulders, a rare trill of birdsong, and the occasional cry of some distant beast. The double cascade cannot be far now, Jagan said, when the sun was nearly overhead. A good thing, Sir Sainlat replied, for I am well nigh worn out climbing this rocky trail. I would sell my soul for a saddled fronio. The others laughed and began to tease him, but in truth they were all very tired, not being used to going afoot armored while carrying heavy loads on their backs. Cadia, still bringing up the rear as she had done throughout most of their march, paused and looked back the way that they had come. The valley of the Oda had narrowed, and the character of the forest had changed. They had passed out of the humid Tassileo lowlands and into the foothills of the southern Ohogan Range. Something scarlet high in the tree canopy above the trail caught her eye. It was a huge gauze wing, wider than her two hands, fluttering in search of nectar. Cadia smiled at the sight of the lovely creature, then turned to resume her march. The others had already gained the top of the steep ridge that she now ascended. She saw Jagan beckoning to her and froze, her hand automatically going to her sword hilt. But he did not seem to be alarmed, and so she made haste climbing, and in a moment stood beside him and the others. Ahead was their goal, two narrow streams of water glistening as they fell for nearly eighty ells down the face of the mountainside. At the base of the double cascade was a pool, foaming white where the cataracts impacted and limpid blue-green in its outer reaches. The glade round about it seemed completely deserted. They made a stealthy approach, encountering no one, and at length stood at the foot of the twin waterfalls in a dense grove of peculiar trees. These had trunks with vertical openings over an L high that constantly opened and closed, revealing a maw lined with shiny green spikes like enormous fangs. Here and there, a tree had its mouth closed, and blood and other nameless fluid seeped from its wooden lips. These trees are called Lopa by the Wavilo, Katie remarked to the companions, who had gathered around one specimen and were staring at it with apprehension. They appear repulsive but they are not dangerous to human beings unless one is so foolish as to reach into the toothed opening. When my sister Anagel undertook her original quest for her talisman, the three-headed monster, she found the coronet concealed within a gigantic lopa tree and only retrieved it by dint of great courage and ingenuity. Jagan had left the group in order to explore the area near the pool. He now called out, 
Farseer, I think I have found the site of the viaduct. The others ran to him. There, between two exceptionally large lopas growing at the water's edge, was a flat slab of rock, oddly free of moss or other forest growth. A perfectly straight groove was incised in it, and spiked to one of the adjacent tree trunks was a board with a many-pointed star painted upon it. We will soon see if you are right, Katia said to Jagan. Cautioning the others to stand back, she commanded. Viaduct system activate. A tall black disc, seeming to have no thickness, sprang into being to the sound of a deep bell chime, whereupon the knights gave cries of amazement. Katia nodded in satisfaction and cast off the straps of her pack. Before any of the others could say a word, she drew forth from her jerkin the shining amber droplet that hung on a cord around her neck and held it tightly in her left hand. Her right rested upon the hilt of her sword. Black Trillium, she said, I pray you shield me from the sight of hostile persons and keep me otherwise safe from harm. She stepped into the viaduct's ominous dark surface and disappeared. There followed an instant of utter silence. Then came a heart-stopping bellow of frustrated rage from many throats. Jagan and the knights whirled about, over a score of huge aboriginal warriors, tusks bared and eyes flaming, came bounding down the wooded rocky slope with steel-tipped spears held at the ready. Glismak! Jagan cried. No sooner had he spoken than the creatures flung their weapons. The spears, aimed at the Lady of the Eyes, went toward the viaduct, but the black disc winked out of existence and most of the blade soared harmlessly across the cascade pool. One spear fortuitously caught Sir Baffrick in his unarmored throat. He staggered backward, blood pouring onto his chest, and fell from the riverbank into the water, which turned scarlet. The crowd of cannibals halted momentarily, bellowing in disappointment at the unexpected loss of their prey. Then some drew Veronian short swords while their comrades hefted flint maces and other weapons. They advanced upon Jagan and the four surviving knights, intending to make short work of them. After that, they would prepare a consolation feast. Fifteen. Going invisible has its problems. When Prince Tolliver and Ralliban left the flatboat and began to follow Cadia and the others through the river bottomland in thick fog, they soon discovered that the vapors did not penetrate the space occupied by their unseen bodies. If one looked carefully, a human form might be perceived, outlined by swirling mist. The prince was baffled. No command that he could think to give the talismans would alleviate the predicament. In the end, he and Ralliban simply kept far behind the others, hoping that they would remain unnoticed. When the worst of the fog finally dissipated and the pair became truly invisible again, another difficulty presented itself. Neither the prince nor Ralliban knew where the other was at any given moment. Once, when the boy paused to answer a call of nature, the Nisimu continued on oblivious, only to panic as he realized that his own footsteps were the only ones to be heard. Ralliban then dashed back along the trail, frantically crying out the prince's name. Tolliver tongue-lashed the old stablemaster roundly. You blockhead! What good is it to be invisible if you betray our presence with your big mouth? I should never have brought you with me. Then, Hidden Heart, you would have had to carry the star box yourself, Ralliban retorted with injured dignity, as well as our food and other supplies. Besides, without my knowledge of wilderness ways, a young lad like you would surely become lost or suffer some mortal misadventure before traveling half a league. But that was not true. The prince had learned a good deal from his clandestine excursions into the mazy mire, while Ralliban had, for over forty years, spent most of his days in the royal stables, enjoying civilized human comforts, and had forgotten most of the Mirecraft learned in his youth. In truth, he was worse than useless as a guide. He made a great fuss, warning the prince not to touch goblet trees or tanglefoot or other obviously hazardous flora, 
while neglecting to point out more subtle dangers, such as the deadly Sunni bugs that dangled on a thread of slime among the bushes, or the snaffy, which resembled fallen leaves, but were actually small animals that crept along on multitudinous finger-like feet, capable of injecting poison if they got into the clothing and touched one's bare skin. Ralibin also vexed Tolliver by stopping again and again to survey the forest, swiveling his long, upstanding ears, sniffing the rainy air, and cautioning against the stealthy approach of ravening beasts that never actually appeared. Eventually, the prince became quite out of patience and took the lead himself, after which they made more steady progress. From then on, if a stream had to be forded, it was the boy who chose the place where they would wade or hop across on stones. Tolliver also decided how they would negotiate washed-out places on the trail, picking the way with care so that their passage would not set the unstable earth moving again. And when the path now and again seemed to vanish amidst down trees or dripping underbrush, Tolliver was the one who would find the route again, even though Ralibon would bluster and profess to have known the way all the time. Pressing on through the rain, they reached the spot where Cadia and the old companions had eaten their midday meal, and there they found a nasty surprise. The prince pointed out numbers of large, three-clawed tracks in the soupy mud. These were not made by animals, he said, trying to keep his voice from trembling. They must be glismac. See how the prince overlie the ones made by Aunt Katie and her companions? The brutes are following them. Oh, holy flower for Fend, Ralibin moaned. We must find some way to warn the ladies' party of the cannibal's presence. Perhaps I can whisper in her ear, and she will think that her black trillium amulet speaks, or even one of the lords of the air. The prince laughed nervously, rather liking the idea of being mistaken for a heavenly guardian. He pressed his fingers to the sides of the coronet, closed his eyes, and bade it give him sight of Cadia. This was a kind of magic he had often practiced, becoming fairly proficient. Do you see the lady? Ralibin whispered anxiously. Yes. In Tolliver's mind was a clear picture of her and the others, tramping along the steepening trail with tendrils of mist swirling about them. He heard Ralibin's voice say, Tell her of the danger, Hidden Heart, quickly. Aunt, can you hear me? But Cadia moved on heedlessly, even though Tolliver called out again and again, keeping his eyes shut to maintain the sight. It's useless, the boy said at last. There must be a knack to be speaking that I do not yet grasp. Very likely. You'd better find out what the cannibals are up to. Tolliver commanded the coronet to show him the glismac. It promptly complied and the prince beheld a vision of very tall, fearsome aborigines trotting single file along a narrow path choked with tall ferns and other undergrowth. Where are the glismac in relation to me? the boy whispered to the talisman. They are approximately a league south of the river trail, moving away from you. Are they pursuing my Aunt Cadia? They are moving away from her also. It is impossible to ascertain their intentions, since they do not speak of it and are beings with free will. Tolliver told Ralibin what the talisman had said, and the Nisimu was much encouraged. Perhaps the cannibals have decided that the ladies' party is too formidable to attack. After all, they are only simple-minded savages. You must check up on the brutes from time to time with your talisman, to be certain that they don't return. But now we had better move on. It would be unwise for us to fall too far behind the Lady of the Eyes if we hope to pass through the viaduct immediately after her. They set off again at as rapid a pace as they could manage, but neither of them had long legs. To make matters worse, the trail now trended mostly uphill, and they were often forced to halt, gasping for breath and with stitches in their sides. Then it began to get dark. Tolliver turned them visible once more, fearing that they might be accidentally separated in the deepening gloom. It's time that we thought about stopping for the night anyway. Shall I ask the three-headed monster to find a dry cave or hollow tree, or shall I try to use the burning eye's magic to cut down wood for a lean-to shelter? I care not. The old Nisimu was now very downhearted. I would settle here and now for a pair of dry boots 
and relief for the blister on my right heel. Let me try to help you, Tolliver said. He pulled the dark broken sword from his belt and held it by the blade, as he had seen Aurigastus do. Three-lobed burning eye, I command you to restore Ralaban's feet to health and render his boots dry. At the same time that he spoke, the prince visualized what he wished to accomplish. The lobes forming the sword pommel split open, and three magical eyes stared at Ralaban's feet. Oh, oh, it's hot, it's hot! Clouds of steam suddenly poured from the boots, and Ralaban danced about in a frenzy, yammering aboriginal oaths. The prince made haste to apologize. Forgive me, I didn't realize that would happen. Perhaps I should have used the coronet instead. I had forgotten that Aunt Katie's talismanic sword is more of a weapon than a magical wand. Um, is your blister healed? How could I tell? The old man wailed piteously. With my feet afire. Next time, let me at least take the boots off before you experiment. Better yet, practice your amateur sorcery on someone else, like the Glismac cannibals. I hope that I will not have to, the boy said in a low voice, and you would do well to hope so, too. Ralevan sighed. His feet had cooled rapidly, and the blister was indeed healed. I'm sorry, Hidden Heart. I know you only wanted to help, but I am so very weary and wet. Tolliver pressed his fingers to the coronet. Talisman, can you lead us to a dry place where we might safely spend the night? Yes, there is a sizable niche among the rocks on the hillside to your right. Follow the green spark. A tiny emerald light sprang forth from the open mouth of the middle head on the coronet and began to drift slowly off the trail. Tolliver took Ralaban's hand. Come, it's time for us to rest and eat. With luck, I will find a way to dry the rest of our clothes with magic. But have no fear, old friend. This time... I will practice first on myself. They awoke refreshed in the morning, and Tolliver quickly ascertained that Cadia and her party were less than a quarter of a league ahead of them, eating breakfast down by the Oda River. And are the Glismac following them or us? the boy asked his coronet. No. Well satisfied and confident that his bold plan was succeeding so splendidly, the prince rendered himself and Ralaban invisible once again. They set off at the same time that Cadia and her companions did, and hiked for several hours, growing more and more weary as the sun climbed, but managing to stay fairly close behind the others. And then they discovered fresh glismac tracks crossing the trail to the right. Tolliver halted and studied the ominous evidence with consternation. Ralaban said, This is strange. I thought your coronet said that the cannibals were not following. The awful truth came to the prince in a flash. No, they were circling around us to prepare an ambush. I was too stupid to ask the talisman about that possibility, and it always answers questions literally. Quick, we must try to give warning. He set off at a run, sometimes falling and scrambling ahead on all fours, for the trail at that point was extremely steep. I cannot keep up with you, Hidden Heart, the stable master gasped. Go ahead without me, and... There was a sudden volley of bestial cries in the distance, followed by the agonized scream of a man. Stricken with terror, the invisible friends crept to the top of a rocky ridge. Below lay a small clearing near the paired waterfalls, hedged about by monstrous trees. It seemed crowded with enormous beings who leapt and flailed about with swords, stone-headed maces, and rusty Veronian axes, yelling hideously all the while. They wore no clothing, having plates of shining skin armoring their backs, shoulders, and upper arms. Their bodies were otherwise covered with auburn hair, which grew longer on their heads, forming manes. They possessed muzzled faces like those of their Wavilo kin, but instead of yellow eyes, they had orbs of glaring red. Great white teeth shone in their mouths, and both their hands and feet were beclawed. The mob of Glismac were engaged in a pitched battle with four vastly outnumbered oathed companions. 
There was no sign of the fifth knight, nor of Jagan, nor of the Lady of the Eyes. What are we to do? Old Rollobin wailed. Look, one of the companions has gone down. Oh no, the savages are hacking him to pieces. You must do exactly as I say. The prince was all at once full of stern resolution. Go off the trail to the left, creep downhill, and make your way to the crag near the waterfalls. Get up on it, then begin flinging rocks down on the glismac with all your strength. Screech as though you were a phantom from the thorny hell. It will distract the fiends and perhaps help frighten them away. Meanwhile, I will do what I can with the talismans. But hasten, the prince hissed. He set off slipping and sliding down the trail, drawing the three-lobed burning eye. When he reached the clearing and could see the battle participants distinctly, he halted, dropping to one knee. Holding the talisman by its blunt-edged blade, he pointed the hilt at the tallest of the three glismac assailing the fallen knight. In his mind, the boy saw this heinous creature burnt to ashes. He said, Burning eye, slay him. The three orbs forming the sword's pommel split open, revealing eyes that stared at the giant glismac. From the human eye shot a golden beam, and from the folk eye a ray of green, and from the silvery eye of the vanished ones, a beam of searing white. The body of the savage warrior was enveloped in tricolored radiance. In an instant, his flesh was consumed, and then the glowing bones also vanished, leaving only a splash of gray resembling wet ashes on the muddy ground. The other attackers drew back, stumped. Their intended victim still lived, for the knight hauled himself to a sitting position, unrecognizable for the gore that covered him, and regarded the ashes with wonderment. The prince was also amazed that the new talisman had so readily obeyed him. A fierce jubilation welled up in his heart. He pointed the burning eye at the other two glismac, who still stood near the downed companion as though paralyzed, and incinerated them also with magical lightning. The rest of the cannibals set up a furious clamor, shouting one to the other in their guttural language. They began to flee, and inside of a few moments, all were gone into the forest. Tolliver, standing invisible at the edge of the clearing, could not help but utter a shout of triumph. Who's there? cried Sir Ednar. He and the brothers Calipo and Melpotis were the only companions left on their feet. The three of them had many wounds, but none were mortal. It is some sorcerer come to our aid said the knight, hunched on the ground, who then groaned in agony and fell limp. By his voice, the prince identified Sir Sainlat, bleeding in a dozen places. One of his feet had been hacked from his leg by a glismac axe, and blood spurted forth like a small scarlet fountain. Tolliver hurried to him. Touching the coronet on his head with two fingers, he closed his eyes and saw Sainlat in his imagination tall and strong as he had been that morning setting off from the flatboat. Talisman, he whispered, let him be so. Sainlat's body was enveloped in soft green light. The burly knight stirred and sat up. His face was unbloodied and stupefaction caused his mouth to sag, for all traces of his injuries had vanished. Even his armor and garments were clean and undamaged. Sacred flower, Ednar cried. He ran to his restored companion, followed by Melpotis and Calipo, and the three of them pulled Sainlat to his feet and began to laugh and pound him on the back. As this went on, the prince commanded the three-headed monster to heal the others. A triple pulse of emerald light announced the accomplishment of the magic, leaving the transformed knights numb with shock and delight. Oh, wizard! Come forth and accept our thanks, Calipo managed to say. Tolliver spoke in a disguised croak. Where are the others? Where is the Lady of the Eyes? Did you hear? Sainlat exclaimed. He's somewhere close by. The companions began to gabble all at once until Tolliver cried out, Ednar, answer me. The young knight controlled himself. Unseen wizard? The Lady of the Eyes has passed through a viaduct, we hope, into the land of the Starmen, and promised to return to us anon. Sir Baffric fell gravely wounded into yon pool, and I fear he is dead. 
As to the Nisimu Jagan, I know not where he may be. I have not laid eyes on him since the Glismak savages sprang upon us. But who are you? Are you one of the Vizpi servants of the White Lady, the invisible eyes in the mist? The prince silently asked the coronet, Is Bafric alive? No, said the voice in his head. He has passed safely beyond, and his body has floated some distance downstream. Where is Jagan? At this moment he stands at the brink of a Namp's pit, halfway up the hill to your left, wondering who it is that the beast has just now devoured. A Namp! the prince wailed aloud. No! Oh, no! And he dashed away, crashing through undergrowth and tripping over concealed rocks. The four knights saw the disturbance he made in the vegetation and followed after, giving voice to their mystification. Within a few minutes, Tolliver caught sight of Jagan, who was staring somberly into a ragged-edged cavity in the ground that measured some two ells in diameter. Obviously, it had once been roofed over with thin saplings, dead leaves, and other trash from the forest floor to mask its presence. Something, or someone, had broken through the flimsy covering and tumbled in. Burning eye! Bring him out safely! the prince shrieked. Oh, please! Rescue Ralibon! The request is impertinent. The invisible boy fell to his knees at the brink of the hole opposite Jagan and looked down. The pit was full of shadows, but there, half buried in soil and duff, was a gigantic shape that almost filled the bottom. It resembled a bloated, bald head, having two saucer-sized bright blue eyes that looked up from between wrinkled lids. The nap shifted and seemed to smile, revealing a huge mouth that stretched from one side of its head to the other. Very short limbs with twig-like digits sprang from the place where the creature's ears might have been. Did, did this vile beast take Ralibon? the prince inquired of the talisman in a quavering voice. Yes. Tolliver burst into tears. Oh, no, my poor old friend. If only you had been more proficient in wilderness ways. If only I had not sent you off the trail. Now you are gone, and no magic can bring you back. Jagan was frowning, his gaze fixed on the place where the unseen lad's weight had compressed the forest detritus. The old companions had come up and were casting horrified glances into the pit. The Namp licked its purplish lips at the sight of them and scratched at the dirt with its tiny hands. Prince Tolo, the old Nisimu hunter said, is that you? Just then the Namp gave a grotesque hiccup, shuddered, and blinked its eyes rapidly. Tolliver, Jagan, and the knights made haste to move back from the edge of the hole as the creature hiccuped again, showing row after row of stained, pointed teeth. The nap shuddering turned into violent spasms, punctuated by gagging sounds. Suddenly its maw gaped wide like the opening of a titanic fang-fringed sack, and there was a thunderous eructation. A slender silvery container flew through the air, accompanied by a quantity of phlegm, and landed at Jagan's feet. Thus relieved, the nap sighed, shook itself, and burrowed down until only its half-closed eyes remained above ground, glowing faintly in the dimness of the pit. There was a crackling sound in the underbrush, and Cadia emerged. You have returned safely, Jagan exclaimed. Praise be to the Triune. Indeed, she replied, and I have met with some success. But before I speak of it, let me introduce you to a certain wizard. Swiftly, she circled the Namp's hole to where the two footprints indented the ground and seized something that seemed naught but thin air. You may as well turn yourself visible, Tolo. The prince appeared, crowned with the three-headed monster, and having the three-lobed burning eyes still in one grubby hand. His cheeks were streaked with tears. Cadia had hold of him by the back of his jerkin, and even though they two were nearly of a size, Tolliver seemed helpless in her grip, like the newly captured prey of a Lothok, numbly resigned to its fate. This is the wizard who saved our lives? Sir Ednar gasped. Impossible, said Sainlat. 
He wears the magical coronet, Malpotus pointed out, and carries the talisman stolen from the Lady of the Eyes. But he is only a child, Calipo scoffed. I slew the Glizmac and healed your wounds, Tolliver said in a dull voice. I am a sorcerer, and your contempt will not make it otherwise. You are also a thief, Cadia said calmly. But that is by the by. Firmly, she guided the prince to the slime-covered star box. Open it! As though overcome with an immense fatigue, Tolliver obeyed. When she commanded him to place the three-lobed burning eye within, he obeyed without speaking a word. Then the Lady of the Eyes made finger play upon the gemstones within the box. There was a blaze of light and a musical sound. A moment later, Cadia took up the magic sword with a triumphant smile, holding it in both hands by the dull-edged blade with the hilt upright. Talisman, she asked, are you once again mine own? Is your power restored? Nestled amongst the conjoined knobs on the sword's pommel was Cadia's trillium amber, shining like a tiny flame in the deepening twilight. The dark lobe seemed to split open, and three gleaming eyes that mirrored those on her golden-scaled cuirass gazed at her. I am bonded to you, lady, and fully potentiated. Good, she said. Now I command you to shield me and my companions from the sight of Oragastus and all his star guild. It is done. The eyes closed, and Cadia thrust the sword into her belt and addressed the others. Jagan, please take charge of the star box. Certainly, Farseer. We cannot tarry here any longer, she said. The sun is descending, and we must pass through the viaduct. Someone waits for us at the other end who has promised to help us reach the city of Brandoba, where the Emperor Denombo resides. But he will not wait long. Ednar exclaimed, So the passageway does lead to the land of Sobrania. Yes. And the starmen? Malpotus inquired. Have they conquered the country? Not yet, Cadia said. She turned to Prince Tolliver. Before we move on, I want you to give me the three-headed monster for safekeeping. Jagan. Open the star box. The boy took a step backward. The life had come back into his face. Eyes wide with dread, he lifted his hands to hold the coronet tight to his head. His voice was a broken whisper. No, I, I will never give up my talisman, not while I live. It is not yours, Cadia said. It belongs to your mother, just as the three-winged circle belongs to the Archimage Haramus, and this three-lobed burning eye belongs to me. Mother gave the talisman freely to Oragastus, the prince said stubbornly. To ransom you and your royal father, Cadia exclaimed in a terrible voice. She snatched the star box from Jagan and advanced upon Tolliver, holding it open. Place the coronet inside the box. No, the boy whispered. She drew the black broken sword from her belt and lifted it to Tolliver's forehead, holding it less than a finger's width from the coronet's rim. The three eyes opened. Tolo, do as I say. Give up the talisman. Do not touch it, he warned, desperation in his eyes. You know it will kill you if you try to take it from its bonded owner. I was only able to secure it myself because Oragastus had lent it to his yellow voice, who was not so protected. For several heartbeats she glared at him, but his willpower was too strong. Keep it then, for what good it may do you. Cadia whirled the sword away and slammed it into her belt. The three-lobed pommel once again seemed only black metal. Sainlat, Melpotus, take Tolo back to the riverboat. No! the prince cried. I have vowed to rescue mother. If you try to send me away, I will use magic to thwart you. Farseer. Jagan spoke urgently to Cadia. Perhaps it would be best if the prince did accompany us. He may be able to assist in the rescue of Queen Anajo, since it is evident that he has some expertise in commanding his talisman. His invisibility trick was actually rather impressive, Sir Ednar remarked. And his healing of us, Sainlad added encouragingly, was even more so. I was myself at the point of death, and now I am not only restored, but quite invigorated. The other knights murmured agreement. 
Cadia regarded the boy with a thoughtful scowl. Jagan continued, When his mother is safe with us, he can then give the talisman to her. The little old Nisimu said to the prince, Will you do that, Hidden Heart? At the sound of his mire name, given him by the dead Ralaban, the prince flinched, but he made no reply. More patiently, Cadia said, Tolo, if I allow you to go with us, will you promise to submit to my leadership and desist from wreaking any magic through the coronet without my express permission? The prince hesitated, his mouth tightening, but he finally said, I do promise. Cadia was about to demand that he also promise to return his talisman to Anagel, but she feared that the boy might continue to balk and perhaps even attempt to flee, invisible if she pressed the point. Besides, he was much more likely to give up the coronet at the request of the queen herself. She sighed. Very well. Now let us prepare to pass through the viaduct. There are no star men or other villains on the other side, but the person who does wait, a man of the folk who has consented to guide us, is of a nervous and fearful temperament and may go off without us if we do not hasten. Wait, cried the prince. He went to the edge of the Namp's pit. Aunt, this miserable creature murdered my poor friend Ralaban. I do not know if my magical coronet will kill it, but I ask you to let me make the attempt. But the Namp did not commit murder, the Lady of the Eyes said. It is only a wild animal, not having the faculty of reason. It sought food in its customary fashion, without malice. It would be unjust to slay it now in cold blood. Don't you understand that, Tolo? No. The boy would not look at Cadia. Her voice hardened. Then let the creature live, because I command you to. She turned her back on him and set off down the hill with Jagan and the knights following. But I must kill it, the prince cried in desperation. I must. Cadia glanced at him briefly over her shoulder. You will not and must not, because the Namp is not to blame for Ralaban's death. Someone else is, as you know already, deep within your heart. The color drained from Tolliver's face. He said not another word, but came down the hill after the others. <laughs>